please listen to the first reading of the bills by number only. H-491. To government operations. And we are going to take a look at the, the last charter that we want to take a peek at today. Um, rest assured, there will be others for us to work on. Um, but this one is, uh, is one that brings a few of our colleagues from uh, the village of Essex Junction here to uh, help us understand the charter change relating to Essex separation. So welcome to you folks, and you're welcome to come and join us at the table. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Representative Lori Houghton from Essex Junction. Representative Karen Dolan, also from Essex Junction. And if you're Good, I'm just going to read our prepared testimony and then we can answer questions at the end. Uh, before I start, though, I think it's important to share uh, two definitions because it does get confusing when talking about the village and the town. So when I refer to a town outside the village, we're referring to those residents who live outside of the village. And then when I refer to the village, it's the folks who live in the village. So the village is its own municipality. We pay taxes. We're also part of the town of Essex. But then there's a, an area which is not a municipality, but we clarify it, classify it as town outside the village. It'll make more sense as I read on. So thank you. So H491 is a charter change to establish the city of Essex Junction. I think it's important for us to review how we've come to this place and why 88% of those who voted wanted an independent community. Since 1892, the village of Essex Junction has operated as a municipal unit of government within the town of Essex. Both are chartered municipalities. Our communities have been voting on some form of merger or separation since 1958. I will spare you the details between 1958 and 2000. So I'll start in 2000, and this won't take long. In 2000, a five month long house government operations mandated mediation process ended with no agreed upon resolution. In 2006, a year long community led task force created a charger for a new merged municipality. It passed narrowly with town outside the village voting no and village voting yes. A revote overturned those results. Over the next 10 years, the boards worked collaboratively to find shared services. Then in 2018, created a subcommittee to again craft a plan for the future of our two communities. This is the plan of merger vote we will discuss shortly, and that failed. And here we are today with our charter change request that creates a path forward for both communities while fully recognizing the past history of efforts. Last year, the town of Essex was before this committee with a charter change to establish a three plus three governance model. At the time, the decision by this committee was made to hold further discussions until the community held the merger vote that had long been planned. The merger plan we voted on in 2021 included the three plus three governance model and a 12 year financial phase in to limit the immediate financial impact to town outside the village residents. I want to be clear, the merger plan included the three plus three governance model that was before this committee last year, passed by the town outside the village, but failed in the village. That was the three plus three. Now I'm talking about the plan of merger. Close to 50% of registered voters participated in the plan of merger vote held in March, 2021. The plan of merger failed in the town outside the village by 72% and passed in the village by 81%. Overall, the vote failed by 19 votes. With swift action by residents throughout the communities, we had a revote on April 13th. Over 50% this time of registered voters participated in this vote. Again, the plan of merger failed with similar percentages within each committee as the original vote. Town outside the village voted no, the village voted yes. 
with broad community outreach, three plus three governance, and a 12 year financial phase in, the town outside the village overwhelmingly rejected the plan of merger twice. As part of the revote, village residents also voted on a non-binding resolution to have the village trustees draft a charter to establish the city of Essex Junction should the plan of merger fail. That non-binding vote passed overwhelmingly. The city of Essex Junction charter vote was held by special meeting in November, 2021. Again, close to 50% of registered voters participated. The charter passed with 88% of the vote, 3,070 yeses to 411 no votes. Equity and taxation has been a driving factor behind our decades long community discussion and votes. It was clearly stated through public outreach that should merger not pass, separation would mean an increase in municipal taxes to residents in the town outside the village. In fact, at a joint municipal meeting on September 28, 2020, the town finance director at the time said, and I quote, there are inequities in the way government is funded in our current situation. Village taxpayers are paying for services they are not eligible to receive and are paying more for services that they and town outside the village taxpayers have equal access to. This means that town outside the village taxpayers are paying less than the true cost for some services, end quote. These recent votes were not just about taxes. Both communities have spent a great deal of time and money over the years on our relationship. At the detriment to important community specific projects, and each municipality's distinct community values. In March of 2021, the two municipal boards entered into a joint resolution to investigate an amicable solution, separation. As written in the resolution, and I quote, members of the select board and trustees agree to negotiate in good faith throughout the amicable separation process. In the spirit of inclusion, all voices will be respectively heard and considered. Representative Dolan and I have watched and engaged in the process and believe that the trustees and select board worked collaboratively to establish a transition plan that could be as fair as possible to both communities. It is time for our two communities who have tried almost every conceivable relationship to have the opportunity to thrive as two separate entities for the betterment of all residents. And Representative Dolan and I believe that both communities can and will thrive. Thank you. You can answer any questions. Questions from committee members. <clears throat> Representative Higley. Madam Chair, I guess I'm still a little fuzzy. I tried to follow along. I, I know it's been back and forth. Um, <clears throat> tell me if I'm wrong. My understanding is the last vote again had the uh, the village voting yes and the, the town voting no. Correct. Um, and, and so again, what the uh, village decided to do was include that incorporation in the chart, right? Include the three plus three. Is that what you're referring to? I'm sorry. Are you referring to the three plus three charter change? Yes. Yes. So that was included even though the village um, had voted against it when that vote happened, we included it in the plan of merger, knowing that the town outside the village wanted that governance structure. Right, so, so again, my understanding is that still, the town outside of the village structure still just wouldn't approve of this charter change. Correct, they voted twice to not approve a merger plan. Okay, yep, thanks, got it, I think. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for that clarification. It's hard to follow. <laughs> Any other questions for the representatives sponsoring this charter change? Representative Hooker. Maybe. Uh, so this is the charter for the green circle, which is the big one, not the orange circle, which is the... No, this charter change is for the little four and a half... Not, not this one. Okay. Uh, existing at this point, the original charter that we would be amending. Was, 
So the bigger entity. So I, I'm gonna. I'm not sure I'm following this. So the three plus three charter bill you had last year would have amended the town of Essex charter, which the village is a part of. Right. The village also has a charter. So that's. Uh, and so what we're asking now with H four ninety one is that we change our charter to become a city of Essex Junction, completely independent from the town of Essex. Yeah. <laughs> For all the reasons we just stated and yeah, the years of votes we've taken. Okay, thanks. I think we will explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Lafayette. What would this mean um, for like emergency service? Because I can, right now I'm thinking like very bluntly, like very city, very town. There is a distinct thing. They, they each have their own uh, police and fire and rescue. And does this, what, what would this mean for? Us? So our, a great question. Our police force has actually been shared since the 1980s. It was um, the village of Essex Junction Police Force, and then we merged it and became one. So, and in the charter, in the it specifically states, I think in the transition plan, that that would continue to be shared uh, for at least ten years. And then, excuse me, our EMS is actually a separate entity that both communities pay into. And then the um, so there's the fire station on Stand Hill, and then there's the one in the junction there's one in the city well would not be the city right. and so they would be able to maintain what they have yeah so um and a key thing to remember is that the village has always maintained our own services so we've always operated as our own distinct municipality so right now the fire departments are separate yes. we have the village we have the town so yes. yes they would continue what their work is I'm just trying to think out loud of anything that we could be missing for like a very blatant cost that like, but you guys, I know from my, so I was on Essex Rescue for I don't know how many years. Oh, okay. Um, and I went to Underhill Jericho um, and I went to Essex Tech. So like I'm very oh, familiar okay. so with areas. I'm yeah. trying to think of something blatant that is not, but like it, it does distinctively operate on their own too. So like, something that does not operate on their own? Yeah, I'm trying to think of something that like this is going to, this okay. would, so we've had, um, since 2000, I want to say, I was a trustee, so probably since about 2016, we had tried to bring together departments, administration, finance, human resources, in order to try and equal out the tax equity situation. So that will be unwound. But honestly, it's starting to be unwound now, even without this charter change. So our our, um, our, our unified manager, um, his contract is up in February, so we will each be hiring our own manager. Mm -hmm. Our town finance director left for another position, so we are each, um, they have a finance director, we are hiring one. So it's, it has been a lot of discussions, and that's where the trustees and select board worked well together to ensure that when we unwind things, it's okay. But I appreciate that it's, it was at you know highest point in all of the discussions. And it was mine. Well, my my question, and then then um, I, our inboxes have been very full of Essex, yes. and that was the only thing that I saw from somebody was uh, like you know affirming that the police services. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. the only thing that has been brought to me. Okay. What an active, engaged citizen, right? You should be proud. We do. <laughs> to you know get to the level of engagement. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, representative Leclerc. Um, thank you Madam Chair. Good afternoon representative. So you touched upon it briefly but could you give us a, a quick I guess description of what has to be unwound and what has to be stood up in order for this to transpire and everybody is a standalone entity. Good question. So we, um, so administration, which is already being unwound because we're hiring our own managers, um, which, which before we had a unified manager, we all, all had our own manager. And in fact, we have two uh, 
department heads in the village acting as uh, co-managers now until we hire someone. Um, the finance department had to be unwound, but at the same time, we've always kept the ledgers separate. So the actual dollar finance, you know, the actual money um, is, is separated anyway. Our fire departments were never connected. Our libraries were never connected. Our school district is its own municipality, so that's not affected. The, I mean, we can go through. All, I will say that is what the um, two municipal boards have been working through is a, a separation kind of document that tr a transition plan that goes through all of it because we've been focused on merger for so uh, putting it together. There's tons of information. Does it to then unwind it? So um, there is a very detailed plan. I'm just not going to remember the details of it off the top of my head. Right. I apologize, Representative LaCare. I don't remember anything, but um, Representative Dolan did remind me. So there is an overarching agreement that has been signed between the boards that um, should the charter um, pass, then there are about seven agreements below that that have been agreed to but not signed yet because um, it was felt by the town uh, select board that they couldn't have us sign because we would have signed as a village and not a city. But those documents have outlined the process of what will be unwound. Okay, well, thank you. Because I seem to recall last time we heard about a, a relationship change, um, there was a lot of conversation around sidewalks if I remember correctly. About what? Sidewalks. Oh, like sidewalks. Yes, yes. So there's a reason for that. So in the village, we are a walking community. Um, we, our kids always walk to school. We had no busing until the school district merged in, I don't know, 2000 something, maybe five years ago. And so, and but the town, was not a walking community. So so anyway, so I start apologize. So the village, we always plowed our sidewalks. Like that was the first thing that got plowed before the streets because kids had to walk to school. In the town, they didn't have that. In the merger plan, we actually, I'm sorry, yes, in the merger plan, we actually put in a special taxing district. So the village would be responsible for paying for their own sidewalks. And the town outside the village would not have to pay for our sidewalks. Again, they rejected the plan of merger twice. <laughs> so very big cycle. Like where we're coming with stuff like of having independent community. Everybody can be in charge of what their priorities are, what they want to have at the top of the list, and how they can make it work. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Cooper. Oh, I don't know if you heard me mumble, but water and sewer cross lines or so uh, we have a wastewater treatment plant um, that actually that's um, located in the village, but is a tri-town wastewater and treatment plant for the town of Essex, Williston, and us. So that's a joint authority. So that's joint authority. Yes, that will not be affected. Representative McCarthy. So because that has been such a, a big issue between the two municipalities that I represent, um, the one owning all of the water treatment infrastructure. In the, so just to be clear, the three towns already all participate together and this won't affect that in any way. Correct. Okay, <laughs> that's a really, because I would never want to subject any other no. neighbor communities to the type of conflict that we have had in St. Albans. <laughs> very large facility next to IBM. <laughs> Committee members, any other questions for the representatives from Essex Junction. Can I get the vote one more time on what this was for the divorce? Um, <laughs> That's how I put it together. You know, I just did the percentages. I did not do the uh, same for the, oh, for the village uh, charter. It was three thousand seventy to four hundred and eleven. That was for H four ninety one. This bill we're talking. My new way to describe is divorce versus marriage. Exactly what, unfortunately, our language has been to. Vote on divorce now. Yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> um, so unless committee members have other questions for the sponsors of this bill, I think it would be helpful for us to shift gears and go to Tucker now to take a look at the bill language. Thank you, Tucker, for sticking around. And representatives, you can... Um, 
go back to your committees if you have committee work you need to do this afternoon and hopefully you can take a peek at the YouTube at some point and just see what folks questions were on the details and we'll be in touch if we need you to come back. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We thank appreciate you. it. Tucker, thank you. Good afternoon again, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. You have in front of you H-491, which proposes to create the city of Essex Junction, uh, to approve the charter of the city of Essex Junction, and to dissolve what was formerly the village charter. I will start with section two of the bill, which contains the charter of the city of Essex Junction. Before diving in, I will briefly remark that you all are experts now at dissolving villages, merging villages, and dealing with village issues. It seems as though once a biennium, you all deal with a village. The most recent was the village of Perkinsville, which was dissolved and merged with the town of Weathersfield. And prior to that, it was the village of Waterbury which was dissolved and turned into the Edward Farrar Utility District, affectionately called the EFUD. Uh, in front of you now, you have uh, historically significant creation of a new municipality, the city of Essex Junction. Section one declares the General Assembly's intent to create this municipality. Section two contains the charter, which will be the uh, city specific corporate structures and powers. Later on, we will get into the transitional provisions, which will provide specifically for the village's assets and relationship with the surrounding town as it becomes the city over the year of the transitional period. Section two adds a new chapter four to title 24 appendix creating the city of Essex Junction. Subchapter one, uh, we have the incorporation and powers of the city. Many of the sections that I will go through now uh, contain some belt and suspender provisions, providing that as this city is created, that the village is not going to lose some of the general authority that it already has under law. So first, section 101 provides that notwithstanding the provisions of any other municipal charter, the inhabitants of the village within its corporate limits shall become the city of Essex Junction. In section 102, we have a provision that is contained in the general law for all municipalities that are chartered and within many charters. It states that except as modified by this charter, charter or by any lawful regulation ordinance of the city, all provisions of the statutes of the state that are applicable to any municipality shall also apply to the city of Essex Junction. Essentially, it's restating the general law applies and the city has access to it. Under section 103, we have some reservation of specific powers. The city shall have all powers granted to any city or municipal corporation by the constitution and the laws of the state, together with any implied powers that are necessary um, it may enact ordinances not inconsistent with the Constitution, general law, or this charter. Subsection B, the city may acquire real and personal property, uh, including stormwater collection and disposal, wastewater collection and disposal, solid waste collection and disposal, provision of a public water supply and of parks and recreation facilities, municipal facilities for office fire protection and police protection, provision of public libraries, public parking areas, sidewalks, bicycle paths, and green strips, highways, public view zones, open spaces, and uh, other purposes that are provided for and addressed by the general laws of the state. The city may acquire property in fee simple or any lesser interest uh, and may purchase, gift, devise, lease, or condemn and may sell, lease, mortgage, hold, or manage any property as its interests may require. Again, these are provisions of general law that the city is making sure to reserve here. In addition, the city may exercise any of its powers or perform, perform any of its functions 
and may participate in the financing of any of those powers or functions uh, and may do so jointly with other municipal corporations or the United States government or the state of Vermont. The city may establish and maintain an electric power system and regulate power line installations, provided that the city shall have no authority under the provisions of this new charter that conflicts with the authority that has been granted by the Public Utility Commission or any other state regulatory agency. In addition, the city reserves here the authority to establish a telecommunication system and an enterprise to deliver internet or broadband services. <coughs> Uh, subsection F here again contains one of these uh, belt and suspenders provisions that we see in a lot of charters. It states that the mention of any particular power within the contents of the charter shall not be construed to be exclusive or to restrict the scope of powers that the city would otherwise have if that power were not mentioned. Uh, section 104 concerning the reservation of powers continues this theme. It states that uh, nothing in the charter uh, should be construed to limit the powers and functions that are conferred upon the city or the city council uh, by general or special enactments and that the powers and functions conferred by the charter in front of you shall be cumulative in addition and in addition to the provisions of general or special enactments. Uh, a few years ago, uh, this committee might have been six years ago, did the work of actually adding this language into Title 17 to uh, make it express uh, that all of this was always the case and this is how charters would be constructed um, to avoid some of these provisions, but here we are. Section 105, concerning the form of government. The municipal government that is created in the charter shall be known as the council manager form of government. Pursuant to the provisions we're going to cover, it's subject only to limitations imposed by the constitution in this charter, all the powers of the city shall be vested in an elective city council. That council will have the power to enact ordinances, codes, and regulations to adopt budgets, determine policies, and to appoint a city manager. Moving on to subchapter two, which covers the governance structure of the city. Section 201 contains the powers and duties of the city council. The members of the city council shall constitute the legislative body of the city, except as otherwise provided in this charter where there are powers reserved to the other officers and shall have all the powers and authority given to and perform all duties required of city legislative bodies. The city of Essex Junction Council shall have the power to appoint and remove a city manager, supervise, create, change and abolish offices, commissions or departments other than the offices, commissions, or departments that are established in the charter. To appoint members of all boards, commissions, committees, or similar bodies. To provide for an independent audit by a certified public accountant. To inquire into the conduct of any of the officers, commissions, or departments. And to exercise every other power that's not specifically set forth in the charter, but that is granted to legislative bodies by the laws of the state of Vermont. Section 202 contains the composition in terms of office for the city council. City council is going to be a five member legislative body. All members shall reside within the city and the term of office of a, an individual city council shall be three years and the terms of the councilors shall be staggered. I have a question from Representative Gannon. Ooh, um, is there further language about staggering terms in this charter change, or is that it? Uh, quickly referencing my notes, are you are you asking about transitional provisions? Yes. Yes, there are transitional provisions uh, after the charter language. There okay, is a you. series of session law sections that deal with the transition, including setting the first terms of the city council. 
Uh, yes, specifically though, the transfer of the current trustee terms to city councilor terms until replacements can be elected. So okay. they already have the staggered system that will carry over and the trustees will hold their terms until they're replaced. Great, thank you. Representative Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tucker, uh, 2015 on uh, page six, what's the difference between the League of Cities and Towns language that says we can do what anybody else does and this language that says anything that is granted to council or other legislative bodies, city councils and other things being legislative bodies? So that uh, subdivision five is pointing to the general law. And it's another one of those safety belts that's built into this charter. It's saying that anywhere where the general law is giving us power to a uh, legislative body of any municipality in the state, we're also gonna have those powers. This doesn't add anything really because that those powers would already be available to the city council. And the difference here is that they are not accessing special law that has been granted to other municipalities. They're saying we get to use powers that are given to us through general law. Okay, thank you. All right, section 203, in the case of a vacancy in a council seat, the vacancy shall be filled by the council pursuant to subsection 204C, which we will get into now. Section 204, the election of the city council officers. The terms of uh, the members shall commence on the first day of the month following the election. At the first meeting of the month following the annual city meeting, the council will organize and elect the president, vice president and clerk. The president of the council or in the president's absence, the vice president shall be the presiding officer for council meetings and shall be recognized as the head of the city government for all ceremonial purposes. Subsection C, this is uh, what governs the vacancies. In the event of death, resignation or incapacity of any council member, the remaining members of the council may appoint a person to fill that position until the next annual election Incapacity shall be determined by a vote of the council. And incapacity shall include the failure by any member of the board to attend at least 50% of the meetings of the board in any calendar year. At the next annual election, the vacancy can be filled and the person so elected shall serve for the remainder of that specific term of office. In the event that the council is unable to agree upon an interim replacement, a special election shall be held to fill the position. Subsection D, elected councilors who move out of the city prior to the expiration of their terms shall surrender their seats. So this is an explicit recognition that one of the qualifications, specifically living within the city, if you move out, you're no longer qualified for the council position and you are deemed to have surrendered your seat. Senator Gannon has a question. So you're deemed, so you do not have to take any action on your part to surrender your seat if it's automatic? If you leave the city and you are no longer a resident, it is automatic under these terms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative LaFay, does this also cover what we distinguished for what Rep Gannon did? For Wilmington. For Wilmington. Because it sounds like there does it does it does it does it cover? So in, in the case of Wilmington, it was somebody who was elected to a seat who chose not <laughs> to be seated, which is different than this. But. Uh, Representative Lefebvre, both would apply. So the specific terms for the city council members here would control in the event they miss fifty percent of the uh, meetings in a calendar year or they move out of town. But the general law, as we've discussed, will also be available to the city. So uh, Representative Gannon's issue and bill from uh, last session would also apply in the event that you had an officer that failed or refused to take their oath of office within the 30 days after election. 
Thank you. I just think it's important um, that people that are elected to do something show up. Representative McCarthy. Tucker, does move out cover, like that seems vague to me. Is it, mm -hmm. uh, so like I would want it to read, change their residence or declare residence in another town or something like that. Does move out exist in other charters or other places in law? It just seems really vague. No, move out does not exist. It's not a term of art or a legal uh, term that I would be familiar with outside of this context. Um, the terms that are used for purposes of Title 17 would be resident or residency. So for example, uh, an individual who is no longer a resident of the municipality uh, shall not hold office, something along those lines would be more clear and cut more closely to uh, what we do in general election law. Yeah, we should clarify that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, does that sound like a, a good clarification to other committee members? All right. Because if I may, Madam Chair, sorry. It, so if we, it sounds like it would accomplish what they're trying to say if it read something to the effect of like uh, elected counselors who change their res residency prior to the expiration of their term shall be deemed to have resigned their seat. Yeah. No longer resides. Yeah. Or no longer resides. Yeah. So we'd have to, th those would be the options, right? <laughs> okay. Good catch. <laughs> Shall I move along? I can't quite see when there are hands up in the room. The I will do my room. best to make it, to make an audible um, notation when we've got somebody waiting in the queue. Otherwise, we will go right back to you. So thank you, Tucker. And thank you. Um, Section 205 deals with the compensation of the council members. The compensation to the members shall be set by the voters at the annual meeting. Uh, this section establishes a minimum amount, which is $1,500 a year. Uh, council member compensation uh, here is required to be set out as a separate item in the annual budget that is presented at the annual meeting. Uh, council members are given permission to forego the compensation or a portion of the compensation. The city council is granted authority in subsection B to fix the compensation of appointees and of the city manager and to review, approve, and ratify collective bargaining agreements, which may be negotiated or fixed by the manager or their designee. So uh, this sets up what we will get to later division of authority between the manager who handles the day-to-day -day interactions and negotiations and then the approval by the legislative body. Section 206 covers the conflict of interest policies for the city. Subsection A, no council member shall hold any city employment during the term for which they were elected to the council. A member may be appointed to represent the city on other boards except as pursuant to the state's general prohibitions. No former council member shall hold any compensated appointed municipal office or employment except for poll worker until one year after the expiration of the term for which they were elected to the legislative body. So important note there, the council members for one year after they leave their office are not permitted to hold another office in the town, compensated office that is, as an employee, important, appointed office or employee. Subsection B, concerning appointments and removals. Uh, the council or any of its members um, shall not in any manner dictate the appointment or removal of any municipal administrative officers or employees who the manager or any of the manager subordinates are a empowered to appoint. So that is a long sentence getting at if the manager has the specific authority to appoint uh, the employees, the legislative body and its members shall not dictate those appointments. The city council may discuss with the manager the appointment, performance and removal of those officers and employees in an executive session if that is necessary. 
Subsection C, except for the purpose of inquiries and investigations under subdivision 201B4 of this charter, which we've covered, the legislative body, city council or its members shall deal with municipal officers and employees who are subject to the direction and supervision of the manager solely through the manager and neither the legislative body nor its member shall give orders to any such officer or employee, either publicly or privately. So again, we have another separation here between the manager and the manager's office and the legislative body. Legislative body is going to have the power to appoint and move the manager, but none of the subordinate officers. And here, any communication or interaction between the legislative body and those subordinate employees is going to go through the manager. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Tucker. My uh, recollection, this is a little hazy. There are special protections or provisions for the chief of police of cities. And I'm wondering if the non-interference language that you just read in any way conflicts with the special provisions for uh, the, the chief of police um, to to be afforded some particular due process, and I can't remember the details off the top of my head. I just know that it's it's quite um, specific and limited. Representative Anthony, I'll have to look into some of those general provisions that you're talking about and compare it to what's contained here. But one of the things that we'll get to later in the charter are which of those officers under this model are going to be under the direction and control of the city manager and will have that barrier between those offices and the legislative body. Uh, section 207, uh, a provision covering meetings of the council uh, as soon as practicable after the election of the president and vice president, uh, the council will fix the time and place of its regular meetings and the meeting shall be held at least once a month. Special city meetings uh, under section 208 shall be called in the manner provided by the laws of the state and the voting on all questions shall be by Australian ballot. So here under section 208, special city meetings conducted by Australian ballot, this is cutting through the 17 BSA 2680 scheme uh, where the voters approve voting by Australian ballot. And one of the things I'll note is that uh, the village of Essex Junction is one of those municipalities that have adopted the Australian ballot system. Section 209 contains the procedure for council meetings. The council under subsection A is given authority to determine its own rules and order of business. Subsection B provides that three members shall constitute a quorum. Under subsection C, uh, the council shall keep minutes in according with the open meeting laws and that journalized minutes shall be a public record. All meetings of the council shall be open to the public unless by affirmative vo vote of the majority of the members the council votes that any particular session shall be in an executive session or deliberative session in accordance with the open meeting law. Section 210, governing appointments. Council shall have the power to appoint the members of all boards, commissions, committees, or similar bodies, unless specifically provided otherwise by this charter. The terms of those appointments shall commence on the day after the day of the appointment unless the appointment is to fill a vacancy. Section 211 contains some additional uh, provisions relating to the city council. First, no claim for personal services shall be allowed to the officers elected at the annual meeting, except when compensation for those services is provided for under the provisions of this charter. The council is authorized to sell or lease any real or personal estate belonging to the city. But of course, that has to be authorized by the council at large. Moving on, subchapter three, governing other elected offices within the city. First in section 301, we have the Brownell Library Trustees. 
Uh, this establishes the five member board of library trustees who shall be elected to five year terms. Members will be elected by Australian ballot. Uh, qualified voters of the city of Essex Junction shall be eligible to hold the office of elected library trustee. Section 302, the moderator. The voters at the annual city meeting shall elect a moderator who presides over the meeting. The term of the moderator shall be one year. Uh, only qualified voters of the city shall be eligible to hold that office. Subchapter four governs city meetings. Section 401, starting in subsection A. The voters shall at each annual meeting vote to set the date of the next annual meeting, at which time the voters shall vote for the election of officers, the voting on the city budget, and any other business included in the warnings for the meetings. Uh, general law that governs uh, the qualifications of electors, manner of voting, duties of officers, and all other particulars respective to the preparation for conducting and management of elections shall govern city elections. Long way of saying any Title 17 general provision that's applicable to the municipalities of the state and their elections is going to be applicable to the city. Under subsection C, uh, the election of officers and voting on all questions that are warned for these meetings shall be by Australian ballot. The city clerk and the BCA shall conduct elections in accordance with general law. For some chapter five, we get into the ordinance authority of the city. It provides that ordinances shall be adopted in accordance with uh, the general state law with additional requirements requirements that will be noted later in the subchapter. Uh, and to bring us back to some of the earlier discussion within another charter, the procedure generally is proposal of the ordinances, notice and publication, uh, legislative body vote to adopt the ordinance, followed uh, by uh, the permissive referenda potentially by the voters and a 45 day <laughs> delayed effective date and of course, ordinances must be des designated specifically as either civil or criminal. Section 502 relates to public hearings for uh, the adoption of ordinances. It requires the city council to hold a minimum of one public hearing prior to the adoption of any ordinance. Uh, at the time and place advertised, uh, the ordinance shall be introduced and all persons interested shall be given an opportunity to be heard. So there's a public participation component built in specifically to how the city is going to conduct its ordinance hearings. After the hearing, the city may pass the ordinance with or without amendment. Uh, it shall cause the amended ordinance to be published pursuant to subsections A and B with a notice of the time and place of the public hearing, uh, at which time the ordinance will be further considered. The council may finally pass the amended ordinance or amend it subject to the same procedures outlined in this section 502. Section 503, every ordinance shall become effective upon passage unless otherwise specified. Representative Anthony has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Does this uh, uh, depart from general uh, law, I, I was under the impression that uh, the most common practice is, a, is an introduction, a first reading, a second reading, and there are time intervals between each uh, before final adoption, and then um, uh, passage of time and effect, effective date, or am I uh, uh, not, not well informed? You are very well informed, and for the last part of what you said, uh, the space between the adoption of an ordinance and its effective date is 45 days. Uh, unless the voters bring forth that petition for permissive referendum, in which case it is not effective until a municipality-wide vote can be held, and uh, that has to be held within 60 days. So this is different, Representative Anthony. 
Section 504 contains uh, procedures for the rescission of an ordinance. All ordinances shall be subject to rescission by special or annual city meeting. If within 44 days after final passage by the council, a petition is signed by the voters of the city uh, constituting 5% of the qualified voting population. Uh, the council is required to fix the time and place of a meeting uh, which shall be held within 60 days. Representative Anthony, this is going back to what you were just bringing up. Uh, these are the procedures that are outlined in general law. Notice of the meeting shall be given in the manner provided by the law and the calling of a special or annual city meeting and the vote shall be by Australian ballot. Here's a difference. An ordinance so referred shall remain in effect upon the conclusion of the meeting unless a majority of those present in voting against the ordinance at the annual meeting exceeds 5% in number of the qualified voters of the municipality. Section 505 uh, governs petitions for enactment of an ordinance at a special meeting. Voters of the city may at any time petition for the enactment of a lawful ordinance. Uh, the council is required upon the filing of the petition to call a special city meeting or to include it in the business at the next annual, annual meeting to be held within 60 days after the date of the filing of the petition. The warning for the meeting shall state the proposed ordinance in full or in concise summary and shall provide for an Australian ballot vote. The ordinance would take effect on the 10th day after the conclusion of the meeting provided that the voters vote to affirm. Prior to uh, the city meeting, the proposed ordinance is going to be examined by the city attorney and the city attorney is authorized under the subsection B to correct the ordinance so as to avoid repetitions, illegalities, and unconstitutional provisions, and to assure, ensure the accuracy of its text. Subsection C uh, states that the provisions of this section dealing with commissions for ordinances do not apply to the appointments of officers, uh, members of commissions or boards that are made by the council. Subchapter six, this deals with the city manager. Section 601 deals with the appointment of the manager. The council shall appoint a city manager in accordance with the general law. Section 602 uh, sets out the powers of the manager. The manager shall be the chief administrative officer of the city and shall be responsible to the city council for the administration of all city affairs that are placed within the manager's charge under this charter. The manager shall have the powers and duties in addition to those powers that are uh, delegated to municipal managers by general law. The manager has the authority in subsection B to appoint and under certain terms to spend or remove all city of Essex Junction employees, including the treasurer, and other employees provided for under the charter for cause, except as otherwise provided by law. So Representative Anthony, this is where I'll have to look into uh, the chief of police uh, provisions that you were discussing earlier. This charter collective bargaining unit contracts or personnel rules adopted pursuant to the charter. The manager is authorized, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> the manager may authorize any employee who is subject to the manager's direction and supervision to exercise these powers with respect to subordinates in that employee's department, office, or agency. Appointments, layoffs, suspensions, promotions, demotions, and removals shall be made primarily on the basis of training, experience, fitness, and performance of duties. So here there are some built-in requirements for uh, firings and removals in such manner as to ensure that the responsible officer may secure efficient service. The manager shall direct and supervise the administration of all of the departments and offices of the city 
and shall recommend the hiring of a city attorney with, that is subject to city council approval and shall hire special attorneys as needed. The manager shall attend all council meetings and shall have the right to take part in discussion, but may not vote. So someone of an ex officio member here. The council may meet in executive session without the manager for discussion of the manager's performance. The manager is charged with seeing that all laws, provisions of this charter and acts of the council uh, subject to enforcement by the manager or any of those subordinate officers are faithfully executed. The manager shall prepare and submit the annual budget and capital program to the council. Uh, this is a component of Vermont's manager, town manager system, the preparation of uh, budget and capital programs. The manager shall submit to the council and make available to the public a complete report on the finances and administrative activities of the city uh, as of the end of each fiscal year. Subsection I, we're about halfway through at this point. Uh, the manager is required to make other reports as the council may require concerning the operations of the city's administrative offices. The manager shall keep the council fully advised as to the financial conditions of the city and make recommendations to the council concerning the affairs of the city. Subsection K, a little repetitive, but it states that the manager shall be responsible for the enforcement of all city of Essex Junction ordinances, laws. Subsection L provides that the manager uh, may delegate to subordinate officers any duties conferred upon the manager. Subsection M provides that the manager shall perform other duties as are specified in this charter as may be required by the city council and shall fix the compensation of city employees. Finally, the manager shall recommend the appointment of the city clerk subject to council approval. You can tell from that subsection O that the village is one of the municipalities that has moved the clerk position to an appointed rather than elected position. Section 603 deals with the removal of the city manager. The council is given authority under the section to remove the manager from office for cause in accordance with the following procedure. The council shall adopt by affirmative vote uh, of all of its members a preliminary resolution that must state the reasons for the removal and must, may suspend the manager from duty for a period not to exceed 45 days. Uh, a copy of that resolution has to be provided to the manager. Within five days after receipt of the resolution, the manager may file with the council a request for a hearing. The hearing shall be in a public or executive session by choice of the manager, not the council. And the hearing shall be held at a special council meeting not earlier than 15 days nor later than 30 days after the request is filed. The manager may file with the council a written reply not later than five days before the hearing. So again, this is a hearing process concerning the removal of the manager. Uh, as soon as the procedure is triggered, the manager has an opportunity to request the hearing and file a written statement. Representative Anthony has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to go back slightly, your phrase, the trigger. Do I, uh, did I hear you correctly that the pulling the trigger as you typify it must be unanimous? No, uh, affirmative vote of a majority of the city council sets this out. Section 604 deals with vacancies in the office of city manager. The manager, uh, by a letter filed with the clerk, 
may appoint a staff member to perform the manager's duty in the event of the manager's absence. The manager, uh, unless the manager has previously appointed a staff member as an assistant manager or deputy manager who would automatically assume the manager's role in the case of an absence. Subchapter seven designates the boards and commissions within the city. Uh, quickly moving through some of these because they relate directly to general law. Sections 701, 702, and 703 relate to the creation of Board of Civil Authority, Board of Abatement of Taxes, and Planning Commission as provided by general law. Similarly, Section 704 establishes the city's Development Re Review Board. Section 705 relates uh, to a specific library entity within the city, the Brownell, Brownell Library, Brownell Library Trustees. Brownell Library Board of Library Trustees that holds office at the time that this charter that you have in front of you is enacted shall serve until their terms are completed. Any existing policies of the library trustees at the time that this charter becomes effective shall become the policies of the new run of the library board of trustees. The five permanent self-perpetuating library trustees shall continue to function in accordance with the terms of the trust agreement dated May 25th, 1925. The trustees shall have the authority to establish any new policy for the operational library or repeal or replace any existing policy and shall otherwise act in conformance uh, with general law. Um, the library is required under the terms of the charter to follow all financial and personnel policies that are adopted by the city council. Uh, this library is one of those uh, special library entities that you see occasionally, uh, usually within chartered municipalities where there was an agreement by gift or devise from a private entity to the municipality, and that gift carries certain terms. Here, there's an acknowledgement that those terms under that specific gift will carry through the creation of the city and will be applicable moving forward. Subchapter eight deals with the administrative departments of the city. Section 801. Personnel administration and benefits. The manager or appointee shall be the personnel director who shall maintain personnel rules and regulations protecting the interests of the city. These rules and regulations must be approved by the council and shall include the procedure for amending them or for placing them into practice. Every employee of the city will receive a copy of those rules pursuant to this charter. Subsection B. The rules and regulations may deal with the following subjects or with other similar manners of matters of personnel administration. Job classification, jobs to be filled, tenure, retirement, pensions, leaves of absence, holidays, hours of work, group insurance, salary plans, an enumerated list of uh, terms of employment and potential benefits. No person in the service of the city shall either directly or indirectly give, render, pay, or receive any service or other valuable thing for or on account of or in connection with the appointment or appointed position. Section 802, a specific provision related to the real estate assessor. Uh, there shall be either a real estate assessor who is a certified real estate appraiser or an independent appraisal firm that is headed by a certified real estate appraiser appointed by the manager that shall carry out the duties of assessor in the same manner uh, as provided for listers under the general laws of the state. Section 803, appraisal shall be reviewed periodically and kept up to date. Uh, moving through these sections, the appraisal of business personal property shall be in accordance with the provisions of Title 32, as the same may from time to time be amended. 
provided that all business personal property acquired by a taxpayer after September 30th, 1995 shall be exempt from tax. So uh, you've dealt with a lot of these over the last few years, mostly in the context of repeals of business personal property taxes. Here, the city is carrying over uh, the existing personal property tax from the village, uh, which doesn't touch property acquired after September 30th, 1995. Uh, Section 805, uh, interestingly, contains a statement of purpose around the appointing of the assessor. The purpose of appointing an assessor is in lieu of the election of listers and the city shall be governed by and each taxpayer shall have the rights granted by the applicable general law concerning real and personal property taxation. Subchapter nine governs the city's budget process. Section 901 provides that the fiscal year of the city shall be the first day of July and end on the last day of June of each calendar year. Section 902 governs the annual municipal budget. With support from the finance department, the manager is required to submit to the city council a budget for review before the annual city meeting. The budget shall contain, and we have an enumerated list of minimum requirements here. First, an estimate of the financial condition of the city. Second, an itemized statement of appropriations recommended for current expenses and for capital improvements with comparative statements of approach appropriations and estimated expenditures for the current fiscal year. An itemized statement of estimated revenues from all sources other than taxation for the next fiscal year. A capital budget for not fewer than the next five fiscal years showing anticipated capital expenditures, financing and tax requirements. And then any other information that the city council may require as part of that budget proposal. Section 903, the city council will then review and approve the recommended budget with or without change from what they receive from the manager. The budget shall be published not later than two weeks after its preliminary adoption by the council and the council will fix the time and place for holding a public hearing on the budget. City Council is required under Section 904 to hold at least one public hearing 30 days prior to the annual meeting to present and explain the proposed budget. And the manager, not less than 30 days prior to the meeting, shall make available the Council's recommended budget and the final warning of the next final warning of the pending annual meeting. The annual city report shall be made available to the legal voters of the city not later than 10 days prior to the annual meeting. Section 905, Appropriation and Transfers. Uh, the annual budget shall be adopted at the city meeting by the vote of a majority of the eligible voters. If after the total budget has been appropriated, the council finds additional appropriations necessary, the appropriations shall be made and reported at the next city, city meeting as a specific item. The appropriations shall only be made in special circumstances or situations of an emergency nature. From the effective date of the budget, the amounts that are stated in the budget shall become appropriated to the several agencies and purposes that are named in the budget. The manager made any time transfer an unencumbered appropriation balance or portion between general classifications of expenditures within an office department or agency uh, at the request of the manager, the council may by resolution transfer any unencumbered appropriation balance within the council budget from one department to another. This is a, an area if you're interested in getting into the granular detail where you may wanna look at some of the prohibited commingling of funds that will overlap this uh, uh, while the charter provision permits certain commingling here. It will be read in the context of other general law. One example that comes to mind immediately is that uh, highway department funds are not permitted to be commingled with any of the other funds held within the general fund. Uh, 
Um, and that specific prohibition under general law would likely overlap this. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I, I, to which I would add uh, in the commingling discussion, uh, those that are specifically voted to fund a capital budget um, as opposed to the operating. But my question actually goes back to the use of the word appropriation and the fact or your um, reading of a process by which the council can meet and uh, the, the exact language I think was to change an appropriation. I, I'm, my understanding is the general law essentially limits uh, those appropriations to the overall budget cap and then the other language that you recited uh, confines the, the width of transfer, that is to say. But what I'm getting at is it seemed to me that the, the language uh, in enabling the council to increase an appropriation seems rather open-ended. And yet, I'm pretty sure uh, that the overall budget cannot be exceeded. That's the permission that the voters have given the council and manager to spend. Am I, uh, am I off on that? You are not off. One of the details that I went over, and I apologize for getting into so much detail during this initial walkthrough, but one of the details that I went through is that if in those emergency circumstances, the city council is going to need an additional appropriation beyond what was approved, they must present whatever that emergency additional appropriation was as an item at the next city meeting. And one thing that I will point out there, and uh, I did make a note about it, is that there should be some consistency throughout the charter, uh, whether this is an annual meeting or whether a special meeting would be required to be called. And it just uses the term city meeting. By default, that would likely mean the annual meeting. All right, section 906. Uh, this governs the amount to be raised by taxation. Upon approval of the budget by the voters, the amounts that are stated in the budget uh, to be raised by taxes shall constitute a determination of the amount of the levy for purposes of the city and the corresponding tax year. And the council shall levy those taxes on the grand list as prepared by the assessor for the corresponding tax year. Again, these are echoing the provisions in Title 32 and Title 24 about that process and those officers' duties. Subchapter 10 deals with taxation. Section 1001, taxes on real property shall be paid in equal installments on March 15th and September 15th. The council shall send notice to taxpayers not less than 30 days prior to when taxes are due. Um, this is something that's permitted by general law. Here, they're taking that general law authority and codifying it within their charter with specific dates. Section 1002, an additional charge of 8% shall be added to any tax not paid on or before the dates that are specified in the previous section. Again, that is uh, permissive under general law, and 8% is the capped amount. Notwithstanding section 906 of this charter uh, and any general law requirements, the council is authorized and empowered to negotiate and execute assessment and taxation agreements between the city and the taxpayer or taxpayers within the city uh, consistent with applicable requirements of the Vermont constitution. A little bit vague there, but at the end, I believe that what they are pointing to is the proportionality clause of the Vermont constitution. Uh, so they can come up with specific assessment relationships with taxpayers, uh, provided that it comports with Vermont's proportionality clause. Um, and you may want to hear some testimony on this, but uh, there are um, specific allowances under Vermont's tax law where municipalities can enter into essentially tax agreement contracts with certain entities 
uh, that are paid over a period of time, essentially a reduction tax rate to entice certain uh, entities to operate within the town. Representative Anthony. I would commonly include what we call stabilization agreements, uh, Tucker. Yes, that is what I was getting at. And what about the uh, somewhat murky area of charitable and public uh, use kinds of exemptions, um, which uh, oftentimes include portions which qualify under the benefits clause and portions of a property which do not. That would all be governed by the general law that exempts certain types of pious and charitable properties from uh, property taxation by the municipalities. So I would not see this specific section of the charter as being in conflict with those general laws. However, you brought up the perfect example of the stabilization agreement. That is something that I think is being alluded to here in this section. Proportionality. I thought I was finished. What a mistake. Um, the proportionality comment uh, applies to uh, situations where a property is judged by the assessor to be mixed between a pious use and uh, not qualified. Fine. Do I get that? The proportionality clause of the Vermont Constitution, and I'll try to keep this as simple as possible, essentially says that taxes should be proportionate to the taxpayer and the benefit they receive. Essentially, you should not tax one entity at a rate that directly benefits someone else. And I can bring you back to uh, a discussion that we had three years ago, the town of Bennington Charter, where they were proposing to expand uh, taxing district boundaries uh, based on a municipal vote, but there would be entities that would be paying a special assessment tax if the boundaries were changed, where they would receive no benefits. Uh, and essentially, we not only have a constitutional structure, but a statutory structure that says, you know, for example, if you're gonna be raising a tax for uh, water utility lines and things like that, then those that are paying the assessment tax should be those that are receiving the benefit. You shouldn't use an ad valorem tax to give a benefit to a limited population of people. Thank you. All right, let's see if we can jog through the last few pages. All right, uh, moving through subchapter 11 deals with uh, capital programs within the city. Uh, essentially, the city manager is charged with preparing and submitting to the council a capital program um, at least three months prior to the date of the budget. The program shall include a summary of its contents, a list of all the capital improvements that are proposed, cost estimates, uh, of methods of financing, recommended time schedules for the improvements, the estimated annual costs of operating and maintaining uh, proposed facilities, um, and there's the opportunity for revision built within this. Subchapter 12 deals with the amendment of the charter. The charter may be amended uh, as provided by state law for the amendment of charters. Subchapter so 13 contains a series of general provisions. These are contained within many of the charters. Again, they don't necessarily add any specific powers. This includes a savings clause in section 1301, a severability clause in section 1302, and uh, specific superseding language in section 1303. In that section, it states that the city shall be formed notwithstanding language that is contained within the town of Essex Charter. Within the town's charter, it states that notwithstanding the provisions of any other municipal charters, so it's pointing to the village there, the territory within the corporate limits of the town shall not be annexed to or become part of any other municipal corporation, except as set out in the general law. So essentially within the town's charter, they were pointing to the general law, which allows 
uh, villages to annex territory within a town by consent of those who reside in that territory. And they're saying town territory can only be annexed by the village pursuant to general law. And here the city is setting that aside and saying our charter is going to supersede that. Um, I will say that each of those 1301, 1302, and 1303 are examples of charter language that is not necessary um, to establishing the city or granting it its powers. The next chunk that we will go through is a series of sections governing the transition from the village to the city. Section three governs the transition and assignment uh, of village assets and liabilities. It essentially states that all of the assets and obligations that were for formerly owned or held by the village uh, and that haven't been otherwise transferred or resolved by this point shall transfer to the city. Uh, that includes real property, uh, interest in property, equipment, personal property, rents, charges, lien rights, enforcement powers, uh, and essentially any financial instrument, including indebtedness that the village has. All uh, of the active contracts, agreements, and trusts uh, that obligate the village um, shall remain in effect and shall transfer to the city. The city is essentially going to assume all of those liabilities. Section four establishes the transition period. So when the charter becomes effective and the city uh, is established according to this act, the transition period will begin on that date. Uh, so July 1st, 2022, following the General Assembly's approval of the charter, and will end on July 1st, 2023. So we have a one year transition period here. During that period, the city shall continue to receive and pay for consolidated services with the town uh, for administration, assessing, the clerk slash treasurer office, finances, uh, information technology, police, public works, and stormwater. The city shall set a tax rate and collect taxes to meet the obligations for the city's share of town municipal operations and all of the city's municipal operations throughout the transition period. Uh, and this would be according to the budgets that were approved by the voters of the town and the village uh, in the prior annual meeting. The taxes collected by the city for the town shall be paid to the town in two equal installments. At the end of the transition period, the city is proposed to be fully organized. Uh, nothing in this section is intended to limit reservations made in other transitional provisions throughout this act, essentially another savings clause. Section five provides for the organizational meeting of the city. So the first annual city meeting shall occur on the date set forth by the voters at the most recent village annual meeting, which is up and coming, following the approval of the charter. There shall be a meeting of the city of Essex Junction and shall be noticed and warned to all the residents of the city. Uh, at that meeting, uh, that they shall present and discuss the budget only. That's all they're going to do. Uh, they can discuss other city business, but here it states expressly that the, they will not be voting on other issues besides the budget. Uh, after presentation and discussion of the budget, the meeting will adjourn, voting on the budget, and the election of councillors will be by Australian ballot. Section six contains the transitional provisions for the village center and neighborhood development area designations provides that the village center district and neighborhood development area shall continue in the new city for the purpose of continuing downtown revitalization efforts as outlined in the village's comprehensive plan and that the city shall retain any and all state designations for the purposes of rede redevelopment. Section seven, transitional provisions for the trustees to the new governing body, the city council. On the effective date of the charter, uh, all members of the village board of trustees shall become members of the city council. So you have direct transfer trustee to city councilor. 
and shall continue to serve in their capacities until they serve out their elected terms. President, vice president, and clerk of the council shall continue to serve in their capacities until the board reorganizes. The counselors shall warn and hold meetings as appropriate and shall address all details and issues relating to the transition from the village to the city. Um, the council, once it is formed, will have the power to review, consider, and adopt all ordinances and plans from the former village of Essex Junction as its own. So they're reserving to the council here the opportunity to take all of those village ordinances and carry them over for the purposes of the city. The council with the assistant of the manager uh, shall propose and more in the first annual budget for consideration by the voters at the first annual meeting. Section eight contains a transitional provision for budget and administration. Following the approval of the charter by the general assembly, the manager shall, manager shall propose a budget for the city for the next fiscal year that addresses proper service levels, contract obligations, capital projects, and debt. Uh, so something to note here is that introductory clause is not con uh, contingent on the act becoming effective. It is only contingent on the approval of the charter by the legislature. Next transitional provision governs the separation of the city and town departments. Uh, as you know, the city is going to employ a city manager. The manager shall plan and hire for the separation of all consolidated departments within the town by the end of the transition period. Again, that's July 1st, 2023, unless contracts are signed stating otherwise, in which case the contracts shall dictate the terms for the sharing of services between the city and the town. Uh, so going back to what feels like 10 days ago, but was likely an hour ago, Representative, if that was your question, and you may want to investigate what contracts may be extended beyond the transitional period for the sharing of services between these two municipalities. Section 10, transitional provision for planning and development. Um, the former villages zoning bylaws and land development code and any ordinances shall remain in effect until they're amended or revised by the city council. And further, that the village planning commission and zoning board of adjustment shall become those boards under the city government. Transitional provisions in section 11 deal with appointed commission and committee members. All current trustee appointed commission and committee members shall serve out the remainder of their terms and new positions shall be filled upon the existing schedules established in the village. Under section 12, we deal with the unification and adoption of ordinances, bylaws, and rules. We dealt with some of that in the context of development just a few seconds ago. Uh, all ordinances and bylaws of the village shall become ordinances and bylaws of the city. The city is fully authorized to amend or repeal any ordinance uh, in accordance with this charter and general law. Section 13, this deals with personnel. Um, on the effective date of this charter, the employees of the village shall become employees of the city and all contracts for employment with the village shall be assumed by the city. Uh, personnel policies and regulations that have been adopted by the village shall become the policies and regulations of the city. The dates of hire within the village will be used as the dates of hire for purposes of related purposes related to benefits with the new city of Essex Junction and all accrued benefits for village employees are going to carry over to city employment. Section 14 deals with finances. The city shall adopt any and all portions of the town of Essex grand list for properties located within the borders of the city. So for those properties within the corporate limits of what is currently the village, that will become the grand list of the city. Any and all property tax payments that are due and delinquencies incurred for the village prior to the effective date of the charter shall be payable to the town of Essex. Upon the effective date of the charter, and the establishment of the city, any city taxes due and delinquencies incurred shall be payable to the city. So prior to, that goes to the town. 
after the date of effectiveness that goes to the city. All contractual agreements, uh, including tax stabilization agreements uh, and any agreements related to the conveyance of real estate within the village shall be assigned to the city of Essex Junction. Section 15 establishes the future governance commission. Within three years after the approval of this charter, the city council is going to be required to appoint a special commission to study governance considerations. Uh, and they give an example here, forms of government, elections of officials at large or through wards or districts, governing body composition, terms of office, term limits and council compensation. So board is gonna be formed to give advice to the city council about how to move forward with city government in future years. We're at the end. And the end is first that the village charter uh, will be repeated and will no longer be a corporate entity. Under section 17, the effective date here specifically, unlike other charters is not on passage, but is July 1st, 2022, which will kick off that transitional period. And those are the words on the page. Thank you, Tucker. I appreciate your uh, thorough walkthrough and would open it up for committee members to ask any uh, lingering questions that they might have right now. Good. Representative Vyhovsky. Thank you. I imagine I probably have a lot of questions, but that was thorough and long and I suspect I'll have to process them. But the first one that comes to mind for me is if in your view, this city charter, given that the village charter has a relationship to the town outside the village charter, if the enactment of the city charter would have, would in any way force changes to be made to the town of Essex charter. Sorry if that was convoluted. This whole thing is a little convoluted. I uh, understood you perfectly. It's a fantastic point. And the answer is that uh, the establishment of the city is going to require changes, not only in any charter that refers to the former village, but also in a few provisions of general law that identify the municipalities of the state. So if this charter moves forward, uh, provisions are gonna have to be included, for example, to add the city of Essex Junction to the list of municipalities uh, within uh, the state. And uh, there's designation, for example, of municipalities for purposes of districting, those statutes will have to be amended to recognize the city of Essex Junction. There's going to have to be some cleanup if this moves forward. Yes. Okay. Asi but aside from cleanup and, and the sort of technical changes, it would not force any substantive changes to the town of Essex charter. Like there's no places where the town, like the town charter significantly has to change because of this. I have not looked into whether there are substantive relationships between the town and the village that are specifically referenced in the town charter, but I will. Thank you so much. My other question, and this may be something that you also don't have the answer to, is around the select board that is currently made up of residents of the town outside the village and residents of what would become the city. What would happen to those select board members who are now residents in the city and not the town outside of the village. I'm going to have to take a look at the town of Essex Charter and see whether they have a specific provision allowing non-residents to occupy their legislative body. My intuition tells me that uh, they do not and that that would be uh, deemed a vacancy. Okay. At that point. Thank you. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Tucker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> your concluding comment about the effective dates, is there a fail-safe position or provision if for some reason uh, this process is not concluded by July 1, 23? That is a question that should go to uh, those working within the village right now, or perhaps the representatives of the village who have been intimately involved with the process. There's no failsafe built into the bill. Um, in fact, some of the things that I highlighted 
aren't even contingent on the bill moving forward. They are a ref reflection of plans that will move forward um, now that this is in front of the General Assembly. So one of the things that I highlighted uh, before this is signed and becomes effective, um, they're going to be moving, the town manager is going to be moving forward with uh, some of the budget proposals, you know, for the fiscal year, which starts July 1st. Uh, so that's something that you should explore with um, representatives from the village. Any other questions from committee members? Representative Gannon. So Tucker, this is a really, my, I think it's a minor point. Um, on page 16, line 11, it refers to subdivision 301B4 of this charter, which I believe deals with investigations, but I couldn't find that. Well, I went to section 301 and it had nothing to do with investigations. Representative Gannon, as always, a keen eye. That reference should be to section 201B4, which provides that the city shall have the power to inquire into the conduct of any officer, commissioner, department. So that is a technical correction that should be made before this moves forward. Okay. Thank you. And I just, I just thought that that was a very limiting session of when the city council can go into executive session without the manager. I mean, only if he's under investigation um, or they're discussing um, his personnel record. I mean, that's pretty narrow. What if there's a whistleblower complaint? You know, it says there's embezzlement in the city, but it's not specific to the, the, the manager. Right. I mean, I, I would think that the city council would probably not want to have, have any personnel in that meeting. Right. Representative McCarthy. I mean, I, if I was putting my city manager's hat on, he would say, I would want to be in that meeting unless I was the subject of it. I mean, it, sometimes you don't know. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting. And maybe someone wouldn't want to come forward if there was anyone else there. Like, if all you know, there's there appears to have been an embezzlement, but it's unclear who did it. Like for example, your auditor comes back and finds an account is missing money. That's all they know. Then any member of the, the city could or it would be likely the treasurer or the town manager or city manager in this case might be culpable. Good questions. Yeah. More I, 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 just, to dig into. I, I just think it's very narrowing to just say, okay, these are the only two times that the city council can meet in executive session without the manager being present. Yeah, that's a great, a great issue to flag um, for the village trustees who will become the city council and understand what their thoughts are on this. Um, any other questions for Tucker about the bill as introduced? All right. Um, we are, Tucker has his hand up. Hi, Tucker. I apologize. I uh, had promised interested parties, specifically the sponsor of the bill who spoke to you earlier that I would relay two uh, concerns that they wanted to highlight um, with the bill. The first is that justices of the peace are currently elected by the town and per the Vermont constitution, justices of the peace have to be elected at the uh, November general election by the town that they are going to serve in. So that is an issue that needs to be addressed as these two municipalities split. First, whether the current justices of the peace can serve across town lines and whether there's any problem with that. Uh, and two, whether because of the specific language within the Vermont Constitution, 
uh, an election or a special election could be held immediately, not waiting until November to make sure that there are justices of the peace that can serve in the city as it's established. Um, and let me, I'm so sorry to delay you, pull up my notes really quickly. He's looking something up. Uh, yes, the transitional provision that we went through in section four, uh, that some of the provisions should be removed, uh, specifically about continuing to receive and paying for consolidated services with the town for administration and finance. Those two terms, administrative services and finance, should be removed because those services have already been separated. So for that year of the transitional period, they should not be added back into the mix. Question? Go ahead. Madam Chair, uh, I think um, it, it appears to me that there could be other issues um, and are we gonna hear from somebody from the town of Essex as well? I believe that we will hear from both the select board chair and the village trustees chair and, um, and hear a little bit more about the conversations that are going on between the two entities about planning for separation. Thank you. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, Tucker on the heels, thank you, Madam Chair. On the heels of your observation about justice of the peace not waiting <clears throat> until next uh, November, because they double as uh, members of the BCA together with members of the legislative body, I'm wondering whether to be sure there's sufficient personnel to constitute the uh, BCA, whether some provision uh, to include the uh, village trustees explicitly uh, as serving as if uh, they were members of the council and therefore members of um, uh, the uh, BCA. Uh, so the BCA is simply not limited to three justice of the peace. That can be addressed in a transitional provision, certainly. And I'll also direct you to the BCA provision within the charter. I'll send you the language later, but they reference general law authority within that section of the charter. Great, other committee questions? All right, welcome back to the House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this afternoon to hear from a couple more witnesses on H-491, an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and adoption of the city charter. Um, we have with us today uh, Mr. Brown from the Village Trustees and Mr. Murray, who is Vice Chair of the Select Board. I understand that the Chair of the Select Board um, had a family emergency and wasn't able to join us, um, and so we wish him well. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Murray, for, for coming to speak with us in his place. Um, I think since this is the... Uh, the village uh, separation charter proposal. I'm gonna go first to Andrew Brown, who I gather is the president of the village trustees. So welcome, Mr. Brown, and please share with us your perspective on why the village of Essex Junction would like to become the city of Essex Junction. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Colpin Hanses, Vice Chair, uh, Representative Gannon, Ranking Member, Representative LeClaire and the Full House Committee on Government Operations. Truly appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and to really help advocate on behalf of the 88% of Village of Essex Junction residents who voted to separate from the town of Essex. And really what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off uh, in the similar way that the trustees started off all of our work sessions, which we conducted from April uh, through September, when we were creating this, this charter to begin with. And we started it off with a review of our goal statement, which states to create an independent Essex Junction, ensuring that it has a foundation that provides for economic and political stability, reflects the village character, has opportunity for growth, 
and looks towards the future. Further, the village trustees agreed to the statement on how we would get there, which states, this will be a village-led process that is future-oriented. We will steer clear of distractions and act with civility, transparency, and deliberateness. The trustees will work to develop consensus and speak with a consistent voice. We will engage with, bring together, seek input from, and work to inform our community. We will work with the select board and maintain a healthy relationship with our neighbors in the town. To that last point, one of the things I want to make sure to highlight is that on May 24th of 2021, the village trustees and the town select board agreed to and signed an amicable separation resolution, which in part states, the select board and trustees will meet in good faith to cooperatively develop mutually beneficial agreements as necessary to, reach, to achieve an amicable separation, along with the possible provision of sharing services. Members of the select board and trustees agree to negotiate in good faith throughout the amicable separation process. I say this to ensure all of you know that the intent is to ensure that the town of Essex and city of Essex Junction remain cooperative neighbors and in no way should this be viewed as a messy divorce. Uh, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Chair, if you don't mind, uh, you asked, your original question is, or was why does the village of Essex Junction want to separate from the town of Essex and to create an independent city? Uh, I can certainly go into the, the why, although I believe that Representative Houghton did a great job of, of doing so. Um, mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, what I would like to take some of the time uh, at this moment to do is to go through uh, some of the questions that I that I heard from the previous uh, the previous committee time on this this charter change. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, I, I believe there was a question around uh, what will separation mean for emergency services. One of the things I want to make sure that is understood: uh, the village of Essex Junction and the town of Essex currently have their own independent fire departments. They are not funded uh, together. They are their own separate entities funded by the unique municipalities. Uh, SFSCI, which provides the EMS services, is a separate nonprofit. And the police department, that is one that is slightly unique in the sense that the town of Essex oversees the police department for Essex, the whole. And one of the agreements that the trustees and the select board have worked uh, diligently on is an agreement to continue to have the Essex Police Department provide services to those in the town of Essex and to those of us that would be in the city of Essex Junction. In this agreement uh, it is a multi-year agreement where essentially the two uh, entities would pay the necessary costs for the police department on a per capita basis as our populations are relatively similar. Uh, but that this would be a department that is overseen by the town of Essex. So essentially, the city of Essex Junction is contracting with the town of Essex for uh, police services. On a related note, there was a question around uh, whether our charter for the city of Essex Junction would interfere with a conflict around uh, the uh, termination or supervision of the chief of police. Given the agreement uh, that we have with the town of Essex, the police department would be overseen by the town of Essex. And so the police chief would be an employee of the town of Essex. And so that individual would not be subject to the city of Essex Junction's charter. Uh, there was another question about what has to be unwound and what has to be stood up in terms of uh, which departments are, uh, which municipality has which departments. So I have already mentioned the police department. We, are, uh, we have finalized an agreement with the town of Essex on an assessor through the reappraisal process, where essentially the city of Essex Junction will contract with the town of Essex for the, uh, the impending uh, reappraisal pro process that should start in the next couple of years. Once that process has concluded, our municipalities may continue to have a shared assessor, or we can separate the assessing department or assessing function and have our own. Uh, but that would be a decision for a future board at that point in time. We uh, have an agreement to separate the IT functions and to ensure that we can uh, extract all necessary data from town servers as necessary, so that that way, uh, come the effective date of the charter, 
uh, from day one, we can have a fully functioning city of Essex Junction uh, information technology infrastructure, which we would have contracted out through a separate provider. Uh, we, I believe you heard at the last time, uh, we have an agreement where stormwater, we will work together when necessary, but that we would have our own individual stormwater uh, um, processes and funding. Uh, we, we currently are unwinding our finance staff in our finance department. We are unwinding the clerk and the treasurer functions. Uh, both of those are in, are in an agreement that we have discussed as recently as last night. We are working on an agreement to uh, share the benefits of recreation in our community, so that, that way our residents are treated equally in terms of recreation services. Other than that, everything else is separate. So finance will be separate after the transitional period. Um, as our previous books had been, or our previous processes had been consolidated, so those are being unwound. Uh, our staff, though, are going to be separate. So the town has a finance director. The village is going to be having a finance director starting on February 7th. The town has a manager and the village slash city, we are already uh, starting the process to hire for a city manager. The city of Essex Junction has a wastewater treatment plant, which I know was discussed at the previous meeting. As a recap, the city of Essex or the village of Essex Junction's wastewater treatment plant serves the town of Essex, the village of Essex Junction and the town of Williston in a very collaborative manner. Uh, in, in no way are we trying to replicate anything else going on in any other municipality. Um, as that is a, a great uh, collaboration that has existed for many decades. We have separate recreation departments. Uh, we have separate public works departments. Uh, while the village's public works department is funded through town, the town taxes, they are supervised by the village of Essex Junction. Uh, they are uh, village of Essex Junction employees. We have separate community development departments. So planning, zoning, that is all separate. So overwhelmingly, we are separate in many ways. And for those uh, where it makes sense, we are working collaboratively with the solution to continue those, uh, those opportunities. Uh, there was a question around, <laughs> and around move out. Sorry for the chuckle on that one. Uh, yes, move out in terms of a representative or a, uh, a city council member moving out of the uh, more specific alternative, we would certainly support that. Hmm. Uh, there was another question around section uh, 503. Andrew, could you do me a favor? Um, your audio How we is... adopt ordinances. That space between the adoption date is normally 45 days, and ours is... Oh, is my audio becoming choppy? Your audio is becoming choppy, and I don't think we were able to hear your answer to the move out question. So if you could back up to that and try again. Um... Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me any better now? Uh, so far, so good. Great. My apologies. Uh, so yes, with the move out statement, we would certainly support uh, the, the recommendation from, I believe it was Representative McCarthy or Legislative Council. Uh, frankly, that is, we are amenable to that. Uh, so I was from there, I was going on to Section 503 in the ordinances. And that with our ordinance uh, proposal, it was slightly different than, than what is uh, common in that the effective date would be effective upon passage. Uh, the intention there was that the rescission date would still be applicable, um, but seeing as that is different than what is uh, common practice in the state, we would certainly be amenable to have that be the typical uh, effective upon 45 days after passage. There was another question around section 1003. And let me take that moment to just say, I'm really sorry about how much time y'all spent on this charter. It was certainly very lengthy uh, and appreciate the time that you all took to, to go through it. Not a problem, that's our job.
Uh, so section 1003 and around uh, utilize tax stabilization agree, and we have utilized the tax stabilization agreement for that farm. Uh, after the charter review, there were some other questions or any uh, potential changes to the town of Essex charter. And in looking at the town of Essex charter, there is no direct mention of the village of Essex Junction municipality. There is a mention, a mention of the village of Essex Junction school district, which no longer exists. But other than that, there is no direct mention of the village of Essex Junction. Uh, there was a question around a fail safe provision, should the charter not pass. Uh, we are currently planning on uh, the best case scenario in that the House, the Senate, the governor signs off on this charter change. Uh, we need to plan for that as um, there are going to be some uh, initial uh, individuals that we need to hire. As I mentioned, we've, we've already made the offer uh, to a new finance director who is starting at the beginning of next month. We're starting the process for a city manager. And so we need to make sure that we are prepared for that scenario should it happen. Uh, other than that, should the should this bill not pass this session, we will be right back here at the exact same place as uh, this is absolutely desirable by uh, the Village of Essex Junction community, and frankly, overwhelmingly so, as there were more individuals voting for separation than there were for any of the previous merger proposals. There was another question around. Uh, the investigative powers, um, oh, I'm sorry, that was a question around uh, when the city manager would be in executive session. Honestly, whatever the committee would feel comfortable with, we are more than comfortable with. Uh, there are times where we do not want the manager to be a part of the executive sessions. Uh, I believe it was uh, Vice Chair Representative Gannon who had, who had talked about that. And yes, there are certainly times where we need to be able to do that, um, not necessarily just in terms of evaluating performance. Uh, there was a, another question um, around section, or a reference to section 301, where that was just a, a typo where instead of 301, that should be 201. Um, so we certainly appreciate that being fixed. Apologize for that typo. And there was also a, a question around uh, Justice of the Peace and BCA, which I believe that the Legislative Council had already, had already addressed in the committee time. Uh, other than that, the, the main thing that, again, I really wanted to, to drive home, as you can see here, uh, the select board chair, while unfortunately, there, as was mentioned, there are some health concerns that are going on. I wish him and his family well. But we have the vice chair of the select board here to really help in, and ensure that the committee understands that this is not uh, one community trying to harm another. We are neighbors. Some of us, like myself, grew up in one part and now live in the other. Uh, our children end up going to the same high school. So we root for them together on sports teams. We watch their plays. Um, many of our, our children become classmates in the high school, and so we certainly don't want to jeopardize that, that future relationship in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and overwhelmingly, if there are other concerns around the charter that was provided to you all, we are very amenable to what the committee believes is in the best interests of, of our community. You all look at many more charters than we do, and you have that expertise, and uh, we are very amenable to that, as frankly, we want to ensure that separation passes. Thank you so much for being with us today and um, thank you for taking the time to look at the previous committee hearing that we had on this subject because it's very helpful to um, to have someone from on the ground uh, help us answer these questions so committee members any follow-up questions uh, for mr brown representative leclerc thank you madam chair good afternoon mr brown um, it looks like I'll be one of two that might potentially be reporting this charter change. So I just, I have a couple of questions. I just want to make sure that I understand that going forward, you're going to be continuing to share the police department, the assessor, the rec department, wastewater uh, plant. How about the uh, Brownell library? 
our libraries are separate entities. Uh, the Brownell Library serves the village of Essex Junction. The uh, Essex Free Library is built to serve those outside the village in the town. And so those will continue okay. to remain separate. Thank you for asking okay. that. I forgot to mention that. All right. Um, are there any other shared services that you can think of going forward or even maybe shared positions? Not shared services or shared positions at this point, uh, unless I am forgetting something, and in which case I am, I would look to Vice Chair uh, Murray to certainly correct me. Um, it, similarly, in the future, at this point in time, our, our boards and even our staff have agreed that separation is in the best interests as uh, our boards in many ways have differing uh, priorities. And as such, it's been a bit of a, a taxing experience for many of our, our management staff. Sure. Um, I just have one more question. It's, uh, I guess it's section 15 in the proposed charter. It's actually one of the last paragraphs. Um, the Transitional Provision Future Governance Commission. Can you speak to the intent of that? Potentially. You that was, certainly. You said that was section 16? Uh, section 15. Yes. So the intent of this is uh, early on, there were questions as to whether or not the city of Essex Junction should have a mayor, whether or not uh, five city councilors is appropriate. And the intention of this committee is to explore those, those concerns and to help provide a recommendation back to the city council. One of the things that we wanted to ensure as we were going through this process is we didn't want to change the experience of the village of Essex Junction residents. We wanted to ensure that the city of Essex Junction, frankly, is take away the word village, replace it with city, and that's what you get. Uh, and so we didn't want to change the governance structure at this point, even though we had heard from some of our, our constituents that they would like that. So this, the intent here is to have that committee explore those opportunities. Okay, so this is just to do with the potential city of Essex as opposed to looking at any shared governance structure going forward between the two entities. <laughs> yes, you are correct. Okay, very good. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? All right, I am seeing none. Um, so Patrick Murray, um, welcome and thank you for being here to speak on behalf of the select board of the town of Essex um, and would welcome your thoughts on the charter proposal as a whole um, and and also would love to have you explore a little bit uh, for the committee to help us understand the collaboration that has happened between the village and the town um, to get to the point where we stand today. So welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I apologize a bit in advance. Um, I was not anticipating uh, needing to testify today. So as you can see behind me, my uh, nerd is in full <laughs> swing <laughs> with the various uh, comic uh, <laughs> paraphernalia. Um, speaking more seriously though, um, it has long been, and uh, our chair, Andy Watts, has used this exact phrasing that the select board does not wish to get in the way of the formation of a city of Essex Junction. Um, it is not our, not our intent or our desire um, to try to throw up any roadblocks or to prevent this from happening in any way. Uh, the select board's concern is obviously uh, in what is now a bit of a tricky situation. We are representing both those individuals who live outside of the village in Essex currently, but we are at current still representing all of those individuals who live within the village of Essex Junction because they remain residents of the town. Um, that creates quite a balancing act when we are going through um, all of our proposals and through working with the trustees in the various agreements that we've come to. Um, I think so far, however, we've been fairly successful. Um, we have worked continually, continuously with the trustees um, since the results of this vote last April. 
um, and have gone through a significant number of uh, agreements that have been set into place. Uh, we continue to work on those, uh, as Andrew Brown mentioned, um, you know, police services, uh, assessor, uh, stormwater, um, clerk, treasurer, uh, you know, we continue to work on those, um, but we have made significant progress in what we classified as as higher tier agreements, uh, simply just a, a way for us to identify those items that are of a significant priority. Police services, for example, was the, I think, number one concern for almost all of the citizens that we represent. Um, now, I did not spend as much time watching uh, your last meeting on this as Andrew did. So I'm not sure that I'll be able to go through each question. Um, there was one in particular though that I would like to reference. Um, there was some question as to once the residency of select board members, um, should that change What if uh, the city of Essex Junction does indeed become a city? Um, at present, I am the only representative on the select board who lives within the village of Essex Junction. Uh, again, that tricky balancing act. Um, however, um, you know, in this case, uh, I am not uh, running for my seat in April. My term will end at that point. Uh, so there will be no residents uh, of this village of Essex Junction who will sit on the select board at that point. Um, our largest concern obviously has been uh, you know, limiting the difficulty and the, you know, financial uh, aspects of the separation, um, losing 40, roughly 42% of, you know, the tax base does uh, come with its own <laughs> unique challenges, um, some of which uh, we've already begun to address. Um, we have reduced our administrative staff um, we anticipate in the time going forward being able to uh, reduce some of the levels of uh, uh, some of the uh, I won't say levels of service, um, but we will you know, be able to reduce some of the uh, employee numbers that we have. Um, and ideally, we also hope to use fund balance going forward to smooth out the sudden jump in you know, anticipated tax rate. Uh, so for us who are on the select board our biggest concern is simply timing um, we can plan and we can uh, you know theorize about a lot of the financial questions um, but you know until we know a specific date uh, that's going to be difficult for us to speak with real certainty about you know where we may make adjustments um, however we are more than prepared to do so Thank you. Um, questions from committee members? Go ahead, Rick Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. This may be a question more for Mr. Brown, but uh, either you, Mr. Murray, um, going back to uh, holding the same assessor or assessors uh, between the village and the town, um, how is that going to work? Does property evaluation or review uh, consider uh, each of those uh, entities a separate grand list and uh, and so on. I, I just uh, wondering how that works. Uh, certainly. Um, not at present. Um, you know we as a select board uh, will continue to function as if um, you know until we hear the word as if we will remain one town. Um, it's just simply how I think we have to continue to move forward to, uh, you know, give our citizens a uh, relatively, uh, <laughs> should I say, uh, uh, to try to avoid introducing, you know, as many elements of the unknown or uncertainty as we can. Um, so in this case, uh, yeah, right now and currently, and I believe until after um, the city becomes obviously its own municipality, we our assessor will treat that as one grand list. Um, Andrew, if I'm missing anything, certainly please feel free to uh, step in. Yes, uh, thank you, if I may. Uh, the only other portion that I wanted to, to mention is that our town staff, um, through using the geographic information system capabilities that staffing have, 
already have the separated grand list of which or have the notation as to which properties are currently within the village and would then become in the city, which would be uh, in the town outside of the village. And so they are, are well equipped to be able to manage that process and be able to distinguish which property is on which side of the line. Thank you. Other questions? Representative LeClaire. Manager. Um, I don't know which one of you this would apply to, but um, other than the proposed charter change, do you have like a master document that you're working from, like a memorandum of understanding or what, what are you using to work from to agree on what are going to be shared services and then how you're going to unwind some of the other things that you have? Yes, absolutely. I'll, Andrew, if you don't mind, I'll begin and then uh, fill in. We do indeed have a list. Uh, we generated uh, an MOU um, and within that uh, are the various uh, agreements that we have worked on since late last year. Um, that does include the police services, that includes the stormwater, um, all of the various departments, the unwinding and the untangling. Um, this uh, document contains, uh, while the while it does contain all of those uh, different agreements, not every single one of them is final yet. So um, you know, it's uh, something. It's certainly documentation that is available. Um, I would just simply hesitate to say, you know, we use that as a complete, hard and fast uh, you know, list of you know, this is the map how we get from A to B. Um, it is uh, simply what we have worked on and created uh, in the you know for um, mutual respect between our communities and <clears throat> hopefully going forward to as I mentioned minimize the impact on all of our citizens. Um, so I recognize it's kind of a, a working document. Is that something that's uh, accessible to the public? It is indeed, yes. Uh, that documentation is contained within every agenda packet that we send out for meetings that we work on it. Um, and there is also a sort of a, a larger master uh, plan, as it were, um, that was is also available on our Essex website. We're good. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I have a couple of quick questions, and then I actually do have to go because I have an appointment at 3.30. But um, my first question around the um, select board and who's on the select board, I recognize you are not running for re-election, but there is nothing barring another city or village resident from running for that seat, is there? There is nothing barring that, uh, no. Uh, as of, I believe, yesterday, uh, the deadline for those who are running for the upcoming <laughs> seats um, has ended. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, there are no village residents who are running for the three open select board seats that we have in March. Thank you. I, I will certainly, I have slightly, I, I thought someone hadn't had announced, but maybe they didn't file the paperwork, but that is helpful. Um, and then my other question around these memorandums of understanding, am I right that sort of the police sharing piece was voted on in the charter change and the rest of them are being negotiated between the trustees and the select board? Or is that incorrect? Uh, we have, oh, Andrew, please go ahead. Uh, within the, the, if I may, uh, within the charter itself, uh, in the transitional provisions, it does discuss some shared services. Uh, the detail, but the details of those services were not voted upon. Um, there was an advisory vote back in April for the village where the village of Essex Junction residents had voted to share police services and had desired to only share police services. And so then in the subsequent conversations with the select board, we had agreed that there should be additional services that we, we share. Okay, great. And on these shared services that would share between the village and the town, there it was only the village that voted. There was no townwide vote on any of this. Correct. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from committee members? All right. Um, Thank you to the Essex trustees and select board members for being with us today on, uh, on what's very short notice. 
Uh, we appreciate you helping us understand um, the extent of the collaboration as the two um, entities work on preparing for uh, what appears to be an upcoming separation. Um, would welcome you to uh, reach out if you have any further thoughts after today and um, the committee will uh, continue working on this uh, with the intention of moving it out uh, as soon as we are comfortable that we've heard from um, the, the various perspectives. So anything else before we sign off for the day? Uh, I may have one question. Uh, apologies. Uh, I believe Andrew touched on something related to justice of the peace, and perhaps this is my lack of not seeing the entirety of the last meeting. Uh, but the select board did have some questions as to current justices of the peace, and as they were elected during a townwide election um, for the town of Essex, um, we do have JPs who reside both within the village and outside the town, uh, the, excuse me, outside the village of Essex uh, within the uh, town proper. Um, we were not sure if simply by the separation or the creation of the city, if those individuals living within the village would automatically become justice of the peace of the village, or if that was uh, something that needed to be re-voted on. Um, it was just a, an open question that we on the select board had um, that impacts you know, uh, the ability to run elections going forward. Um, should separation occur uh, specifically, we're thinking of you know November um, and potentially March of next year. Uh, thank you for raising that. Um, the members from Barry City and Barry Town are the dynamic duo who will be carrying this forward, and so I'm going to invite them to uh, to weigh in if they have a, a thought, but also to follow up with legislative council. It would occur to me that um, upon the completion of separation that any person who lives in the city of Essex Junction would no longer be a resident of the town and therefore would no longer be eligible to serve as justice of the peace. But I believe that your city would need to establish a charter um, or a transitional provision that would call for um, how you would stand up uh, trust uh, JPs within the within the city of Essex Junction, but I'm going to let the members from Barry and Barry City uh, follow up with you on that to give you a a sense of what legislative council says. This is uh, this is a rare occurrence in um, in our state for municipalities to uh, to separate in this way. So it's not something that we. Um, it's not something that we have had a lot of experience with. So I thank you for raising it. Absolutely. Any other questions, folks? I don't think I could have said it any better than you did. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Uh, it is Friday afternoon, and I promise not to keep you all too, too much longer. But there was a request for a little bit more testimony to understand the plans that are in process between the town of Essex and the proposed new city of Essex Junction as the separation charter is in front of us in the form of H-491. So we have with us this afternoon uh, Susan McNamara-Hill, who's town clerk from Essex. Um, Susan, I don't know if you have prepared remarks or if you are making yourself more available for Q&A. Um, I think the committee's testimony so far has been around um, you know, focused in on the charter for the future city of Essex Junction. But if there are any considerations that the town clerk ha can share with us, we would love to hear from you. And we need you to unmute yourself. Okay. So the only thing I want the only thing I want to say is that I am I am the town clerk, but I am also the village clerk for the village of Essex Junction, and I am still employed by the village of Essex Junction. Um, so that was my first uh, position was as village clerk, and I've been, then I was then appointed to the town clerk, and I've been doing both jobs for the last five years. Um, and I don't really have any prepared statements. I'm here to answer any questions that the committee might have. 
Okay, uh, Representative LeClaire has a question. Um, good afternoon, thank you for being here. So um, it, it sounds like it puts you in kind of a unique position there. Um, so would it be appropriate to ask you if this goes through, which way do you go? Um, so I am still a village of Essex Junction employee and under the charter, I believe I would then become a city of Essex Junction employee and I see myself becoming the city clerk um, okay. of the new city. So then that would put the town in a position of having to elect their own town clerk. Is that? Yeah, how? both both clerks are appointed in both um, municipalities. Um, We're in the uh, process right now because our, our, my assistant clerk um, left for another job in December. So we're in the process of interviewing candidates for a, a deputy clerk position that we anticipate would be able to ease into the, or learn the town clerk position and go into that when the time comes that I would be fully just doing city work. So, so you're anticipating that position would sort of transition into the, the towns, I guess the town clerk would be appointed into that right. newly created position. Right. Okay, very good, thank you. You're welcome. Wendy, any other questions for the town clerk of Essex? All right, uh, Representative Vyhovsky, thank you for adding a physical hand as well as your Zoom hand. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for being here, Susan. I have a question, and, and I admit it is a little bit because of my lack of knowledge about the processes around municipal tax collection. Mm -hmm. So in my reading of the city charter, does tax, so currently you do tax collection for the whole town. And does, is that going to travel with you to your position as city clerk? My reading of the charter says that, the, and, and again, I may be reading it wrong, that the city would collect all taxes for the whole town. And that, am I misreading that? Um, yeah, I believe so, because I okay. think it would be split up and the city would be collecting taxes just for the city yeah. um, properties. And then the and town. And so the town clerk would then collect for the exactly. town and the city would pay the town for the shared services. Right. Okay. Thank you. I was trying to like manage through that. Like this doesn't make any sense. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. So thank you for helping me understand that. You're welcome. Any other questions from committee members? Wonderful. Well, thank you for being with us. Um, we also had a request to hear from the police chief because um, I understand that the plan going forward is for the two municipalities to continue to share police services. So Chief, thank you for being with us and uh, please share with us an update on how those um, transitions are going. Sure. So uh, very welcome. Um, so just, a, just the update that I would have is that uh, the two entities have worked out an agreement or a tentative agreement if this was to go through, uh, where uh, as far as law enforcement operations, uh, they would look exactly the same as what they are now and have been. Um, the only difference would be is how the uh, the two entities would pay for the services uh, of the police department that would still remain under the purveyance of the town. Uh, so, uh, you know, going forward, the citizens shouldn't see anything different than, than what they've been seeing. Excellent, thank you. Um, questions from committee members, Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Chief, uh, my reading of the document and the understanding historically is that you are now and will remain an employee of the town. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Other questions from committee members for the Chief of Police? Well, thank you for Zooming to Vermont House Government Operations Committee this afternoon. We're gonna do a little bit of walkthrough on the bill language um, that we'll be taking up again on Tuesday. And it is our hope to vote the bill on its way on Tuesday. So uh, we'll, we have one other question from Representative LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, Chief. Sure. So you're going to be working underneath basically, uh, I guess it's a, a memorandum of understanding, correct? Yes, that is correct. And the anticipated time frame is about 10 years? 
Yes, that would be correct about 10 right. years and it would be a long term uh, self renewing contract unless one of the uh, entities chose to to back out. Okay, and are, are you able to say how much of that document has been flushed out as far as how detailed is it now compared to how detailed it could potentially need to be? Uh, the, the iteration that I last saw was the last draft was pretty well flushed out as far as who would control what, uh, how the how the financial uh, aspects would be laid out. Um, it, it was it's pretty well detailed. I believe that uh, the the town and the village both uh, agreed on that, and and uh, there was there was some discussion, but it wasn't anything you know uh, uh, too extensive. So. As far as I know, the, the draft that I've seen is pretty well flushed out for how it would look. Okay, very good, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Any other questions from committee members? All right, so I welcome committee members to refresh your committee page and on your committee page, you should have um, another draft and Tucker Anderson is with us. And, oh, Representative Yehovsky. I don't have a question. I just wanted to let the committee know that I've actually asked um, the select board chair to submit those various memorandums of understanding to the committee. I know that um, Representative LeClaire has asked a, a, on a couple different occasions for sort of the detailed plans. Um, so I think we should have those in the coming days for people to look over. Great. That'd be helpful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rep. Behovsky. Uh, Tucker Anderson, welcome and thank you for uh, preparing a few um, amendments to the bill as introduced. If you could take us through that and help us understand what has changed. Good afternoon for the record, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. You should have in front of you a proposed amendment to H-491 dated 128-2022. Uh, there are four instances of amendment in the draft in front of you. Each instance of amendment is drawn from committee discussion and policy decisions that you have made over the last few weeks. Starting with the first instance of amendment, this deals with the infamous move out phrase as it used to be in the underlying bill. This would amend subsection D in section 204 of the city charter. It would eliminate the existing subsection in its entirety and instead put in the following language. In the event that a counselor is no longer a resident of the city prior to the expiration of the counselor's term, the counselor's office shall be deemed vacant. The council may appoint a person to fill the vacant office until a successor can be elected at the next annual election. This does two things. First, it replaces the problematic move out phrase with uh, the term no longer a resident, which pairs more closely with the Title 17, that's your election law statutes, uh, definitions of what a resident is and who may run for and hold office uh, and vote in a municipal election. The second sentence refers back to the preceding subsection, which unfortunately is not in front of you in the draft, but it is in the underlying bill, and it echoes the existing process built into the city charter for the appointment of an individual to an empty seat uh, due to resignation uh, or the inability to hold the office. The second instance of amendment starting on line 14 is the technical correction that was found when we did the first walkthrough. It corrects a reference to section 301 subdivision B4 to the correct citation 201 B4. The third instance of amendment eliminates two words in section four that deals with the transition period from 2022 to 2023. Uh, specifically, it eliminates two terms for payment for consolidated services with the town. Uh, the testimony that the committee heard is that these two particular services have already been accounted for in separate memoranda of understanding 
and do not need to be included in the legislature's transitional provisions for these two municipalities. The two services that no longer need to be a part of this transition period are payment for shared administration and payment for finances. Those two services from the testimony you heard are taken care of in an MOU. The final instance of amendment adds a new section 16 to address the issue of former townwide elected justices of the peace. As a municipality that has more than 5,000 residents, the constitutional amount of justices of the peace is 15. And as we briefly touched upon in the initial walkthrough, the constitution requires justices of the peace to be elected at the general election for two year terms, and they must be elected by the town that they are representing. Under current law, there is a procedure in place for the governor to appoint vacant JP positions. So this proposes to add a transitional provision, a new section 16, dealing with the appointment of justices of the peace to serve in the city until the November election can be held. The section states, the governor may appoint up to 15 justices of the peace to serve in the city of Essex Junction pursuant to 17 VSA section 2623. That is the section that permits the governor to appoint uh, vacant JP positions. The committees for the political parties of the justices of the peace of the town of Essex may submit recommendations for qualified justices of the peace to the governor for consideration. This acknowledges that under the existing statutory framework, whenever there is a vacancy, the political party that represented that individual JP who needs to be replaced is allowed to submit a recommendation to the governor for who should be appointed to the position. Section 2623 does not require the governor to accept the recommendation so long as a qualified individual is appointed to the position. Uh, this uh, phrase here recognizes that the existing justices of the peace that are serving the village are townwide officers. So the town of Essex uh, JP political parties would be making the recommendations because they would no longer be serving within the village. The appointed justices of the peace shall serve until successors may be elected at the 2022 general election. At the end of the amendment, we of course have a line that says that the remaining sections need to be renumbered to be numerically correct. Thank you, Tucker. Rep Vihovsky has a question. I'm just trying to make sense of this. So right now the whole town has 15 justices of the peace. Some of them will no longer be eligible for the village. Some of them will no longer be eligible for the town. In all likelihood, will both, both municipalities will end up needing a Appointees, will this help the, the town and the city get the justice of, of the peace that they need? This is going to help the city. The existing statute, 17 BSA 2623, is already going to come into play when the vacant seats in the town come up because if some of those JPs are village residents right now, they will no longer be justices of the peace in the town. So the general law is going to take care of the town. This charter provision is going to allow up to 15 appointments in the city so that they have a full complement of justices of the peace heading into the November election where they will have their first elected justices of the peace as a city. Perfect. Thank you. I was That was convoluted for me. Representative Anthony. Representative Vahosky, as I recall, the um, representative uh, of the village had said that he is the only village resident who is currently a town JP. He is not running for reelection. And I take it from that, that all the remaining JPs are town residents. So that should, as a practical matter, work out. 
thought he was select board. He's on the select, select board, board and not running yes. for re-election. The I, I justices of the pieces are, it, from my recollection of the ballot a couple of years ago, are somewhat evenly, like somewhat evenly split. Okay. And the, the justices of the peace that currently reside in the village that will now be residing in the city, will they have to be appointed for their positions or will they just automatically get to be justices of the peace in the city? The yes. transition will not be automatic. So all 15 positions in the city, because there has been no election for the city itself, all of them will be appointed by the governor. The recommendation from the party committees in the town could be that the current town JPs that are in the village should be the city justices of the peace. But again, the process is going to be up to 15 recommendations coming from the current town justices of the peace and then the governor will appoint up to 15. Okay, thank you. Representative McCarthy. And so any of those folks who are appointed are only going to serve through the next election. So we're talking about just a few months. So they, right. they would only, you know, if there's a, an appeal, a tax appeal, or, you know, they're helping administer the, the general election in November, they've only got that office for a few months before they need to be reelected, right? That is correct. Representative LeClaire. Um, good afternoon, Tucker. Um, so what, what's the timeline with which this all has to happen? In other words, this charter passes and then is the, the, the current boards would have to get together um, and make their recommendations to the governor. Is there a, a, a timeline and statute that has to be adhered to? Because as the rep from St. Albans had indicated, we've got a pretty short window here that we're dealing with. You know? Uh, as a section, 2623 does not have a timeline for when the governor must make the appointments. I will check to see if there's another statute governing a particular deadline. But to my knowledge, at this moment, there is no timeline for the appointments to be made. And you are correct that the window between July 1st, 2022 and the November general election is short. Wow. Representative McCarthy. Am I right in understanding though that so I think the, the immediate concern would be if you need to have like a tax appeal meeting, right? Mm -hmm. That as soon as the charter goes into effect, the new um, five member council that we're setting up for the city, that they would, would be the board of civil authority. They would represent like the, the people who are BCA members. And then once those justices of the peace were appointed, then they would be added on as the BCA, right? <laughs> Correct. So the select board members and the city clerk, I believe, would both transfer over immediately. And then you would have room for the appointed justices of the peace as they come in. Yeah, so there wouldn't be like a, a lack of government for a period. It would just be that there would be the opportunity to add more people to that body right. by the governor. It's not like there wouldn't be anybody to do the, the meetings that would need to happen if you needed to have a tax appeal or something like that. Uh, it, is is and, there any sort of a quorum requirement um, in order for them to conduct business and I'm just trying to think out loud here as far as we've got elections coming along and primaries and things um, that they should have some oversight and involvement in, don't we? I will need to take a look back through the BCA requirements to see what the quorum is for taking action. And I'll also take a look at the uh, Board of Tax Abatement as a separate entity to see what the requirements are there. Rep. I just wanted to make sh clarify, make sure. So the select board's the town, so they would transition out to the town, not into the city. That that's that becomes the city council, correct? I'm just 
it's yeah yes the uh town legislative body stays the same unless uh residents of the village who are going to be a separate municipality now need to vacate their positions because they're no longer residents uh the village trustees under the, these provisions will immediately become the city council with their staggered terms until their successors are elected at a city election in the future. Uh, Representative Gannon. Um, so, and, and Tucker, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I just looked at the Board of Civil Authority statute, which is section 801, and also the um, word for abatement. And I think, um, a majority vote of the members, whether it's just the select board members or the justice of peace is sufficient for them to carry out the okay. business before them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Representative LeClaire and then Anthony. Uh, Tucker, did you get the email I had sent you earlier looking to give you an opportunity to spend some time with Representative Anthony and I? I did, and I did okay. respond. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. I, even, I appreciated the call out as terrific Tucker, so I in turn referred to you <laughs> as uh, Rob of remarkable reputation. So search for that. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> remarkable. Yes. Representative Bihovsky, Um and then I've got sorry, Representative Anthony, right after you. I think Representative Anthony was before me. Okay. Go ahead, Representative Anthony. Thank you. The alliteration is just uh, <laughs> staggering. Um, my recollection is the quorum requirements, and I think you want to confirm this, are different between abatement and um, uh, civil authority. And the problem, I think, is on the abatement side, because the quorum uh, includes the count of the council or legislative body. And so even though it's the majority of those people seated, the quorum requirement essentially may or may not be met in one of the two. Uh, perhaps Rep Gannon is looking, but I vaguely remember the quorum requirements are very different. And um, in the case of civil authority, you could have literally two or three people do business, but that's not true of the Board of Abatement. But again, you'll confirm that, I'm sure. <laughs> Rep. Vyhoski. Wonderful. Yeah. So I have two questions. My first one is, kind of, uh, my understanding of the way this charter reads is that the town will hold all tax delinquencies, including those in the city, and will continue at this time to collect on those. Is that allowed? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not the way I read it. Okay, again, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So if I'm wrong, just tell me I'm wrong. Is it okay if I... Uh, sure. Sorry, I'm sure you are. Um, no. The way that I interpret that, and Tucker, you can confirm how right I am and be gentle if I'm wrong, is that up until this charter passes, then the, t then the town has that authority. But then after it all goes into the city of Essex, so then do this, I'm just, right now the town holds those liabilities and does the city somehow buy, like I'm trying to just figure out how this, how they move from where they are now to where they need to go. So from the point that this charter passes into the future, all existing delinquencies belong to the town of Essex. So the town of Essex will be able to collect on all of them, regardless of whether they're in the territorial limits of the city, right? That's as of July 1st, 2022. From that point forward, you have the tax collection in two separate municipalities. Your earlier question, where things may get a little more confusing, is that the city is going to collect taxes within the city for a period of one year and use the taxes that they're collecting under the currently approved townwide budget to pay obligations that they've agreed to as of the most recent vote with the town. So the easiest way to parse this out 
if there were agreed upon expenses by the town as a whole, by the time the charter is enacted, the city is gonna remain obligated to them and take care of them until July 1st, 2023. And uh, any uh, obligations that are due to the town as of the date of the charter, so going back in time, those will continue to go to the town. So the city will begin collecting on those those delinquencies that are owed to the town as a whole and will pay them to the town. No. So any existing delinquencies will continue to be collected by the town because the, the town is the corporate entity that has those rights. July 1st, 2022 comes, the city exists. From that point forward, the city is going to collect their own taxes on any obligations that are accrued from that point forward. You have, again, the messiness that there's a vote coming up for a town budget that the village is going to participate in. So whatever obligations that the village agrees to as part of the town for that budget is going to be taken care of for the city's portion through that transitional period. Thank you for bearing with me down this murky trail. Okay. Representative Gannon. Uh, oh yeah, um, I was reading the Board of Abatement statute and it, there is an exception to the quorum, which is this quorum requirement need not be met if the town treasurer, a majority of the listers and the majority of the select board are present at the meeting. That's 1533B. <laughs> Bingo. Yeah, 1533B is get, getting us out of our earlier conversation, I think, uh, because then, like I said, if we have the, the new board in place, we don't need to have all the justices of the peace to have an opinion process. Good deal. <laughs> all right. Other questions, large and small, for Tucker <laughs> on the... City of Essex separation bill. All right, so I want to check in with the duo who are going to be reporting this on the floor because um, it occurs to me we could report it as uh, as introduced with a separate amendment or we could um, adopt this uh, amendment language and request that Tucker give us a strike all so that you can report it a little more logically and sequentially. So I would give you the opportunity to tell me whether you would like to present it as introduced and then explain the amendment, or shall we do a, a strike all? Well, you sort of sold me when you said logically and sequentially. <laughs> it makes it a little, <laughs> little easier to fathom how to report this, doesn't it? <laughs> well, because it's already a little illogical and complicated. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. It is complex to stand up a new municipality for sure. Um, so I don't think we need to roll call uh, this amendment because I think we probably are, are pretty much in agreement um, that these are important technical changes. So can I just see a, a thumbs up straw poll on whether we should ask Tucker to make this into a strike all? And uh, Hooper's nodding his head. Thank you. Okay. It is unanimous. So Tucker, thank you in advance for um, putting this all together as a strike call. And it is our hope to vote this out on Tuesday afternoon after we have a, a visit with the chair of the select board who was not able to be with us this week. Uh, welcome. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are um, just finishing up our redistricting hearings for the day, and now we are zooming back to the charter for the City of Essex Junction. And we um, we had a request from folks to please hear from the chair of the Essex Select Board. That is the unified select board that incorporates the town outside the village as well as the village currently. And uh, Andrew Watts, thank you for being with us and would welcome you to, um, to share uh, your thoughts on how the Essex Separation Charter is coming together and any particulars that 
uh, that you believe we should know about the negotiations going on between the village and the town select board? Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me to testify. Um, and my apologies for a couple of things here. One is I'm wearing a mask because I'm in a public place. Um, the other is my availability has been limited in, in the background here. I'm at the UVM hospital uh, up in an upstairs hallway um, dealing with a uh, pretty uh, severe family uh, illness situation. So um, if, if I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm in a quiet place so and I won't be interrupted. But uh, to uh, talk about the uh, separation and where things are going, um, I did watch the testimony from uh, Tuesday and also Friday of last week. Um, and it's my impression that, that uh, Tucker Anderson has a very good grasp of the uh, nuances associated with what's, you know, uh, uh, what the intent of the, uh, the plan is. Uh, there are a couple of things though that I do want to touch on, um, you know, as, as is, is you know, apparent a uh, month from today is town meeting day. The town will be voting on the FY23 budget, which means the, um, which is the entire town, which includes the village. And then if a separation or if the city is formed on July 1st, the uh, stipulation in the charter is that the town would continue to provide the same services that it provides the village today uh, based on that approved town budget. Um, the, um, the, 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 one challenge that I wanted to highlight around that is that there's a, another section of the charter that says that the city will collect taxes and then reimburse the town for the, their, their portion of town taxes or the taxes that, that would have gone to the town. Um, um, and the the uh, the challenge there is it's the same people doing that work because it's a unified department and it's a one of the services that the town has provided to the village uh, uh, up to this point has been tax collection and so the it's a it's a weird nuance that the town employers are going to be required to collect taxes for the city which will then get reimbursed to the town and I'm just and and um, we we really don't have an agreement about how that's going to work. There was the 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 delinquent tax agreement that was forwarded to you. I know you, you were given all of the agreements that we have that completed. One of them is the delinquent tax agreement, which talks about past taxes. There was a section in there at one point that talked about current tax collection um, that was removed because the trustees and the select board would, couldn't come to agreement. The select board's position is we'll, co we'll collect our own taxes. Thank you very much. And the... Uh, the trustees position was that the city would collect the taxes and then reimburse the town. Um, and so um, that's just, you know, that's a, a, a piece where there's not agreement. Um, and because I think it was taken out of the agreement, now it's defaulting to the words that are in the charter, uh, which is um, a, a, a concern I have that, that the town employees are being affected by the um, phrasing or the, 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 the definition of how things are going to happen in a charter for a different municipality. I just, I want to make sure that we don't have things in the city charter that bind uh, action. But, and that's, that's one, one instance that, that was of concern, uh, that is of concern to me. Um, the, the other one that I had brought up was the, the uh, justice of the peace. And I understand that I think that's resolved. I'm, I'm happy with, uh, with what I heard about that, that uh, in, in the very least, the uh, city council would act as the BCA. Um, and so uh, my, my concern was that the town would then be asked to provide uh, election support for the city. Um, if, if um, as was stated in the last meeting that, that the, uh, the, um, the, city council becomes the the BCA, then I think we're, we're all set up, but they can run their election and it won't impact the town. Um, one, one the, 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 the position that the select board is, has been um, espousing is that we don't want to stand in the way of separation. Um, though in the, 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 the second half of that sentence that we've been using is that we will do what we can to limit the impact to the remaining town. 
Um, the agreements that we've been working on uh, for to a large extent were an attempt to you know, mitigate that impact. Uh, the police agreement is a big piece of that. That's, a, that's, you know, on the order of a third of the town's budget. And moving forward, that's going to be about half of it's going to be paid for by the by the new city, which which is a, a mitigating factor. So that, you know, our we're losing, uh, you know, on the order of 42 percent of our uh, property tax base, um, uh, the, the taking half of our largest largest piece of our budget and having it paid for through a contract uh, is, is is very helpful to us. We had been working on a five-year finance agreement um, it's where finance departments would be shared. Um, that unfortunately fell apart when the key individual uh, left the employment of the town for another opportunity. And so that was going to be another big piece that would allow the, the, um, the town to soften the, the tax rate increase that we're going to have to absorb uh, with, with separation, um, assessing, uh, we, we did get that one. That's a very, that's a fairly small, uh, a small piece, but, the, we were, we're happy to get that. Um, I, it, um, we were also working on, but that that's, uh, also fall onto the side with, with, the, the village, uh, intending to contract their, those services out. Um, so, um, with, with what's left, uh, the, the impact to the town is going to be on the order of a 20% tax increase in a single year. So FY24, uh, we'll have to absorb it. We'll either have to cut services or um, absorb a significant tax increase. Now, we do have uh, a fair amount of fund balance at this point um, that we can use to mitigate that. But that's that's only a temporary fix. Eventually, you have to... You have to um, the, the tax rate will, will, will eventually catch up to that. Um, so we'll, we'll, be, we'll be doing that during the transition year. The other thing we'll be doing is is working on efficiencies to see if there are our uh, uh, cost savings we can come up with. Uh, we also maybe do do some um, uh, uh, targeted uh, early retirement offers. Um, so we're we're looking at we're looking at things to try to to mitigate that that twenty percent and bring it down. Um, if it comes to it, yes, at some point we may have to consider cutting some services or, or uh, which unfortunately means people. Um, and so I guess uh, those are our major concerns. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's about where I want to go with that. Uh, I'm th happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Thank you so much for being with us today and um, and thank you for for finding a quiet corner um, amidst your uh, your your family emergency in the hospital. I apologize for um, taking you away from uh, from your focus on that. Uh, committee members, any questions for the Essex Select Board Chair? Representative LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Mr. Watts. Um, <clears throat> I, I've had the uh, the ability to to have some of your um, MOUs and agreements sent. And on one hand, I want to compliment you that it looks like you've done a fair amount of heavy lifting here. On the other hand, you've got a fair amount of heavy lifting left to do, yes. um, with without a doubt. And you know, as you can imagine, we've had several people reaching out to us um, with varying views and opinions of this. Um, and I don't want to speak for the whole board, but uh, you know, it seems like our perspective is more to make sure that this was constitutionally correct. Mm -hmm. And that if there is anything left to be done, we don't want to get too prescriptive here. And it's up to you folks to go through and figure out the nuances that you need to put amongst yourselves. Um, other other than that, I mean, do, do you see more of a role for us to play here? Uh, no, we're not. I'm not definitely not asking you to solve our problems for us. That's that's yeah, um, <laughs> but not, not, not looking for that. Um, um, kind of a decades old challenge, isn't it? It, it? it is. It is. And it's gone in both directions. Right. Sometimes the the 
town would say the village voted against it. Sometimes the village voted against it. Yes, it's been uh, been going on for a very long time. Um, and and uh, you know, prior to the statewide education property tax, taxes were lower in the village than outside the village because the school taxes were uh, were handled differently back in, in uh, at that point. So um, yeah, it's it's gone both ways and. So yeah, um, right. As I said, we don't want to stand in the way, uh, but wanted to make sure. I guess you were aware of our our challenges, and and that others were aware. Sure. Um, just so that I'm clear in my my own mind here is that you you're talking about your the the fiscal year, your transition year there, um, and I I did see the thing about delinquent tax agreement, but. It is my understanding that there is more of this worked out than not as far as the transition year and standing up what you need to stand up from an administrative standpoint for the the tax collection and the administrative side of that. So um, it's 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 all doable. Yes, it's all doable. Um, the uh, the question in my mind though is having to change things two years in a row because we'll have, as I said, it's the same physical employees doing the work, whether it's collecting town taxes or collecting village taxes. And we'd have to come up with a new system to collect, to, to, to do it in such a way that we can have those same people do it and have it be segregated. Then the following year, the city will be collecting its own taxes and it's none of our business, how they do it or, 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 or any of that. Um, yeah. And so, so what I'm what I'm concerned about there is that the the way the charter is written, it requires the town to act in a certain way. Uh, with yeah. regard to how we're collecting those taxes, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't and I don't think that the the town should be bound by the charter terms of a different municipality. Very good, thank you. That's a good flag. Uh, Representative Vyhovsky. That was actually my question, if legally a charter of another municipality can bind a different municipality. Is that something that's even allowed? And I'm hoping Tucker might be hiding behind his name to answer my question. Good afternoon, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, the answer is yes, if that's what the General Assembly is yeah. enacting. If that's the will of the yeah. Assembly, then yes, you can control multiple yeah. municipalities through the act that you're passing. And what yeah. I'll point out is that uh, the provisions that you're talking about are actually not a component of the new City of Essex Junction Charter. They are transitional provisions for the creation of the city and they may impact more than one municipality. Uh, based on the select board chair's testimony, I wanna go back through and make sure that I have everything uh, down pat, so to speak. But it's my understanding that the way that the charter language is written is that uh, any budget that is adopted at this annual meeting will be effective for a fiscal year that runs coincides with the transitional period. And under the terms of the charter language, all uh, tax payments that are due prior to the effective date of the charter, which is July 1st, 2022, will be payable directly to the town of Essex. It is only those uh, tax payments that are applied through a vote of the city that will be collected by the city. If I am incorrect about that formula, uh -huh. I would want to know so that I can go back through the language and make sure that that is correct. So the way I have read it and the way it's been discussed in meetings is the, the city would collect the town taxes for the properties that exist in the city and then pass those funds on to the town for the services that we're providing, the, the consolidated services that were provided during that year. 
so the 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 budget that the village my understanding is that the budget that the village is going to vote on in april only includes the village um tax rate and so what those property with the properties in the village are going to need to pay is both the city and the the town taxes like they always have but it's a question of who's collecting them and how are they getting to the right place and as i said it's the same people doing the work um, so i'm not sure we said the same thing or not <laughs> I, I followed you very well, and I think there might be a de facto difference in how this is going to play out because you're indicating that the employees are the same between the town and the city and how the law here is making a differentiation between the two municipal corporations. Right. Um, and there are also two uh, transitional provisions that are worded slightly differently here. So what the select board chair is pointing to for the committee's reference is in section four, which describes the transition period and the obligations of the city um, with respect to collecting and collecting taxes and distributing um, payments for the consolidated services that will be subject to the MOU. And later on, there is a provision, give me one moment to scan back through here. Later on, there is a provision that relates directly to tax payments that are due to the town. And I'm lost, so I might need some time to track it down and point you all to the language. Let me give you a moment to do that. Um, and I would like to ask Representative Houghton if she might join us in the witness chair. Um, I'm just wondering, Representative, if given that you are um, more aware of what is going on in the village, uh, if you might be able to shed any light on, on this issue. I can try. Thank you, Representative Lori Houghton. So how the taxes are collected today um, in the, so the, the town of Essex, which includes the village, votes on the budget in March at town meeting day. We pay taxes for that budget. The village votes on the budget in April and we collect taxes for that budget. The, the combined town clerk, gets confusing, is a village employee. Um, and will, as I think was, test, was in testimony last week when she was here, will, will be maintained as a village employee after the transition period. So when we vote this coming town meeting and village meeting, those collective taxes will be processed the same way they always have through the tax year of 2023. And then, and then, in March of April of 2023, when we vote our budgets, they will be separate budgets. They will be collected by separate municipalities starting July 1st, 2024. Clear as mud? Well, Representative LeClaire, go ahead. I'm, I'm not convinced that's the way the charter was written, but the... Uh... So, and I wanna be clear, we're talking about the transition plan, mm -hmm. not the charter language. Right, the transition, right. That, that's where my question is. So if I understand it correctly, then the transition year is pretty much status quo. Yes. As far as adopting budgets and taxes and how it's allocated. And then during that transition year is when you are gonna go through and finalize things based on the charter. And then you will have separate budgets and tax collection. Correct, and that is correct. So, and as you stated uh, very well a little while ago, Representative LeClaire, and I think we've all have stated in our testimony, once this charter, if it goes through, 
then the overarching MOU will become effective and all those other agreements under it, although they have been agreed to and voted on by both parties, there is still discussions that will need to happen and details that will need to get ironed out. And, and I think both communities have proven, um, you know, the select board chair and the select board have been great partners through this process of drafting this charter and this transition plan. And I would expect that would continue. Okay. So Tucker, does that give you the time to find the other language you were looking at? And it uh, looks like it's section 14 again under transitional provisions. Yes, it is in section 14 and section 14 dictates that for any property tax payments that are due to the town prior to the effective date of the charter, that the payments and any uh, delinquencies that are accrued shall go directly to the town. And now with a little bit more clarity in the mud, uh, so <laughs> to speak, uh, the timeline will essentially be that a unified budget will be adopted, may be adopted at the annual meeting, and that for any payments that are due this April collection date, and it is an April collection date, is that correct? That's the first payment that's due? Uh, they uh, are, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's March and September. So for anything that is due prior to July 1st, if there is a spring collection date, that payment and any delinquencies that are accrued prior to July 1st go to the town. July 1st, we have a new collection scheme separated between the city and the town where the city will be collecting on the payments that are due and paying for the consolidated services from July 1st, 2022 to July 1st, 2023. And those payments, according to the terms of the charter transition provisions, uh, will be made in installments on or before October 15th and April 15th uh, during the transition period. Representative LeClaire. Okay. Um, so you, you just muddied the water a little bit there for me, Tucker. Um, so then if I understand you correctly, then this transition period really isn't a year that we're talking about something happening as of July 1st, where the allocation of the monies would actually start around then, or the reallocation of the monies. Is that correct? My reading of this is that for that fiscal year, those budgetary decisions will already have been made at the annual meeting in 2022. Really what we're talking about is, uh, two separate municipal corporations collecting the taxes and delinquencies and sending them to the town for the consolidated services in, uh, I guess that's fiscal year 2023, going from July 1, 2022 to July 1, 2023. Right. But what did you say was going to happen differently after July 1st? I think around like the delinquencies that would go to the, to the village. Anything that is accrued until July 1st, 2022 goes directly yeah. to the town. Yeah. So if there are any outstanding delinquencies or any property tax payments that are due prior to the existence of the city on July 1st, all of those payments go to the town. The city is not involved in the collection of those. It's just once the clock starts ticking, midnight, July uh, 1st, 2022, that's when we get into the scheme of um, the city and town collecting taxes and paying for the consolidated services. Can I, can I, can I, Houghton, yes. Thank you. If I can also just add to the mud, hopefully clear it up a little bit. So um, we consolidated our tax collection about six years ago. Um, we used to have two separate tax departments and both collected their own. We had our own tax bills. About six years ago, in the effort to uh, move towards consolidation, we put everything on one tax bill and everything was collected by one tax department. So it will still be those same people who are doing the work through this process until July 1st, 
2023 when the full transition year period is over and we formally separate those divisions. Unless during the transition period, the two boards, you know, move to do something else. Uh, Tucker. I just wanted to note something from a legal perspective here that this scheme is something that is likely necessary for the city and town. And the reason for that is on July 1st, 2022, you're creating an independent new municipal corporation. And to have the town collecting taxes would actually be the application of an extraterritorial for form of taxation. The town would be collecting taxes from another municipality, which is not a scheme that is um, smiled upon by Vermont law. Go ahead, Representative LeClaire. Uh, this is a little off the, the topic here, but yet it's still around this as um, one of the questions that I have is that we're gonna create the city of Essex as opposed to, to being the village of, what's the difference between the two statutorily? And I see you're smiling, so. <laughs> Is that a good question or a bad question? <laughs> it, it's, it's a fantastic, bad <laughs> exactly. It's a fantastic question. Um, <laughs> that, that historically, I, I can't tell you there's a good basis for Vermont's distinctions between oh. what is a city and a town or a city and a village. There is no population basis in Vermont law, nor is there historical precedent for what uh, population a city has to have. There's no basis in population density. Um, okay. However, it appears that uh, villages and just sections of towns that have separated have routinely become cities. So in Vermont, you have cities with populations of more than 40,000 and some with less than four or 5,000. So okay. the answer is there's no good answer. So, and so therefore there's no real difference. They're not treated differently in taxation wise or any other statutorily. No, and you'll find with many of the municipal powers that we discuss ad nauseum together over these many years, that city, town and incorporated village are always bundled together when we run through who can exercise powers. Yep, very good. Thank you, TT. <laughs> Representative Anthony. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to follow up on a, a temptation that uh, my colleague, Representative LeClaire, uh, uh, was tempted to, that is to say, prescriptiveness. I, when we started the conversation today, I got very nervous that uh, we were going to be called on to be more prescriptive, <clears throat> since there seemed to be different interpretations as to uh, what would happen between March of 22, July 1st of 22, and then the transition year, uh, July 2nd, 22 to June 30th, 23. But now I'm getting the sense, and I uh, hope Tucker can confirm this, that there's no need for us to step in, because frankly, there seems now to be general agreement as to what happens in the current fiscal year and the transition year and are the parties pretty well clear on that because we're reporting the bill but we don't have to settle the vaguenesses if they show up later i just want to be sure there are no vaguenesses if we can anticipate and head them off that's all i wanted um and if it requires prescriptiveness i'm okay <laughs> i don't want vagueness because i think that's where trouble comes in so I guess I'm asking Tucker and I'm asking the gentleman from uh, the town, are we all clear what's going to happen the rest of 22 and FY23? Yeah, if the Tucker, answer to that is yes, then there's no reason for us to intervene further. Yeah, Tucker's, Tucker's comment about uh, extraterritorial taxation cleared it up very quickly for me. It's the first I've heard that and thank you for, the, for that. We've We've had that question on the table for uh, quite a long time, and uh, that I think that that absolutely resolves it in my mind. And and um, I think I, I'm 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 all set. Thank you, Representative LeClaire, uh, and then Representative I, I, I I'm I'm clear 
that additional work needs to be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm also quite clear that the additional work that needs to be done needs to be done by these two entities. Cool. Um, so I, I agree with part of what you said that um, I'm, I'm clear in that regard, but I think that there's still some vagueness left as far as some of the uncertainty. Yeah, very well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So in that regard, I, I think where we need where we need to be. Representative LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Mr. Watson. Thank you for being with us. I want to make sure that from your perspective, we have heard from everybody that you feel the town should have, you know, had shared testimony with us. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed that question. Sorry, I wanted to make sure that we have heard from everybody that the town feels should have shared testimony with us. Are you asking me that question? As the representative from the town, okay, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, so you heard from, uh, from uh, Patrick um, Murray, who was a duly elected representative of the town. Um, uh, you've heard from me. I know that there are many who would say that there is no one from the entity, that from the area of town known as the town outside the village. Um, there are those who will say that they've never been represented um, in any of these discussions. Um, I have always countered by saying that um, I've been, I was you know, elected to represent uh, all of the residents of the town, whether they be inside or outside the village. I've also made a point of the fact that I represent the corporate entity that is the town regardless of where its borders exist today or may exist in the future. And so um, I've certainly had my hat on with that, with, with, with that uh, concept in, in mind with, you know, with regard to representing uh, the, the remaining portion of the town, um, knowing that I have that, that obligation to, and I've always, and I've often said that my obligation is first to the corporate entity that is the town and second to those who currently live in it. And so I believe that you have heard from adequate representation and that those of us who are on the select board to, to that were elected to be on the select board and, and, and represent the town um, have had that in mind as well. Thank you. Any remaining questions from committee members? All right, so Tucker, I am going to welcome you now to, uh, to take us on a walk through the bill language and um, committee keeping in mind that we do have some folks from Springfield who are here. Um, it's probably gonna be a bit before we get to them, but I just wanted folks to understand that, that uh, going through this bill language is not the last thing on our, on our agenda today. Uh, we do still need to get back to Springfield, but um, Tucker, we would love to have you walk us through the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you like me to go through uh, the entire walkthrough as we did with the bill as introduced, or would you like me to walk through the strike all amendment and the four instances of amendment that the committee requested uh, be incorporated into the strike all? I think the, the four instances of amendment would be most helpful since we have gone through the, uh, the original bill. All right, well, the four instances of amendment are highlighted in the uh, strike all amendment that I sent along. That is draft 2.1 version two of the committee's amendment to H491. The first instance of amendment appears on page seven, starting on line three. This is an amendment to section 204 of the charter in subsection D. Uh, this was the move out language. In lieu of the language that would have required a counselor to leave their seat when they move out of the city, subsection D now states that in the event that a counselor is no longer a resident of the city, Prior to the expiration of the term, the counselor's office shall be deemed vacant. The council may appoint a person to fill the vacant office until a successor can be elected at the next annual election. As I described last time, 
uh, this last sentence harkens back to uh, earlier provisions in section 204 so that the procedure for a vacancy is the same no matter the uh, basis for the vacancy in that section. The next instance of amendment is a technical correction and it is again highlighted for you all. It appears in section 602 of the bill and it corrects uh, an errant reference to section 301b4 of the bill and you'll find this by the way on page 16 line 6. It corrects that to 201b4. And I can't recall if that was Representative Gannon or Representative Anthony who found that, but good eye for whoever that was in finding the. Hey, John. <laughs> he gets I'll take credit for that. For <laughs> <laughs> I'll take credit. <laughs> oh, boy. You can, you can both share the cookie on that one. <laughs> The next uh, instance of amendment appears in the infamous section four, the transition period uh, in subsection A uh, in the lines that deal with payment for the consolidated services. The committee is removing two of the terms. I highlighted the remaining terms. The uh, amendment is absent here. You're not seeing what you're getting rid of, but uh, you eliminated the term uh, finance um, and administration from the list of consolidated services that the city uh, will pay the town for. The final instance of amendment uh, that we walked through previously, I failed to highlight for you, so my apologies, but that is on page 35. It is the new section 16 dealing with justices of the peace and appointment. To bring you all back again, uh, this states that the governor may appoint up to 15 justices of the peace pursuant to uh, 17 BSA section 2623 that deals with the appointment of certain officers when there is a vacancy. Justices of the peace are governed by that statute and the process there allows the parties at the local level uh, that represent the vacant justice of the peace position to recommend to the governor a replacement. The governor can take that into consideration, but the requirement is really just that uh, the appointed justice of the peace be qualified for the position. The section goes on to say that the committees for the political parties of the justices of the peace of the town of Essex, as it currently exists, may submit recommendations for qualified justices of the peace to the governor for consideration. The appointed, ju the appointed justices of the peace shall serve until successors may be elected at the 2022 general election. Representative Bihovsky has a question. Yes, I have a couple of tax questions that have come to me from through my email that I'm just hoping can get cleared up. So in that taxes, the taxes being paid in, does this charter specify whether the city owes the full amount regardless of delinquencies or is that something to be worked out between the town and the city? So they're gonna vote on a townwide budget. Do they owe their portion of that budget regardless of delinquencies? They will owe for the value of the budget and for the value of the consolidated services. That is the structure here. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn without doing a close examination of the text, but uh, I don't think there is anything in the charter that would prohibit an agreement between the parties for how to break up uh, the 8% penalty for delinquencies. Okay. And then my other question is a larger question. Um, there's been a lot of conversation in parts of Essex about a local option tax. Is there a way for if the city of Essex decides to enact a local option tax and the town does not, but we share a zip code, how would that be allocated, particularly for online sales? So I think that the zip, the online sales are really the only instance where that is going to be an issue. So there are two avenues that 
the city could take for a local option tax. Either the uh, village would have qualified under the current scheme in 24 VSA section 138 between the years of 1997 to 1999 based on a series of financial and budgetary analyses uh, to adopt a local option tax. And I will remind the committee that there were fewer than 50 municipalities at the time that qualified under that statutory scheme in which case the city could adopt a local option tax, again, if they are legally permitted to do so under general law uh, through a vote of the city at an annual or special meeting. That is not very likely. The other avenue is that they would have to amend this new city charter to adopt a local option tax. Um, the tax would only be applied within the city and uh, would only be collected by the city and would be remitted unless the charter specified otherwise according to the general law. And the only confusion there would likely be with online sales, but I am not certain uh, how that could be corrected through state law absent giving the city its own unique zip code. Keeping in mind that this bill will go to the Ways and Means Committee, and I'm sure that they will have the opportunity to do some work on this, but Representative Gannon seems to have uh, found an answer. So um, I went to the local options tax page on the Department of Taxes website and went to the towns that collect the taxes. And the Department of Taxes not only looks at the five digit zip code, but looks at the nine digit zip code. Um, so every town is divided with nine digits. So I believe that the city of Essex Junction and the town of Essex could be divided by those zip codes. Thank you, Representative Gannon, and thank you, Tucker. Any other questions from committee members for, uh, for Tucker or anyone else? Uh, Representative Behovsky. This one's not tax related, so I wanted to wait to see if anyone had a tax related question. But Tucker, one of the questions that I had asked earlier on was your view on um, the whole town voting. And I know that your view was that because it was the city charter that was not required. My question though is on the transition language, given that that does bind the whole town. May I ask a clarifying question? Is this getting back to whether there's any precedent for the town to have a say in what is happening? So I did do some expanded historical research. Um, in Vermont, there's really only one one-to-one -one apples to apples comparison, and it is the city of Winooski. Uh, and that was a village vote. Um, there are two other instances that came close, but are not an apples to apples comparison. And that would be Brattleboro and St. Johnsbury. Both of those were right within the first two decades of the 20th century. And in both instances, the proposed city included territory within the town outside the village. Um, so for example, in St. Johnsbury, the uh, vote was expanded to include the town because uh, a school district was being incorporated into the city that had a large swath of town property in it. And also the town poor farm and the town farm were being included in the city. So the town was given an opportunity to vote because there were properties and residences that were going to join the village and become the city. And the same uh, appears to be the case from section 114 of the act that would have allowed Brattleboro to incorporate a city. There were town property and town interests that were incorporated into what was becoming the new municipal corporation. Having said all that, I will go back to my bailout answer on all of this. The General Assembly can make policy decisions on who should vote on these issues. And you could say that the town should approve or should not have a voice in this. That is something that you can decide as an assembly. You have the power. There is no legal requirement for the town to have a vote. And based on historical research, it appears as though the General Assembly in the past 
when town property is not involved specifically in the creation of the city, has not given the town outside the village the opportunity to vote on the creation of the city. Representative Gannon. Um, so Tucker, if, if the town wanted to in some way take a vote on this, they could have had a special meeting to either approve or condemn that in the months that have um, gone since the um, city of Essex Junction or, or the, the town um, first announced that they were going to separate. Um, but I'm not aware of any vote that's taken place. So, I mean, well, I've received a lot of emails about votes. Um, I have not seen that the, the town has gone forward with any style of voting. Go ahead, Chair Watts. Yeah, so the there was discussion about that. Yes, a lot of discussion about whether uh, a vote should take place. And the, the, the select board's uh, consensus has been that in the past when there's been a a question about this, there was a, well, there was a situation where the, 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 the village voted to separate and then the town went and had a town-wide vote to a different question. That was the, you know, the, the, the village wanted to separate and the town, the village voted to separate and the town voted to merge, right? And so the, the act of calling for a town-wide vote was considered to be an aggressive act or a malicious act, or I, I gotta, I, I'm not sure what the right word is, something that would be done intentionally to try to thwart the separation. And so the consensus of the select board was to not pursue uh, going forward with a town-wide vote to, because we didn't want to give an impression that the select board was taking the position that it, it didn't support or it didn't support this, the separation. We're not, we haven't, we haven't taken a position either way, actually. We haven't voted on a position, um, but our, uh, our, we did sign the, you know, the amicable resolution or resolution of amicable, I forget, I forget what all the words are that were, were in the title of the, the resolution, but we, we agreed to, you know, to uh, move forward with investigating the separation, but we, we chose not to do the vote very intentionally. And, and Tucker, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the voters could petition for a non-binding vote. Could they have not? Yes. Yes, they, yes, they could have. Yep, thank you. Any remaining questions from committee members? All right, I would entertain a motion. Also moved. Were you making a motion that the committee adopt draft 2.1 of H491? I think that's what he was saying, weren't I? I am. Sorry. I believe that's what he said. He's a man of two words. I can't figure out who, who went first. <laughs> I was there myself, but yes. Okay. <clears throat> Any remaining questions about draft 2.1 of H491? <laughs> Representative Leclerc. This will do a drive by through Ways and Means. It will be a full stop in Ways and Means. Okay. Complete with. I'm sure witnesses and hopefully they get the full experience. <laughs> Thank you. It's all yours, Ron. <laughs> I've been there. You're ready for that one. Uh, thank you to the members from Barry City and Barry Town for being willing to uh, shepherd this bill to the floor. It means you'll get the opportunity to uh, sit down with the Ways and Means Committee. All right, any remaining questions before we go ahead and take the vote? All right, Mr. Clerk, take it away. I shall call the roll. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. Leclerc. Yes. Hooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Vyhovsky. Yes. Lefebvre? Yes. Bigley? Yes. McCarthy? Yes. Copeland Hanses? Yes. The bill passes 11 0 0. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair Watts, for being with us today. 
Um, and thank you, Tucker, for your uh, good work on this bill. And I trust that uh, Representatives LeClaire and Anthony will come to see you, Tucker, if they have any questions in preparing their floor reports. We have a bill on the notice calendar for referral to a money committee pursuant to House Rule 35A. House Bill 491 is an act relating to the creation of the City of Essex Junction and adoption of the City Charter, materially affecting the revenue of one or more municipalities. The bill is committed, uh, referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. We are going to start our work on H-491, which is an act relating to the creation of the City of Essex Junction and the adoption of the City Charter. Um, and uh, we are going to start with Representative Hope. Come and join Thank us. You. It's so strange. Uh, yeah. And before we go too far, I want to say hello to uh, Andy Watts and Andrew Brown, both of whom are with us and have testified in other committees. This is not your first committee testifying on Zoom. I assume you must have talked to the government operations committees as well. Yep. Yes, that's correct. Good. Um, before we start, why don't, because we haven't met you, uh, why don't we start by introducing ourselves and then we'll hear from, uh, from Representative Houghton and then we'll, uh, oh, So I'm Janet Ansel. I'm chair of the committee. Um, and I live in Callis and represent Callis Marshfield. Hi, I'm Emily Kornheiser. I represent Brattleboro. Uh, Bill Canfield. I represent Castle and Hubbard and West Haven, Fairhaven. Carol Odie, the far new north end of Burlington. Scott Beck, St. Johnsbury. Chris Maddows, Milton. Scott Brennan, Colchester. Caleb Elder from Starksboro, representing Fort Town of Madison <clears throat> County. George Till from Jericho. Jim Maslin, Thetford. Also Sharon Norwich, Stratford, and Thetford. That's my town. Uh, <laughs> I give them all. I hope so. Uh, David Durfee from Shaftesbury. That was too simple. Sunday Landing Glastonbury. So, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, Representative Houghton, why don't you get us oriented and get us started on the discussion? And then we'll, we'll get, as we learn more, we'll have more questions. Great. Probably. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Representative William Houghton, Essex Junction. So this uh, charter team started in House DevOps and was voted out 11-0 last week, I believe. Um, thank you for your time and taking it up today. So as you know, H-491 is a charter change to establish the city of Essex Junction. And before we take testimony from others, I think it's important for us to review how we've come to this place and why 88% of those who voted, voted for an independent community. As a brief reminder, since 1892, the city of Essex Junction has operated as a municipal unit of government within the town of Essex. Both are chartered municipalities. Our communities have been voting on some form of merger or separation since 1958. In fact, we've had 16 <laughs> votes, three of which have been non-binding. Between 2012 and 2020, we worked closely together, our communities, to consolidate services to save money. That consolidation effort led us in 2018 to um, the Village Trustees and Town Select Board to create a subcommittee to craft a plan for the future of our two communities. This is the plan of merger vote that we will discuss shortly, but which failed. Last year, the Town of Essex was before the House Government Operations Committee with a charter change to establish a three plus three governance model. At the time, the committee decision from GovOps was made to hold further discussions on the government change until the community held the merger vote because it was being planned at that time. In 2021, our communities voted on a merger plan that included this three plus three governance model and a 12 year financial phase in to limit the immediate financial impact to the town outside the village residents if we merged. I want to be clear, the merger plan included the three plus three governance model that was before the government operations committee last year 
which was passed in an earlier vote by the town of Essex. So, so uh, Representative Hogg, I'm going to have to stop you because sure. you've said it now four or five times, and I don't know what a three plus three government is. Okay, so the three plus, so yes, thank you. I, I thought about explaining it. So, so currently the way we operate is we have a village trustee board, five representatives that do the policy and manage the village of Essex Junction. The village is part of the town, so we have a five member select board, which encompasses all of that. So 10,000 people in the village is, is under the trustees, 20,000 of us in the broader community is under the select board. The village trustees, you can only be a village trustee if you live in the village of Essex Junction. You can be a select board member from either community. And so there's always been a concern about who's sitting on the select board. And so the town outside the village voted to pass what was called the three plus three governance charter change, which would be the select board would be required to have six members, three who lived inside the village and three who lived outside the village. The whole community voted on that. The town outside the village passed it. The village did not, but the combined totals, it passed. Got it, thank you. You're welcome, sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so that, um, so the merger plan included that three plus three plus this 12 year financial phase in. So close to 50% of registered voters townwide, all 20,000 of us, participated in the plan and merger vote in March of 2021. The merger failed in the town outside the village by 72% and passed in the village by 81%. The combined passed it by or failed by 19 votes. With swift action by residents throughout the communities, we had a re-vote on April 13th. This time, over 50% of registered voters participated. Again, the merge plan of merger failed with similar, similar percentages in both communities. And again, it failed. I don't have the exact number, but it was not by, by much. With broad community outreach, three plus three governance model, and a 12-year financial phase in, the town of Essex outside the village voters overwhelmingly rejected the plan of merger choice. As part of the revote, village residents so just the 10,000 of us, also voted on a non-binding resolution to have the village trustees draft a charter to establish the city of Essex Junction should the plan of merger fail a second time. That non-binding vote passed overwhelmingly. So here we are. The city of Essex Junction charter vote was held by special village meeting in November, 2021. Again, close to 50% of registered voters participated and the charter passed with 88% of the vote, 3,070 yes to 411 no. Equity in taxation has been a driving factor behind our decades long community discussion and votes. It was clearly stated through public outreach that should merger not pass, separation would mean an increase in municipal taxes to residents in the town outside the village. In fact, at a joint municipal meeting on September 28, 2020, the town finance director at the time said, and I quote, there are inequities in the way government is funded in our current situation. Village taxpayers are paying for services they are not eligible to receive and are paying more for services that they and town outside the village taxpayers have equal access to. This means that town outside the village taxpayers are paying less than the true cost for some of their services. And I'm happy to provide examples later. In May of 2021, the two municipal boards entered into a joint resolution to investigate an amicable separation. As written in the resolution, and I quote, members of the select board and trustees agree to negotiate in good faith throughout the amicable separation process in the spirit of inclusion, all voices will be respected, respectfully heard and considered, end quote. Representative Dolan and I have watched and engaged in the process and believe the trustees and select board worked collaboratively to establish a transition plan that could be as fair as possible to both communities. It is time for our communities who have tried almost every conceivable <clears throat> relationship to have the opportunity to thrive as two separate entities for the betterment of all residents. Brett Dolan and I know that both communities can and will thrive. Thank you. 
see if there's any questions. Um, Sandy, at the moment, I'm sure they're, oh, I am sorry, I do. <laughs> I told you. Uh, so just bear in mind that we're going to hear from our staff, and then we're going to hear from folks from the village. But uh, so if you, if you want to wait until they all until they've spoken, that'd be great. If you want to go ahead, well, go ahead. I, I will Senator ask it now, just because I think sure. go ahead. it's clear out of my own head, and it yep. could probably, be, it's, a, a general, it's a general question that could anybody could answer, but the, just so that I'm sure I understand, right now, the, 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 the proposal here is to change the village to a city, mm -hmm. that a, a village is contained within a town, Yes. A city is separate from a town. Right. So, so what would be happening is you're rather than the kind of merger that's been debated and voted on unsuccessfully over the years. This is a different yeah. approach. Correct. We are. We would be fully separated, and really, it's a city because that's what we need to be statute wise. But um, we have been operating as a municipality for all these years, and not much would change. And, and the question for us here is to it, it's approving. The legislature will have to approve the charter, which effectively makes the village the city. Correct. Those are that, that accomplishes what you're trying to. Correct. Yes. Do. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, where do you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Where does Global Founders lie? Is it in the town? It village? is in the village. Oh, it's in the village. Okay. Yes. Just okay. Uh, Representative Odi. Biggest piece of the old city. Yeah. Wait, um, <laughs> go ahead. I think I got the answer, which is just about everything will stay the same, like sharing services and all that. No, that is not the case. So, oh. and, no. So, and and Andrew and Andy can probably give you more right, information yeah. about this. But the transition plan that's in the document you have outlines what would still be shared and what would not. Good. I'm just going to ask you to run through those the numbers again. Sure. Town and village, not not the votes, but the population. Oh, we have about twenty thousand community wide total. total. So it, it averages about 10,000 in the village, 10,000 in the town. I'm probably off a little bit. I don't, I should know the latest census, but I don't, but it's almost equal separately. Yes. Okay. And can I, I'm sorry, can I just respond to yeah, what Representative asked? Can. So um, yes, Global Foundries has a big piece of property, um, but so does the town of Essex in that they are probably the one count, one town in Chittenden County that has the most available commercial land to develop. Okay. And so there is potential for great growth in the town outside the village. Okay. Okay. I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, geographically, is the town, are they next to each other? Is one inside the other? Is it a donut? It's kind of like Sorry. a donut. Okay. Um, and we are about four and a half square miles. And I think there's six, I don't know how many square miles there, but they're much bigger. It's a lot of rural. They butt up to Westford. Okay, I've driven through it a bunch of times. I just didn't have a sense. Yeah, of it's that, if you've driven through the five corners, yep. that's about what we are. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there's maybe a question for you. As a new member, I, I'm, I'm looking at this 35 page bill and wondering, you know, I'm looking at the sections about taxing. What is this committee really? Is there a way to distill the question before this? Committee? I think we will learn more about what that is as we learn more about the bill. The, the, under the house rules, uh, so it came to us under 35A, um, which is an automatic referral. And under the house rules, any legislation that affects municipal taxes as well as state taxes uh, has to come into the committee, comes in automatically. So um, we'll, we'll look at it. Uh, uh, um, and yeah, so that's what I understand. Fair enough. Yeah. The, 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 yep. Uh, the, uh, there was no effort to bring it in. It, it was okay. an automatic referral. Yes. Yeah. Where does the Champlain Valley Fairgrounds, is that down or village? That's also village. And if I can also just add to the question about taxes, in this regard, when you start looking at it, um, this does not affect school taxes. They are their own municipality. We do not have a TIF and we do not have local option tax in either community. Yeah, I, I was just thinking how difficult it would be if I'm excited yeah. to, to pull that apart. Right. Aren't you glad you don't have yeah, We are. <laughs> That's perfect. We are. Right. Thank you. Do you mind if I stay? I don't mind at all. I'm glad you're here. Um, so uh, uh, on the schedule, we were going to go to Tucker Anderson next, um, and I'm just checking in on people's time. Is that going to be okay in terms of timing for uh, you, Mr. Brown and Mr. Watts? Okay. Yes, thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, Tucker, nice to see you. Um, 
Good afternoon. Nice to see all of you again. I think it's been about a year. Uh, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. You have in front of you H-491, uh, an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction. Uh, the bill has three essential components. The first is the approval of the creation of the city. Uh, the second is the charter of the new city of Essex Junction. And finally, the repeal of the current village of Essex Junction charter. Uh, there are 35 pages in front of you, but fortunately, I think we can move through the first 25 pages rather quickly uh, by describing this as a charter that largely reflects general municipal law. Uh, so through those first 25 pages, you have establishing the corporate existence of the municipality. The existing village is going to become the city. It is going to have all of the general powers that are afforded to any other municipality in the state. There is going to be a city council, which will consist of five members that will be elected to staggered three-year terms. And I'm assuming the city chose that because they are going to transition directly from their current village trustees to the city council members effective July 1st. Uh, they are going to use the city manager form of government, which many other uh, Vermont municipalities use, either a city or a town manager. That town manager will have authority over largely the administration of the municipality. And through the town manager statutes that will be incorporated within this charter, you can think of that position as effectively a chief administrative officer that will oversee the departments and the employees of the city. Uh, for the financial aspects of the bill, you can go to page 22, starting with subchapter 9. And I will quickly note that the city is proposing to have appointed uh, assessor lister positions. That is something that municipalities are permitted to do under general law. As a matter of fact, a municipality can vote to completely eliminate the office of lister and just hire a uh, professional assessor to fill that position. Subchapter eight or subchapter nine describes the budget process that will be used by the city. Briefly touching on section 901, the fiscal year of the city is going to be July 1st to the next July 1st. Uh, the city manager is required to submit to the city council a budget for review every year. This is consistent with what we see in many municipalities and under the general municipal statutes governing uh, town manager position. The budget is required to contain an estimate of the financial condition of the city, itemized statements of appropriations recommended for current expenses and capital improvements. I will note here that there are more specific provisions for capital budgets at the end of the charter in subchapter 11. Uh, the budget must also include an itemized statement of estimated revenues from all sources uh, and a capital budget for not fewer than the next five fiscal years. Section 903 then provides that the city council reviews and approves the recommended budget which would then go to the city vote. Moving ahead to section 905, it provides that an annual, annual budget shall be adopted at the city meeting by the vote of the eligible voters, again, consistent with general law. If after the total budget has been appropriated, the council finds additional appropriations necessary, the appropriations shall be made and reported at the next city meeting as a specific item. The appropriation shall only be made in special circumstances or situations of an emergency nature. And there is, under these terms, no specific explanation uh, necessary for any normal operating expense in any office or department of the city. Uh, under subsection C within this section, the city manager is given authority to at any time transfer unencumbered appropriations, uh, appropriation balances or portions thereof between general classifications of expenditures within an office department or agency. Uh, and the council is authorized by resolution to transfer unencumbered balances. 
Section 906 governs the amount to be raised by taxation. It states that upon the passage of the budget by the voters, that the amounts that are stated within the budget to be raised by taxes shall constitute a determination, the amount of the amount of the levy for purposes of the city in the corresponding tax year, and that the council will levy those taxes. Subchapter 10 governs taxation within the new city. Uh, section 1001 provides that the taxes on real property are paid in two equal installments, one on March 15th and one on September 15th, and that the council shall send notice to taxpayers not less than 30 days prior to the due date for the taxes. The city is choosing in section 1002 to establish a statutory penalty written right into their charter of 8%. It will be added to any tax not paid on or before the dates that are specified in section 1001 of the charter. Section 1003. Uh, this is something that I will point out as the charter being distinct from general law governing municipalities that you are all familiar with. It states that notwithstanding the section 906 of the charter, any other provision of the charter, or the requirements of the general laws of the state that the city council will be authorized and empowered to negotiate and execute assessment and taxation agreements between the city and a taxpayer or group of taxpayers within the city consistent with the applicable requirements of the Vermont constitution. When we walked through this in house government operations, I pointed out that, that clause is put in here because the Vermont constitution does have a proportionality clause that requires proportionality within, uh, for example, ad valorem property taxes. Um, this may be something the committee wants to look into, how this might section might be harmonized with, for example, the general statutes governing tax stabilization agreements and the contracts that uh, towns are permitted to execute, for example, with industrial, commercial, agricultural, or recreational open space properties uh, within the municipality. So, so this is of some interest, and uh, the representative elder has a has a question. Yeah, Tucker, just to clarify, so that it, that section is basically notwithstanding all Vermont statute, and so the only thing it's not notwithstanding is the constitutional requirements. Is that right? And, and that's the clarifying question. The second question is: Is that Typical, do we see that in other charters? Typically the way that it's phrased is notwithstanding any law to the contrary. And then you have a very specific provision that governs some discrete topic. Um, and that formula is not uncommon. Um, it came up quite a bit during uh, COVID, giving municipalities very specific authority to deal with, you know, their municipal budgets during COVID. Um, so no, and it also would not be necessary. So just by having the charter provision be very specific and give the city specific authority to execute these types of agreements, you actually don't have to not withstand the general law. You're already granting very specific authority to the city. You don't have to put in anything in there um, because the more specific provisions of the charter will control over contrary general law. That's a question I have, and the first time I've looked at this is, um, is this granting some authority to negotiate and execute assessment and taxation agreements that would have an impact on the education tax. So uh, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a provision in Title 32 that deals with the type of tax agreements that uh, do have an effect on the education property tax. And I believe those are the tax stabilization agreements and the TIF districts do have an impact on the education property tax. Um, I would have to do some research to see whether there are other agreements that could be executed pursuant to this section that would impact um, the education property tax outside of that general. Well, I mean, so the, the reason I'm asking um, is because it says notwithstanding anything anywhere, 
Um, and so I guess that I was focused a little bit on the, the assessment agreement um, that is, is, does this anticipate that there might be an agreement with the taxpayer to assess their property at half fair market value or something like that, which in my clumsy thinking would affect the education tax. I don't, I don't think you can do that. I don't think, it, I don't think it, I don't think a town by statute, I don't think a town can do that. But this says notwithstanding any other provision yeah. of law anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. I'm saying current laws, I don't think I don't think you could do that, that now. Yeah. Right. I'm just curious whether this is this is whether it's contemplated yeah. here and whether it's opening the door to that. So that would be something we'd I think want to uh, understand better. Yeah. Yeah. I will send the committee a uh, decision from the Vermont Supreme Court from maybe 15 or 20 years ago dealing with a special tax district in Rutland and some of their charter authority around drawing the boundaries of their uh, special taxing district. And the determination from the Vermont Supreme Court at that time gives great guidance on how special charter taxing provisions are harmonized with Vermont's general law. So I'll send that out with a brief blurb about how that could be analyzed and applied here and whether, depending on the policy decisions of the committee, this should be clarified to state that the general law restricting how the education uh, tax is impacted by um, assessment agreements would still apply if that's the way the committee wants to go. Yeah, I think, I, I, speaking just for me, I, th I just wouldn't need to understand what what was mm -hmm. contemplated here and then um and then make sure that that this i don't think there's i don't think they have assessment agreements what they have is um tax rate agreements yeah. for municipalities for the for, for the municipal tax yeah and the municipal yeah. they don't it's still right. the same right. they don't change yeah. the value yeah. laurie do you want to if you want to join us, come and join us. And, um, and so I can just um, add some clarity as can Andrew Brown on this one. So sure. um, the purpose of this was for tax stabilization purposes yep. when people come to us and nothing else. So, you know, we are comfortable if language needs to be changed too. Thank you. That, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. I guess that's why it comes in here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So to answer your question. Yeah. Um, Great. Right. Are there questions that committee members have about the language? Or, yeah, go ahead. I have one. Um, Tucker, I'm at the top of page 26, subchapter 10. I I'm assuming that that this uh, new city is going to be on a July 1st to June 30 budget. Is that correct? That okay. is correct. So is that standard to say, in, I mean, I know that March comes before September because that's where it is on the calendar, but <laughs> September will actually be the first collection. Is, does that, is that how we normally do it or does that kind of create some sort of awkward way of stepping off? I don't know if it's normal. That's, that's, my, that's my response. I can, I can see somebody saying, oh, well, you know, we're starting, so I don't have to pay my, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I'll take a look at the um, general law. There is general authority for municipalities at their town meeting to vote to uh, break up their property tax payments and installments. Yeah. There sure. are set statutory dates. So I'll take a look and see if it's in a different order. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good catch. But, uh, yeah. I've got a, a teeny weeny little question. Um, can you hear me all right? I speak up better, Tucker. Um, I don't know if everybody in the committee got it or not, but I got a correspondence from someone wondering if the town and and city would have to have separate zip codes. Well, and I said, well, it's not our issue. Not but I wonder if anyone else heard that too. Yeah. Yes, it was okay. actually from a former rep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I answer when it's appropriate, but I just want, you know, that question to get ready. It's not our issue. I, I don't know whether they would need separate zip codes, but this question amazingly did come up in a slightly different context than House GovOps. And someone, either a witness or a member of the committee spoke up and said that there's actually uh, subunits of a zip code and there is a different 
four or five number extension for the village and then other portions of the town around the village. Um, and I can look those up and send those out if that is of interest. I'll be a little outside our jurisdiction, but still. Uh, right, um, so did you get through the parts of the uh, proposal that we need to focus on or do you wanna go ahead and continue and then I wanna hear from the other witnesses we have? The last section to quickly move through, those were all the financial provisions of the charter as it will stand in statute. There are a series of transitional provisions that I am certain you will hear about. Uh, so in general, the transitional provisions provide the following. First, that the assets, liabilities, debts, property of the village are gonna become the property of the city because the village is becoming the city. Um, the next few transitional provisions and for your edification starts on page 28 and goes all the way through the end of the bill, establishes a transition period that will start July 1st, 2022 and go through 2023. Within that period, uh, the there will be shared services between the city and the town. The city will pay for those shared services that the town provides through agreements that from what I understand, some of them have already been executed between these two municipal corporations. Uh, any taxes that have been assessed and are owed to the town will be paid to the town. Uh, there is a separate collection process starting July 1st. Anything that's due to the town from city residents will be collected by the city and paid to the town. Um, beyond that, those are essentially the large uh, financial pieces of the bill that I would highlight for the initial walkthrough. Well, I, I maybe you touched on it of noticing the sentence in the middle of section four, where it says the city council sets a tax rate and collects taxes to meet the obligations for the city's share of the town of excess that municipal operation. So that's just through the transition period though, is that right? And it goes on. And this time they have October 15th and April 15th for the two dates. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tucker, and here does it point to what happens um, if during the transition or after the transition there's tax debt that needs to be either collected or um, allocated? So from what I understand, there are going to be agreements for, I'm going to target two different things that you've brought up here. Uh, first, um, the collection of that debt is going to be collected by the separate officers of the municipalities. Where it goes depended on, depends on whether it's a debt that was owed and assessed um, by the town and the unified vote that's happening this town meeting day or whether it's one of these future debts that will be owed based on a budget and tax vote held with the separated municipalities. A question that has come up that is not within the four corners of um, this bill is what happens with the 8% penalty that is applied to delinquencies um, and who will be keeping that 8%? Um, that is something that I assume is going to have to be uh, figured out in some of these MOUs between the two municipalities, unless this committee wants to dive in and amend this to state expressly that if it's a penalty on a debt that is owed to the town, the penalty goes to the town versus separate budgets and separate years, it stays within the separated municipalities. Is, is there language in here, that's probably somewhere, that um, sort of anticipates uh, more agreements and MOUs and what have you as, as this unwinds, um, sort of some general language, or is that just something that is going to happen? You're saying yes, come into it. <laughs> Thank you. you could just stay there. I could just, just stay there. there. Thank yeah. you. So the, and Andrew and Andy could talk about this as well, but, and I can send them to you. There has been an overarching MOU 
agreed to between the two bodies. And then there's, I think, seven agreements under that. One of them gets to the question from our president organizer that will be um, executed upon the city charter taking effect. But there, there's room to have another agreement on yes. whatever it is that nobody ever thought of. Yes, um, absolutely. And so that, that's the, yeah. So yes. As long as that exists somewhere, um, yes. it sounds like it does and I'm, would be. Yeah, yeah obviously, obviously I've done a tremendous amount of work sort of trying to figure this out. Yes. So, um, okay. Uh, so, um, are there any other questions for uh, for Tucker before we move on? Thank you for getting us oriented and here. I really appreciate it. Um, so, I have next Andrew Brown, who's the village president for the village. Um, and welcome to the committee. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Hansel. So um, if you have any comments about anything that we've asked about or that you've heard, or if you have anything general to say, that's great. And if you don't, I'll see if anybody has questions. And um, if not, we'll move on. Yes, thank you. Uh, you all have had a long day as it is. So I will try to keep, uh, I will keep any comments related to questions I've already heard. Um, there was a, a question in regards to the intent of section 1003 about uh, the taxation notwithstanding other laws. Uh, the intent of this is purely for tax stabilization. Uh, we have a few of these agreements already in place, one with the last remaining farm that exists in our municipality, uh, which I assume our, our future board would like to retain. And so tax stabilization agreements for that, that type of purpose, um, we would like to be able to retain if the committee has a, a concern with the language as it currently is, uh, the trustees would be more than happy to to take any amendments you all would pro would all provoke, uh, propose, um, as we certainly would not want that to stand in the way of of creating the city of Essex Junction. There was a. Uh... I, said, I said thank you. That oh. that helps. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, there was a, another question about the delinquent taxes. That is one of our agreements that we have with the town select board. Uh, it is one of the agreements that we have already finalized uh, in which the town of Essex, uh, if there are any delinquencies that are owed by then city residents to the town of Essex, that the town of Essex will be able to collect those delinquencies from city residents. This was uh, what was proposed to us by our staff uh, at the current point at uh, the time that this was proposed, we had one finance director who was serving as finance director for both the town and the village. Many of our financial uh, processes and procedures are well intertwined with each other. And as such, that was uh, said to be the easiest way moving forward for our staff to then implement. So we wanted to, to keep that in place. And if you would like, I would be happy to uh, briefly go over the very high level of uh, all of the agreements that we have in place, if that's useful. Otherwise, I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think, you know, one sentence of each of them, at least we'll, we'll, we'll know what's covered. So I think that'd be great. Thank you. Absolutely. So the town of Essex Police Department, which is a department within the town of Essex, will continue to provide police services for both the town of Essex and the city of Essex Junction. The Town of Essex Assessing Department will continue to provide reappraisal and assessing services for both the Town of Essex and the City of Essex Junction through the completion of the reappraisal process, which is slated to begin within the next couple of years. The Town of Essex will continue to collect any old delinquent taxes from former village properties. Uh, both municipalities will work collaboratively to migrate any and all Essex Junction information technology infrastructure, data, and other resources. Uh, the City of Essex Junction will have the right of first refusal for the current Town of Essex Municipal Offices, which are presently located within Essex Junction, should the, town of, uh, should the Town of Essex wish to sell. Both municipalities will work collaboratively on joint stormwater projects when mutually beneficial. Both municipalities will employ and fund their own finance department. The staff will work collaboratively at the Town of Essex Municipal Offices while financial operations are separated from their current intertwined state. And the last agreed upon uh, agreement that we have is that both municipalities will continue to share the appointed, not elected, clerk slash treasurer, currently a village employee, 
at the town of Essex municipal offices until one year after the city of Essex Junction Charter takes effect. We have other agreements that are in the works. Uh, those relate to recreation programs, the senior center, senior bus, uh, and possibly some shared committees. But that is the extent of the agreement that we have in place as of today. Uh, and of course, there is the, the open-ended, if there are others that we would like to have. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> ambulance, is that what you want to say? Pardon? I didn't hear what you said. Oh, and what about the fire and ambulance? So our, our fire departments, the town of Essex and village of Essex Junction, each have our own independent fire departments. And as far as rescue, that is a separate nonprofit known as Essex Rescue, uh, which does bill uh, to each municipality or would bill to each municipality. Yeah. Andrew, did you, uh, you may have mentioned uh, water sewer. Uh, if you did, I apologize. Did, I, how are they currently supplied to residents of both the village and the non-village? So uh, sewer and wastewater, that is done by the uh, Essex Junction Wastewater Treatment Plant. It is an Essex Junction department, uh, but we have what is called a tri-town agreement where that facility serves the village of Essex Junction, the town of Essex, and the town of Williston. So there's actually three uh, entity, or there's uh, three municipalities that have oversight over um, the wastewater treatment plant, and our our drinking water is through the Champlain Water District. So completely separate from uh, from separation. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so we will move to uh, Mr. Watts, who is the chair of the Essex Select Board. Yep. Hi, I'm Andy Watts. Uh, I just uh, mentioned the town, Essex uh, uh, Town uh, Select Board Chair. Um, uh, I guess the only, we, the only comment I want to make, or the one major comment I want to make, is that the Select Board does not wish to stand in the way of the separation. Um, but we did, we are, um, doing what we can to limit the impact to the remaining one. Um, that, uh, impact, uh, is, you know, due to the fact that, the on the order of approximately 42% of the property space will, um, move to a new municipality. Um, so we're facing, um, in uh, fiscal year 24, a 20% tax increase if we don't uh, cut any any services. Um, so we're we're um, that's that's our challenge. Uh, we recognize that there, the community is is aware of that. Um, we have uh, things that we're we're anticipating to do to address that as we have uh, um, funds that we can use to smooth out that uh, tax rate increase. Um, we also intend to spend the uh, transition year looking for uh, efficiencies that we can uh, use to hopefully moderate the, uh, the increase. Uh, we also may um, offer some targeted early retirements um, to, again, to get our, our, um, our costs down to, to try to mitigate that, that big step function that we're, we're, we're facing. Um, regarding a couple, a couple other, I'm going to re respond to a couple of things that, that came up earlier in the discussion. The, the, um, the zip code question was related to a local option tax, where if, uh, if one of the other municipality chooses to implement a local option tax, there may be some, some concern about segregating, uh, funds, um, and, and making sure that, uh, if, if, um, if both municipalities don't choose to, if one chooses and the other doesn't, that, that those that are in the other municipality don't inadvertently get uh, um, taxed for online sales, for example, where the uh, retailer may not know where, whether a, because we all have, legally, we all have an Essex Junction mailing address because the shared zip code um, it may be difficult for online retailers, whether you're in town or not, or in, or in the city. Um, the other thing is on the tax collection, the the way that we've been collecting taxes, the town has been the tax collector for the entire town. We collect the the, the town taxes, the village taxes, and the school taxes. And um, we do make both the uh, school district and the village whole 
and the, and the town has retained all of the the delinquent taxes to this point. And so the the uh, intent of the agreement is that the um, town will continue to collect on all of those delinquent taxes that have accrued to the point where the new city is formed and starts collecting its own taxes. We would collect those, you know, uh, beyond that date. Uh, regardless of whether the affected property is inside or outside the town. Um, so we just want the, and then once the, we, we didn't specifically say in the agreement, right, who would get the 8% uh, beyond the formation of the city, but I believe that the intent of the agreement is that in those, those uh, October and um, April dates are the dates which the, the city will have to make the town hall for its taxes during that transition year. So my assumption is then that the, uh, the city would get that 8% because then they would hold the delinquent taxes because they're making the, the town hall similar to what the way the, the town had done for the village for the um, past many years. Um, so I think that's, I'm happy to take questions, I guess. Um, you said that there would be a 20% tax increase that's in your municipal rate, is that right? That's the municipal rate, right, because of the 42% the loss of tax base, right? I'm just curious what your municipal rate is currently. Oh, it's something like 55 cents, I think. Four, yeah. Okay. Are you looking at that? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's six, the village, you're yeah. like 34. Uh, so there's a big difference. Yeah. Already. Yeah. Uh, let me see if committee members have questions. I'm just amazed at that this is just such, such a huge piece of work to make all this happen. Um, involved in it. Um, committee, anything? Just a curiosity because I have a whole lot to do with the bill. You mentioned uh, the votes on. Merging. Yes. Who traditionally supports it? Village? No. So uh, it goes back and forth, quite honestly. <laughs> um, but this past time, when we voted twice, uh, the village overwhelmingly supported it, and the town of, outside the village overwhelmingly rejected it. Okay. And, and like eighty-eight percent, eighty percent yes, and the village, and it's like seventy-two percent no in the town. Yeah, prior, prior to the implementation of the statewide education property tax, taxes were lower in the village. Right. They flipped. Yeah. You mean total taxes? Total total taxes, total, if you include total. education taxes. Yes. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 And, and you're due for a reappraisal uh, in addition to everything else that you're dealing with? Yes. That's going to be triggered here very soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is part of our world, but I'm really glad you're doing it, <laughs> not us. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, Caleb started me thinking maybe all of us about the notwithstanding parts of the various statutes that have gone into your into this work. And um, the fact that you're all, I mean, we rely on Ledge Council to do their expertise. And the fact that you gentlemen are both here and seem very calm about how this, I would say, um, um, I rest assured that it's, being done well, you seem to have dug into just about everything. You know, I mean, it's it's not a trifle of matter, but no, I'm impressed. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody has to? Just when you vote for schools for your budgets, when you vote because you're, how will you vote all together? So be, because the the we were we we're in a unified a union school district we previously had and there, there was previously or actually there still is an Essex Junction or an Essex Junction school district has a charter the Essex town school district which is established by statute because of the borders of the town um, we have been voting separately um, I think that we, we, we each well we each sorry we each vote I think we vote together on the budget but we have our own reps on the select on the, uh, the school board on the on the it's a unified union yeah yes westford yep. that's right with westford correct if i may jump in on that one so, yes we do elect our own representatives 
uh, we are then given one budget for the entire uh, Essex Westford School District to vote upon. Thank you. And, and that's not going to change functionally, right? That will not change. That will not change. Yeah. I, I, even polling places, I don't believe polling, polling places will not change either. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. I think the only change would be that there would be a different name of one of the owners of that merged school district. So in, instead of having seats owned by Essex Village, it would be Essex City, but the but the school district will remain the same as just one of its constituent municipalities but have a new name. I think that's the only change. Correct. So I'm a little bit curious why the municipal rates are so different in the village and the town. So the village pays the town tax also. And so on the, on the average, uh, we use $280,000 as a typical as the so-called average household. So uh, a village uh, homeowner of a $280,000 house, I think, Andrew, the last time we looked at this was like $925 or $975 more that a village resident would pay than a town resident because they're paying the, the, the village rate on top of the town rate. And if I may add, basically, before we consolidated the tax collection process, the Village of Essex Junction residents, we received two tax bills, one from the town of Essex and one from the Village of Essex Junction. So the, the difference there is in part that we pay both. Uh, outstanding questions, committee? We will hear a little more about the um, stabilization agreement language. Um, sounds like that might be something that uh, sounds like what you intended would be fine. And we want to make sure the language is consistent with that. Um, and um, I don't know if there were other issues that people uh, wanted to dig into a little bit more. Great. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you. Um, we'll pick this back up when we get some information on the stabilization agreements, which I don't think will take long. Um, thank you for your time. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. Bye -bye. So we have a number of items that we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with H491, which is the best six. Charter. I don't know if that's the official name for it. city charter for Essex. Um, and we've got um, Karen Dolan uh, with us, um, and Anderson is with us with a redraft on one section. I don't know. That's the only issue that I was aware of that the committee was going to address. If other people have issues, I identified them this morning, but I think it's just this one. Um, and then We'll do that, we'll take a break, and then we'll come back to H697, which is the use bill. We have witnesses set up for that. Then after a break, we'll come back to telehealth, and we have um, staff on that one. That's one where we have been sort of trying to get our arms around the fiscal note and figure out sort of what the forwards can look like. So, um, any questions or announcements before we get started? Oh, we have a bill on the floor at three o'clock. So, um, is that right, uh, Pat? We're gonna. Your bill is up on the floor. At three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we all should be out there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, so, uh, Tucker, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us what you redrafted for us to look at? And I assume it's posted. Is that right, Sosha? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. You should have in front of you draft 1.3 of a proposed amendment to H491. To bring you back to the last time you visited this bill, 
Uh, the committee highlighted section 1003 of the proposed city charter as an area of concern. In the underlying bill, section 1003 included a notwithstanding clause that set aside uh, every single state law contrary to the power that was granted in section 1003 and provided uh, the city council with the authority to negotiate and execute assessment and taxation agreements between the city and any taxpayer in the city. Uh, the concern was that the notwithstanding clause would potentially set aside statutes related to the education property tax and uh, could give the city the authority to fix through contract grand list values uh, that would affect the education property tax. In response to these concerns in draft 1.3, the committee's proposed amendment preserves the council's authority uh, with the same underlying language and states that the council is authorized and empowered to negotiate and execute these assessment and taxation agreements between the city and taxpayers consistent with the Vermont constitution, full stop. So the notwithstanding clause has been removed. A new clause is added at the end of the section to state that this section shall not be construed to supersede any provision of state law relating to the education property tax. And to bring you all back to how charters interact with the general law, this is a piece of special authority. So any power that is granted that is more specific than the general law will control. So this new sentence will guide courts uh, and the city in the execution and interpretation of this section uh, to state that it shall not be construed uh, to affect uh, the education property tax. Uh, thank you. Um, questions? Anyone has? No? Uh, Representative Dolan, do you want to join us just for a quick second? <laughs> um, I, I guess the question for you, is this something that you want to check with your officials on before we vote, or are you um, sort of putting you on the spot? But if, if we, should we wait or should we just go ahead? So Representative Dolan, Essex Gumption, and um, so I actually was able to confirm with Representative Tolton as well before this and um, got confirmation that she had been in touch with um, the chair of the village trustees and is on board with this language and i think there's appreciation for providing that clarity that there's no intention to you know go outside of the bounds and appreciate that this committee can you know, just make sure we're in line with everything we did okay so okay. feel very comfortable moving it forward thank you uh sure so i'll go ahead and move this language okay uh so um so we have two votes and uh i'm gonna wait for david to get his book <laughs> um, We'll first vote the language and then we'll vote the bill. Um, and uh, so is there a second to okay. uh, George's motion? Um, yeah, any more discussion? And it's David's ready to call the roll. Okay, so we're voting on, on the language. Draft 1.3? Uh, yeah, it's 1.3. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I will call the roll. Uh, Representative Beck. Yes. Representative Brennan? Yes. Representative Canfield? Yes. Durfee votes yes. Representative Elder? Yes. Representative Maslin? Yep. Representative Meadows? Yes. Representative Odie? Yes. Representative Till? Yes. Representative Kornheiser? Yes. Chair Ansel? Yes. <clears throat> okay, 1100. Excellent. Now, motion on the bill. So moved. George, is there a second? Second. Three seconds. Three seconds. <laughs> really like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, go ahead and call the roll. Okay. Representative Beck? Yes. Representative Brennan? Yes. Representative Canfield? Yes. Griffey votes yes. Representative Elder? Yes. Representative Masland? Yep. Representative Matos? Yes. Representative Odie? Yes. Representative Till? Yes. Representative Kornheiser? Mm -hmm. Yes. Chair Ansel? Yes. 1100. Excellent. 
Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All so Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. And I just, I didn't say it because we didn't have any discussion, but the, these, your town officials have gone through <clears throat> so much work to get to this place. And it's actually good to be able to move something along. So <laughs> just in recognition of how hard this is. It's been, you, many hands have been involved. Exactly. In appreciate having yours in as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, thank, but you. thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are meeting this morning to consider a uh, very small amendment to the City of Essex Junction Charter that the Ways and Means Committee has put forward that we will consider on the floor momentarily. So Representative Matos, if you could explain to us what your committee amendment does. Yep, for the record, um, Representative Chris Matos. And our amendment relates to the assessment and taxation agreement, uh, subsection 1003. And it's really just adding in language um, about the education property tax. As you know, the education fund is near and dear to House Ways and Means. So we just added a sentence at the end to say uh, the section shall not be construed to supersede any provision of state law relating to the education property tax. Um, there's a little ambiguity there in the original language where it just said about the Vermont Constitution. So we just wanted to clarify that with, with our one sentence. We appreciate you being protective of our education fund. Um, any questions for Representative Matos? Representative LeClaire. Um, is there anything currently for the village of Essex? Do they have the authorization to enter into a tax stabilization agreement currently? Do you know, Representative? I, would, I think I would ask you. I think we. Well, I think that might Anthony that question. If they no, if they haven't, uh, if they didn't discuss that specifically in the Ways and Means Committee, I think that's a good question for Tucker. Okay, it, 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 this is very clear what you're doing. I just was trying to anticipate if somebody would ask that question. But, it was not discussed. Okay, in committee, we looked over the whole amendment that government ops right. put forth. I don't know. The vast majority of this is already in statute already. Mm -hmm. So, unless it's in general law, it's not in the uh, right. proposal. Any questions for either Representative Matos or Tucker as legislative counsel? Uh, um, I, Representative Gannon. I think this is probably for Tucker, but um, maybe Representative um, Matos can. Uh, you also took out the not notwithstanding clause out of um, section 1003. So I'm just just wondering, in case we get a question on that, why that was removed. I might refer to Tucker on the, the legal aspect of that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll respond to both of the last two questions. So first to Representative LeClaire. Uh, in the Village of Essex Junction Charter, 24 Appendix Chapter 221, Section 6.16, uh, the village had very similar language to what was introduced in the charter. The village charter stated that notwithstanding a section of the charter and the requirements of the general laws of the state, that the trustees would be authorized and empowered to negotiate and execute assessment and taxation agreements between the village and any taxpayer or taxpayers within the village. So that was very similar, if not almost exactly the same uh, to what was introduced in the city charter. Um, that uh, notwithstanding clause uh, was concerning when uh, House Ways and Means reviewed it. And there was some concern that by notwithstanding all the provisions of general laws of the state, that uh, the General Assembly was effectively setting aside all of the provisions related to assessment for purposes of the education property tax grand list that is submitted by the municipality to the state for purposes of assessing the education property tax. 
So the notwithstanding clause was removed to make sure that there would be no ambiguity as to whether the education property tax was going to be impacted. And it doesn't take away any of the special or specific power that's being granted to the city or that was granted to the village in the past. Because as you may recall, any special power that's granted within a charter already supersedes any contrary provisions that exist in the general law. So the notwithstanding clause was not necessary to provide the specific power. So House Ways and Means took it out. And then to clarify and remove any possibility for ambiguity around the education property tax, that new sentence was added to the end to state, none of the laws of the state related to education property tax are uh, superseded by the provision of this power to the city. Representative Anthony. And just to be clear, Tucker, I think I'm correct about this. If the uh, soon to be city of Essex Junction decided to grant stabilization uh, in respect to the entire tax bill, it's still true that the remainder of taxpayers will have to make up the education tax payment that is not paid under the stabilization agreement. Am I correct about that? I believe that is the formula under the Title 32 provisions related to how uh, certain exemptions to the education property tax grand list are calculated. But again, because of what was inserted by the House Ways and Means Committee, you don't even have to get to those calculations because this is going to say that uh, the education property tan grand list formula is not going to be impacted by um, any of these new agreements with taxpayers. Any additional questions for either the reporter from Ways and Means or Legislative Council? All right, I would entertain a motion. Move it favorable. Representative Anthony moves that we find the Ways and Means Committee amendment favorable. Any other discussion? All right, Representative Colston. I should call the roll. Gannon. Yes. Moricki. Yes. LeClaire. Yes. Hooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Mihoski. Yes. Lefebvre. Yes. Higley. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. We find the, the, the amendment favorable 11 0 0. Now we'll turn to House Bill 491, which is an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. The bill was referred to the Committee on Government Operations, which recommends that the bill be amended as printed in today's House calendar. The member from Barry City, Representative Anthony, will report for the committee materially affecting the revenue of one or more municipalities, the bill was then referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, which also recommends that the bill be amended as printed in today's calendar. The member from Milton, Representative Matos, will report for the committee. Please listen to the second reading of the bill. H-491, an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. Member from Barry City. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The town of Essex includes the village of Essex Junction and has since the chartering of the village. The village and the town have struggled to create a system of equitable shared governance. This goes back a long time measured in generations. In fact, your committee on government operations a score of years ago tried to mediate the disagreements between the village and the town. Uh, that effort came to naught, unfortunately, and moving uh, forward in time to the present, uh, a series of merger talks took place and a shared governance model was constructed uh, by representatives for both the town and the village, often referred to as the three plus three proposal. That proposal was put to a vote just this past March, 
2021. It passed in the village, uh, but alas, failed in the town. There was then a repeat vote in April. Again, consensus could not be found. As of this past summer, or the summer of 21, um, merger negotiations converted into, if you will, separation negotiations. And in November, it was put to the vote to ask the village whether they wanted to separate and create their own municipality called the city of Essex Junction. That vote passed um, by a wide margin, over 50% of the registered voters participated. And into the uh, remainder of the year was a um, attempt by both the administrators of the town and the village to hammer out a way to transition to a separate city of Essex Junction. So the purpose of the bill, H-491, is to create the city of Essex Junction out of the village, obviously pro provide for the transition of the village into its new corporate form of a city. And lastly, of course, repeal the charter of the village. Uh, I will now walk through the bill and its details. The differences between the village and the city are largely organizational, legislative, but not physical. That is to say, all the citizens of the village will be the citizens of the city. The boundaries of the village will be the boundaries of the city. <clears throat> city uh, services which are now shared will for, uh, in some cases, an indefinite period of time remain shared. In the first section of the bill, Section 103, specific powers in addition to those granted under general law are articulated. Obviously, the buying and selling of property, the establishment of public utilities, water, wastewater, roads, um, uh, municipal facilities, parking, public spaces, all provided for. And of course, the newly created city can acquire and dispose of property in fee or a lesser scope. Can provide for electric distribution system, can also provide for telecommunications, not in conflict with the provisions articulated by the Public Utility Commission. The form of government is a manager and council form, very familiar, I think, to most of us in Vermont. The manager is indeed the operational head of all of the delivery of services. However, the governing body is entrusted with, obviously, the exercise of powers, the delegation of authority to the manager, indeed the hiring of the manager and actually in um, unusual circumstances the departure of the manager for cause i might add the council consists of five members um, a quorum is three and any action by the council must include those three there is, of course, a provision if for some reason one of the councillors no longer lives within the newly created city, there's a process of replacement by that council. 
is a president of the council. And in the event the president is not available or incapacitated, provision is made for a vice president to take over. Participation and retention of membership on the council is contingent on participating in at least half of the meetings. Compensation is set in a um, fairly common level of $1,500 per annum. There's a conflict of interest clause, which actually bars former uh, employees from becoming counselors and vice versa for at least one year. And of course, the council is empowered to evaluate the manager, but not empowered to intervene in the administration of the uh, city services to the citizens of the city. Um, the boards and commissions appointments uh, specified um, as responsible and, and accountable to the manager are not if you will, to be interfered with by the council. The council, on the other hand, has the authority to appoint all boards and commissioners aside from those who answer directly to the manager. Meetings must happen at least once per month and meetings must comply with the open meeting law of Vermont. The uh, library located in, presently in the village will become uh, a library under the auspices with the same number of trustees uh, in the newly created city. It's called the Brownell Library and the trustees um, will continue on. And they serve five-year terms. The city clerk, is of course the chief officer of all elections and city meetings. That is an appointed position under the proposal under considerations. Ditto the Board of Civil Authority under general statutes. Of course, any ordinance adoption is subject to the open meeting law and the procedures of uh, adoption. There is one, um, difference from the general law, the effective date for the uh, adoption and enforcement or it, a date of effect of an ordinance is upon passage. That's a departure from general law. There is a petition process for the creation of new ordinances. At least 5% of the registered voters must participate in the, uh, the um, crafting and the um, adoption and submission to the city council of a petition or an ordinance by petition. And the uh, action on such a petition driven ordinance must occur within 60 days. Moving along to the appointment and hiring of the manager, as I had mentioned briefly, uh, sections 601 and 602 provide for the sole, if you will, authority of the council to engage and retain a manager. The uh, powers of the board are in articulated, but also limited in the sense that they may inquire of the manager to produce records, reports, uh, financial statements, uh, but not, if you will, to interfere with the execution of either ordinances or policies of the city. And to the extent to which the council has decided that the manager is no longer satisfactory, that uh, separation between the council and the manager can only occur for cause.
the manager may designate someone in his stead if for some reason uh, he is unable to discharge all of the duties uh, that the council has assigned to him or her. In section um, Two hundred one. Uh, it is articulated, as I mentioned, that the limitation of council uh, expectations of the manager is limited to um, inquiries as to how the city is performing and whether the services that are promised to the citizens of the city are being delivered. The budget, when it's proposed, is a responsibility of the manager and thus is the manager's budget. Audits may be asked or requested by the council and must be done under a, a, by a certified public accountant, but are not mandatory. Um, the clerk, which is also a, an appointed position under this scheme, is responsible for collecting and reporting to the council on all financial matters internal to the city. If the manager is to be um, separated from the city during the time of a pre-existing contract, uh, that process includes a mandatory hearing and a um, that event would be on request and voluntary by the uh, managers to request such a public hearing. And it would be in public, by the way. If the manager's office becomes vacant for some reason, either uh, voluntarily or not so, the manager either may suggest to the council a current employee to take his or her place, uh, or in the absence of that, the council will definitely appoint an interim manager. With that, uh, the architecture, if you will, of the legislative and administrative structure uh, comes to an end and discussions about boards and commissions starts in section 701. And Madam Speaker, my colleague from the rep uh, representative of Barrytown We'll finish the uh, overview of the bill. Thank you. The member from Barry City yields to the member from Barry Town. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and please continue standing. Um, I will be addressing sections 701 through section 17. As the member had said earlier, many of these boards and commissions and other things have been in place for decades. A lot of this is just going to be technical changes, basically going from the village of Essex to the city of Essex. Starting with subsection 701, the Board of Civil Authority that currently exists. Sec subsection 702, Board of Abatement of Taxes that currently exists. Subsection 703, a Planning Commission that currently exists. 704, the Development Review Board, there is a development review board, but they're gonna um, create a new one. Subsection 705, as the member had alluded to, the Brownell Library Trustees currently exists. Subsection, subchapter eight, subsection 801, personnel administrative duties, the manager or the manager's appointee shall be the personnel director. And then it just goes into roles and responsibilities of that position. Again, that exists. Subsection 802, real estate assessor. That's a position that's gonna be shared with the town. They have an MOU that addresses that issue. Subsection 803, appraisal of properties. It just goes on to say that appraisal shall be reviewed periodically and kept up to date. That's already in statute. Subsection 804, appraisal of businesses property for tax purposes. Appraisal of businesses property shall be in accordance with provisions of 32 VSA 316 again, already in place. 805, the purpose of appointing an assessor in lieu of election of listers, basically says they're gonna use an assessor instead of listers. Subsection 901, the fiscal year, 
So it began on July 1st and the end of the last day of June. Again, very common in most municipalities and what happens with this one. Annual municipal budget, subsection 902. With the support of the finance department, the manager submit to the council a budget for review before the annual city meeting. Subsection 903, governing bodies action on the budget. Again, current practice will continue. Subsection 904, the council shall hold at least one public hearing in 30 days prior to the annual meeting to present and explain its proposed budget. Again, current practice just under another name. Subsection 905, appropriation and transfers, basically says that the city council will have the same authorizations as it currently has, and voters can vote on it by Australian ballot. Subsection 906, amount to be raised by taxation upon passage by the budget, by the voters, the amount stated therein as the amount to be raised by taxes constituted determination of the amount of the levy of the taxes in the city. Again, current practice, subsection 1001, taxes on real property, it gives them the authorization to put taxes on property and it should be paid in two installments, the 15th of March and the 15th of September. Section 102, if you pay your taxes late, you're gonna get a penalty. Section 103, assessment taxation agreement, um, there is an amendment that talks about that as far as that the municipality can enter into a tax agreement with a property owner. However, the part of taxes that go to education fund um, will have to stay the same. Subsection 1101 capital programs, preparation of the capital program, the manager shall prepare and submit to the council a capital program at least three months prior to the final date for submission of the budget. Subsection 1201 governing law, basically what this is saying is that any future charter amendments have to go this, through the same process that all other charters have to. 1301, the savings clause, if there is a part of the charter that is found to be problematic, that it does not render the rest of the charter um, inappropriate. 1302, severability, that just does go on to clarify that if they are declared serviceable, that if any part of it is found to be invalid, that it doesn't affect the rest of the charter. Superseding language, the city of Essex Junction shall be formed, notwithstanding the following language, meaning that all the assets of the village of Essex go to the city of Essex Junction and no other municipality can claim them. Transitional provision agreement and assumption of village assets and liabilities, section three, basically the village is, excuse me, the new city of Essex Junction is assuming all the assets and obligations of the village of Essex Junction. Section four is the transition period where for accounting purposes and tax collection purposes, there'll be a year transition period starting July 1st, 2022 and ending July 1st, 2023. These services are all covered through a memorandum of understanding. Section five, transitional provision organizational meeting. The first annual city meeting shall occur on the date set forth by the voters at the most recent village annual meeting. Again, current language as far as what normally would happen. Section six, transitional provision, village center and neighborhood development area designations. What this talks about is the village center district and neighborhood area development as designated in the Essex Junction Land Development Code shall continue with the new city. Section seven, the transitional provision for the governing body. What it says is that everybody who's in place will stay in place and then when their term ends is when you will have new people elected. Section eight, transitional provision for the budget administration. Following the approval of the charter by the legislature, the city manager will propose a budget for the city for the next fiscal year that addresses proper service levels and capital obligations. Section nine speaks to the transitional provision, the separation of city and the towns. The city council shall employ a city manager. The former representative had elaborated on that. Section 10, transitional provision and development on effective date, the former village plan, the former village zoning bylaws and 
land development code and any other village ordinance shall remain in effect until revised by the new city council. Section 11, the transitional provision appointed commissioner and committee members, all current trustees appointed by the commission and committee members shall serve out the remainders of their terms. Section 12, the transitional provision of unified and adopted ordinances. What this is addressing is that they will all stay in effect until amended by the new city council. Section 14, transitional provision of finances. This again is an area that's addressed by a MOU where the city of Essex and the town of Essex will work through uh, that year transition. And then when that year transition is over, um, they will both have stood up their own finance departments. Section 15 addresses, it says within three years after the approval of the charter legislature, the council shall appoint a special commission to study governance considerations. That's basically saying that the city of Essex can go through and set up its, take a look at setting up its own internal political divisions like wards or however they, they need to do that. Section 16, it just repeals the village of Essex and makes it the city of Essex. The vote on this in the village was 3,070 in favor to 411 against. This passed out of our committee 1100. The hardworking and talented government operations committee asks for your support. The question is, the member from Barry, nope. And now recommending for the Committee on Ways and Means, the member from Milton. If members would like to follow along, um, it's page 713 of today's house calendar. We are recommending to strike out subsection 103, which is the assessment and taxation agreement. But our strikeout um, of this section doesn't change the authority of the council to negotiate and execute the assessment of uh, taxation agreements between the city and the taxpayer. Um, we're just strengthening the language around the education and property tax. Um, so we're gonna take away the notwithstanding subsection 906 language and replace that with um, the section shall not be construed to supersede any provision of state law relating to the education property tax. Now, all that does is adds in language so we cannot affect our education fund. Um, we're gonna keep that whole, as everybody knows, that's very near and dear to the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, we're just adding in language to strengthen the subsection 1003. And we heard from Legislative Council, um, co-sponsors of the bill, Village President, of Essex Junction Village, the chair of the Essex Select Board. And on a vote of 11-0-0 out of committee, we ask for your support. Thank you. Member from Barry City. Uh, thank you. Uh, we took up the amendment this morning um, in between during your recess, Madam Speaker. And uh, we found the amendment favorable on a vote of 11 0 0. Now the question is Shall the report of the Committee on Government Operations be amended as recommended by the Committee on Ways and Means? Are you ready for the question? If so, please unmute yourselves for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you have amended the report of the Committee on Government Operations. Now the question is, shall the bill be amended as recommended by the Committee on Government Operations as amended? Are you ready for that question? Member from Essex. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. First, I want to thank our hardworking government operations and ways and means committees for their time and consideration on H-491. Today's vote marks a momentous milestone, moving us one step closer to the creation of the city of Essex Junction. H-491, the bill before us, represents a collaborative and thoughtful path forward in a decades old municipal discussion in the Essex community. It has been an honor to work with the senior member of Essex Junction to shepherd this charter change through the legislative process. As H-491 overwhelmingly holds the voice of our village with 88% of voters supporting its passage. The creation of the city of Essex Junction will allow two communities who have tried almost every conceivable relationship the opportunity to thrive as two separate entities for the betterment of all residents. I hold extreme gratitude to the many hands that contributed in the efforts towards today's vote. It truly takes a village to create a city, and I ask for your support in continuing that work by voting yes on H-491. The question is, shall the bill be amended as recommended by the Committee on Government Operations as amended? Are you ready for the question? If so, please unmute yourselves for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it and you have amended the bill. Now the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Are you ready for that question? If so, please unmute yourselves for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it and third reading is ordered. Up next is House Bill 491, which is an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H-491, an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, please unmute yourselves for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you have passed the bill. H-491, an act relating to the creation of Essex Junction, of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of uh, the city charter, which was introduced on January 7th and uh, read for the first time, referred to the Committee on Government Operations, excuse me, um, shall be read for the first time. H-491. An act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. You've heard the first reading of H-491 and the bill is referred to the Committee on Government Operations. All right, so if you would like to text, kind of give us the context for sure. this and what's happening. And yes, so I um, thank you, Lori Houghton from uh, Essex Junction. So I have a prepared statement because uh, the relationship with Essex Town and Essex Junction is very confusing. It has been ongoing, but please stop me at any time uh, if you have any questions. You could just help me clarify at the beginning. When you say Essex Junction, is that the town? Nope. So the village so of Essex Junction is encompassed by the town. We are like a donut hole where someone took a bite where the river is. And so village of Essex Junction, or when, sorry, I say Essex Junction, is part of the town of Essex. And then I'll explain more. Hopefully it'll become clear, although we have people who live in our community who don't know which community they live in. So it is confusing. Yes, and I've gotten a lot of emails. I'm sure you have, yes, yes. 
So um, Representative Dolan also from uh, Essex Junction will be joining by Zoom, but this is our joint statement. So we appreciate your time today. Um, but as I've said, H-491 is a charter change to establish the city of Essex Junction. And I think it's important for us to review how we've come to this place and why 88% of the voters voted for this charter change. Wow. Since 1892, the village of Essex Junction has operated as a municipal unit of government within the town of Essex. Both are chartered municipalities. And our communities have been voting on some form of merger or separation since 1958. We've held 16 votes, three of which have been non-binding. The recent effort started in 2018 when the trustees and select board created a subcommittee to again craft a plan for the future of our two communities. And this plan of merger vote, which we will discuss shortly, failed. In March 2020, so this is a, I have to take a step back. This is a little bit, um, this is before the merger vote. In March, 2020, the town of Essex, so we all voted, all of us, all 20,000 of us, voted to pass a charter change to establish a new governance model, which would add a six member to the town select board, which governs all of us, and, deter and dictated where those people lived. They wanted three to live in the village of Essex Junction and three to live in the town. Um, this was referred to as the three plus three governance model. House government operations took testimony, but as you may remember, it was the start of the pandemic. And we also were planning on a merger vote. So they held off a decision until the merger vote happened. So fast forward, um, the merger plan that was put before the voters of the town and the village, all 20,000 of us, on March, 2021, included this new governance model that the town of Essex wanted, and a 12-year financial phase-in to limit the financial impact to the town outside the village. So that would be the 10,000 people who live in the town separate from the village. So I want to be clear, it included, merger plan included the governance model they wanted and a 12-year financial phase-in, and they voted it down. Oh, town outside the village voters um, voted no, and in the village, we voted yes. So overall, 50% of registered voters participated in that March 21 vote. And the village passed it by 72%. And the, I'm sorry, the town outside the village rejected it by 72%. And the village passed it by 81%. <laughs> With swift action by the residents throughout the communities, we had a re-vote on April 13th. Oh, this time, over 50% of registered voters participated. And again, the plan of merger failed with similar percentages within each community. So the town outside the village voted no, the village voters voted yes. As part of the re-vote, the village residents only also voted on a non-binding resolution to have the village trustees draft a charter to establish the city of Essex Junction should the plan of merger fail. The city of Essex Junction charter was held by special, so I apologize, that non-body vote passed overwhelmingly. Fast forward, November 2021, the city held a special meeting. Close to 50% of registered voters participated and the charter passed with 88% of the vote, 3,070 to 411. So why have we talked about this for so long? Equity and taxation has been a driving factor behind our decades-long community discussion and votes. It was clearly stated through public outreach that should merge or not pass, separation would mean an immediate increase in municipal taxes to residents in the town outside the village. In fact, at a joint municipal meeting in September 2020, the town finance director at the time said, and I quote, there are inequities in the way government is funded in our current situation. Village taxpayers are paying for services they are not eligible to receive and are paying more for services that they and town outside the village taxpayers have equal access to. This means that town outside the village taxpayers are paying less than the true cost for some services. In May of 2021, the two municipal boards entered into a joint resolution to investigate an amicable separation. As written in the resolution, members of the select board and trustees agreed to negotiate in good faith throughout the process 
In the spirit of inclusion, all voices will be respectively heard and considered. Representative Dolan and I have watched and engaged in the process and believe that the trustees and select board work collaboratively to establish a transition plan that could be as fair as possible for both communities. It is time for our two communities who have tried almost every conceivable relationship to have the opportunity to thrive as two separate entities for the betterment of all residents. Rep Dolan and I know that both communities can and will thrive. Thank you. So I have a basic question. Because I thought we were I thought when it started we were talking about the merger of the two. So that's clearly not what we're talking about. We're trying to separate at this point yeah. because the merger vote in just this past year failed twice. Yeah, I mean, like I followed the debate a little bit, but I guess I missed that part. Yeah, it's sad. It's it's sad, mm -hmm. um, but it's the place we need to go at this point. It, it's um <clears throat> we have a number of towns that find themselves in that long, long standing debate, Essex. Rockingham Bellows Falls has been <clears throat> fighting about this for, well, I've lived here since 72 and they've been fighting about it yeah. since then. Waterbury did the same thing, but the way Waterbury solved it is they dissolved the village. Right, right. So, so they no longer have a village. They well, I'm sitting around the town too. And it's a familiar donut. Right. Um, do your, does the town control water and the sewer and on all those infrastructures or does the village? So um, it's a unique relationship. We have a tri-town water waste facility okay. that's managed between the town of Essex, the village of Essex Junction and Williston. Uh, and we have completely separate municipalities. We've always, the village has always operated, you know, fully functioning with our own manager, finance, human resources, clerk. We did try in an effort back in um, starting, I think, in 16 or 13 to consolidate services. And so you'll see when um, Tucker walks through the bill, there are some things that have to be pulled apart. But for the most part, we function as two fully separate communities. You know, the big thing for us is we pay two tax bills. So we, village residents, pay a tax to support our community, and we pay 42% of the town of Essex taxes. And, and as I stated earlier, we don't receive the services or are paying more for the services that we receive. So by chartering into a city that resolves some of this? We will no longer pay the 42% ah. of the town. They will. <laughs> That's a big one. That's a big one. They will lose that uh, tax huh. base. Yes. Wow. This is a little different than my situation. I think we're, I, I understand there's, you know, communities, villages, and towns, but I do think Essex is unique in the taxation piece of it. And that, and that, I know Waterbury was very different in regards to that. Yeah. And Bill, Rockingham, Bellas Falls is also, okay. it's, it's a different. It's, and then so we have testimony from St. Albans City and Town, another donut shaped yeah. entity. But they had similar problems, like they're not problems, but issues with the water and yeah. that kind of thing. Right. No, we do not have those issues. Okay. Well. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Lori? No. I see Representative Dolan is with us. Yes. Up there. Thank you. Did you have anything you wanted to add? No, this is Representative Karen Dolan. Um, nothing else. I think Representative Houghton covered it. And um, thank you for taking the bill under consideration. May I, may I add one more thing? Please. And I'm sure you, you will probably want to hear from both um, the town of Essex uh, select board chair and village chair, but they have obviously testified and um, the town select board uh, has, the statement has been, they will not step, stand in the way of this separation. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure how they could, but it has happened before. <laughs> <laughs> But there'll be a majority 42%. There'll be a 42%. Yeah. So I'm, I have not ever um, asked. My brother in law lives in, I don't know if he lives in Essex or Essex Junction. <laughs> he lives on Maple. Oh, he's Maple? Maple. Uh, Maplewood. He's well, right out of the five corners. Maple? Yeah. He is in the village. <laughs> so his tax bill would go down. I <laughs> stayed away from asking him because I didn't want to get embroiled in a family fight. Yeah, the high school's in the village, correct? Yeah, the high school's in the village, but it is shared, and that's a really good point. Um, 
We, Essex Westford School District, is now a combined school district with three towns. So that's the town of Essex, the village, and Westford, and it is completely separate. So what we do will not affect anything in the education system. Hmm. And we have no TIF, we have no local option tax. Um, we just support ourselves. So you, you'll save money in terms of not providing the money to, to the town. Correct. I just wondered if people have said to you, oh, watch out, be careful, because you're going to regret this because of what? Like, what's the downside? That you yeah. don't know? I'm not saying you agree with the downside, but. It's, I, I, I would say um, in the past that that question has, has given us pause. And so we've tried other methods, such as collaborating and sharing services. Um, remember that Global Foundries is in the village. and. There is always an option, they will not be in the village. So yes, there is a concern, but at the same time, 42% of our tax base is going to another community and sure. we can put that to us. You could raise your taxes by 40%. We could, right. And, and we've done, um, the village put forth a sample budget before the vote and after the vote. Our taxes with having to hire some new people would go down about 7%. And the town of Essex estimates that their taxes would go up about 20% before factoring any cost savings that they may, have, may be able to take. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I see Representative Anthony, were you the um, uh, reporter of the bill? Reporter of the bill, and I see Representative Matos of Milton. Yes. I, I'm the so, reporter Peter, for Wake Me. Peter, did you have something to add? You have your hand up. I, yes. I thought it important to point out <clears throat> that the leadership of both the village and the town outside the village have crafted, and you'll see this in the latter third of the bill, crafted a, um, uh, a pathway, a roadmap to both disentangle and settle up, so to say, uh, for those services which are mutually provided. I'll uh, use the police as a primary example. Uh, the police are actually uh, employed by the town. They will remain employed by the town, but they will render services to both the town and the village for the meanwhile. And I thought that that was uh, representative of the good faith promise that uh, Representative Houghton alluded to, uh, that both the select board and the trustees realized that while this won't satisfy everybody, uh, the, the, the worst thing that could happen is that this sort of collapses in, in, uh, in some kind of disagreement. So there's a very, very complete, uh, fulsome uh, runway, so to say, between now and roughly a year or a little more, it'd be July, the end of the fiscal year, year in 2023, when uh, the, the sort of more permanent arrangement uh, between the town and the now city of Essex Junction will go on into the indefinite future, unless and until they renegotiate some kind of different arrangement about mutual provision of services. I thought it was remarkable and very mature. Thanks. Thank you. Representative Matos, is that, and I believe you have never been in our committee before, so I'm going to have us introduce ourselves to you. Um, uh, I'm Jeanette White, and I am from Wyndham District. I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Brian Collimore from the Rutland District. And we have Senator Keisha Ron Hinsdale on Zoom with along with you from Chittenden District. Yes, hi, I missed Allison, wasn't there? So I was waiting. Yeah, she isn't here, unfortunately. Sorry about that, Keisha. And then Senator Clarkson um, is off uh, in finance, I think, or someplace. She's from Windsor. So thank you. Would you like to, um, you, I see you were the reporter of an amendment from Ways and Means. Yep. For, for the record, Representative Chris Matos on the Ways and Means Committee. And we had one small amendment. You can find it as passed by the House, page 25. It's going to be subsection 
1.1003. And we just added in language to allow for this section shall not be construed to supersede any provision of state law relating to the education property tax. So before the bill was silent on any sort of education property tax, um, it changes nothing about what the city of Essex Junction can do for assessing and taxation agreements between the city and the taxpayer. It just adds in the language about the education fund to make sure it's clear about any funds that come into the town also have to be remitted in accordance as they are today to the state. Thank you. Yes, I see that where that is. It's on the very bottom of page 25. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you so much. And um, Tucker, do you want to walk us through the bill? So you were in finance. Senator yes. Clarkson is someplace else. Right. Oh. Is that right. even if we have to wear masks? Oh, or not? Yes, I, I darted across the hallway to jump into the room and then got a notification that I'm not allowed in the room. So it took me longer. I had to run to my office to jump on. So you went from the committee room to your office to get a Zoom card to the room? Unknown. All right, good afternoon, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. For the record, again, we're at hour three now. So I, I am yeah. really enjoying my company this afternoon. <laughs> we always enjoy your company. You have in front of you H491, which is the bill that will first create the city of Essex Junction, then enact the city's charter, and finally repeal the existing village of Essex Junction Charter in that order. An important note before I walk through, and I failed to do this in the house, I gave them virtually a line by line walkthrough of the bill, is that many of the provisions that the city of Essex Junction will have in the city charter already exist in the village charter. Uh, and that includes the section that was amended by House Ways and Means. Uh, can can you clarify for me what the difference is between being a village and a city? Because I, I know in Rockingham, which is the one I'm most familiar with, it, they, it is the village of Bellows Falls. They're not a city, it's the village, but they're completely separate. So what, why, and in Rockland it's city, and in St. Albans it's city. So what is the difference? So the answer is that an incorporated village is still within the territorial boundaries and technically within oh, okay. the regulatory authority of the surrounding municipality, not a town. So while you have independent municipalities with different local governments, uh, you still have territorial jurisdiction belonging to the town within the village, right? And additionally, you have, as part of that police authority, taxing authority yeah. that can be applied within the village, which is another one of the big considerations here. So the view from space, if you want to put on your astronaut suit now, is that the transition is going to make this city a wholly independent unit of local government from the town, Okay, completely separated. And they're going to have autonomous territorial jurisdiction within the boundaries of the city and the town will no longer have any of its current authority within those boundaries got it that what i should have known that and thank you you deal with it all the time right you have school districts that have territorial boundaries but you give them very specific authority and the way that the general statutes and the charter of the village uh are designed the village has some independent regulatory authority but it's right. still couched within the town. the town got it okay thank you that answered that and i should have known that well i'm glad you asked because i didn't either mm -hmm. uh within section one i we usually skip past section one of these charter bills because it approves the uh charter provisions adopted by the voters but here there's a significant piece 
uh, to this, which is that the General Assembly creates the city of Essex Junction and approves the adoption of the charter as approved by the voters on November 2nd, 2021. Section two of the bill adds a new chapter four to title 24 appendix and chapter four will contain the city of Essex Junction charter. Within subchapter one, we have general provisions regarding the incorporation of the powers of the city um, in each of the sections here. Effectively, the city is setting out that uh, the general law that applies to municipalities within the state is still being reserved to the city, that the city has expressed powers that are granted within the charter, and that the two will be harmonized. Section 101 states that the corporate existence of the village will be the corporate boundaries and existence of the city. So effectively, we're taking what the village is and turning it into the city. Section 102 is that uh, general powers provision that I just described to you. Section 103 uh, briefly and somewhat generally enumerates the specific powers that are reserved to the city of Essex Junction. And I will note that although these are titled as specific powers, that these are powers that are wielded by every uh, municipality in the state. So in subsection B, you'll note that they're allowed to, for example, acquire real and personal property, uh, that they uh, can uh, have the power to adopt wastewater collection and disposal, solid waste collection and disposal, <clears throat> provision of public water supplies, provision of public parks and recreational facilities, uh, each of these is a general power that is granted to municipalities in statute and that elsewhere in Title 24, there are provisions relating to the use of this authority and power. In subsection C, the city uh, states that it may acquire property in fee simple or any lesser interest. So essentially that it can act as a municipal corporation in the acquisition of real property, uh, that it may exercise uh, any of its powers, perform any of its functions, and may participate in the financing of those functions jointly or in cooperation with any other government entity, that they may establish and maintain an electric power system and regulate power line installations. This is in subsection E, by the way. <clears throat> Provided, however, that the city will not have authority under this charter that conflicts with the authority granted to the PUC. The city is also here uh, granted authority to establish a telecommunication system and an enterprise to deliver internet or broadband services. So subsection E contains those municipal utility provisions. Uh, under subsection or section 104 of the charter, we have the reservation of powers. Um, again, this is another one of those boilerplate provisions that ends up in a lot of charters. And it essentially states that the uh, charter shall not be construed in a way to limit the powers and functions conferred upon the city by general or special enactments currently in law. <coughs> Section 105 uh, describes the form of government for the city. Um, they're going to use the council manager form of city government. They're going to have for their legislative body a city council. <coughs> they also have a city manager that is in charge of the administration of the city. Subchapter 2 contains the sections related to the governance structure of the city. Uh, in section 201, this is labeled the powers and duties of the governing body, but it's the powers and duties of the city council. So in subsection A, the members of the city council shall constitute the legislative body for the city and shall have all powers and authority uh, that's granted to other city legislative bodies or councils under the general law. In subsection B, the city council has the power to first appoint and remove a city manager supervise, create, change, and abolish offices, commissions, and departments, other than those that are specifically enumerated within the charter. To appoint the members of all boards, commissions, committees, or similar bodies, to provide for an independent audit by a CPA, to inquire into the conduct of any officer, to exercise every other power that is not specifically set forth, 
giving myself a note about a technical correction for the summer. In this charter, but that is granted to councils or legislative bodies by the general laws of the state. The city council is going to consist of five members. All members must reside within the boundaries of the city. And the terms will be staggered three year terms. Uh, and there is no transitional provision specifically tied to this because uh, later on it will be noted that the current village trustees will transition to the city council until uh, their terms end and they can be replaced on the current staggered schedule. Section 203 deals with vacancies in the office of a council member. Uh, in the event of a vacancy, the uh, Vacant seat shall be filled by the city council until the next annual meeting. And there are provisions later on to deal with the uh, replacement of vacancy. All right. Section 204, the election of the council members. The terms of the officers commence on the first day of the month following the election. Uh, the council is going to elect its own president, vice president, and clerk by majority vote. Uh, the president presides at the meetings unless the president is absent, in which case the vice president presides at the meetings. Um, in the event of the death, resignation, or incapacity of any member, the remaining members may appoint a person to fill that position until the next election. Incapacity is determined by a council vote. This is in subsection C. Within these specific terms, incapacity shall include the failure by any member of the board to, council, to attend at least 50% of the meetings in any calendar year. At the next annual election, the vacancy can be filled. Uh, in the event that there's disagreement upon the interim replacement, a special election shall be held to fill the open position. Subsection D, in the event that a councillor is no longer a resident of the city prior to the expiration of the councillor's term, the office shall be deemed vacant and can be filled by the council. Section 205, compensation for the council members. Uh, the compensation that is paid to the council members shall be set by the voters at the annual meeting with a minimum $1,500 a year each. The uh, councilor's compensation has to be set forth as a separate item in the annual budget it's voted on. The city council then has authority to fix the compensation of all appointees and the city manager. The council has authority to review, approve, and ratify collective bargaining agreements, which may, may be negotiated or fixed by the manager. So you have a bifurcated process there. Section 206 contains conflict of interest provisions related to the city offices. It states that no city council member shall hold any city employment during the term for which they are elected to the council. A uh, council member may be appointed to represent the city on other boards except as pursuant to the Title 17 provisions related to uh, specific conflicts for local officers. No formal count, former council member shall hold any compensated appointed municipal office or employment except for poll worker until one year after the expiration of their term. Uh, the legislative body, uh, neither the legislative body nor any of its members shall in any manner dictate the appointment or removal of any officer under the authority of the town or city manager. The legislative body may discuss with uh, the manager any of these appointments, uh, the appointment performance and removal of those officers and employees in executive session. Except for purposes of the inquiries that the city council is permitted to carry out according to this charter, the legislative body, i.e. the council, shall deal with municipal officers and employees who are subject to the direction uh, and supervision of the manager solely through the manager. So the manager is going to have the direct oversight and interaction with all of those subordinate officers. And city council here is bound by non interference. 
or as soon as possible after the election uh, of president and vice president by the council at their inaugural meeting, uh, the council shall fix the time and place of its regular meetings, and those meetings are required to be held at least once a month. Uh, under the section 208, special city meetings shall be called according to uh, general law, and all voting shall be by Australian ballot. I was waiting for a reaction. I know, I was too. <laughs> I've given up. I've given up. I hate Australian ballot. Uh, section 209 sets out the short form procedure for the city council meetings. First, the council shall determine its own rules and order of business. Uh, a quorum is three members. Three affirmative votes are necessary to take binding council action. So if there's only three members present, it's got to be unanimous. Uh, in accordance with the open meeting law, the council shall keep minutes and the journalized minutes shall be a public record. Uh, all meetings are open to the public in accordance with Vermont's open meeting law, except for those that are held in executive session, again, according to the OML. Section 210 deals with uh, appointment powers of the council. The council will have the power to appoint the members of all boards, commissions, committees, or similar bodies, uh, unless it's otherwise specifically provided from the charter. And the terms of those appointments commence on the day after the Section 211, a catch-all section for uh, additional provisions related to the city council. City council is uh, not allowed to submit claims for personal services, except when compensation for those services is provided either in this charter or under general law. The council uh, does have authority here to authorize the sale or lease of any real or personal estate that belongs to the city as a corporate entity. Subchapter so three. This is a subchapter dealing with the other elected offices. There are two here, the Brownell Library Trustees and the Moderator. Section 301 states that the Brownell Library Trustees shall be a five-member board elected to five-year terms using the Australian ballot system. Only qualified voters of the city shall be eligible to hold the office of Library Trustee. Uh, the Moderator shall be elected by the voters of the city in annual meeting and that is to preside at the next city annual meeting. Uh, the term of the moderator is one year and only qualified voters in the city shall be eligible to hold that office. Subchapter four deals with city meetings. 401, city meetings and elections. Uh, the voters at the annual meeting vote to set, set the date of the next annual meeting. Um, they also vote at that annual meeting for the budget and elected officers, same as general law. The provisions of state law relating to the qualifications of electors, manner of voting, duties of election officers, and all other particular law related to local elections shall apply to the city, um, except as otherwise provided, and I'll note any exceptions they come up but i didn't have any notes the last time so the general law applies the election of officers um, and voting on all questions at the city meeting is done by australian ballot the city clerk and the board of civil authority uh, shall conduct the elections in accordance with the state's election laws subchapter five this governs uh ordinance authority within the city in section 501, the general law will apply to the adoption of ordinances. Section 502, public hearings related to those, uh, the adoption of those ordinances. Uh, the city council is required to hold a minimum of one public meeting prior to the adoption of the ordinance. Um, at the time and place uh, that the ordinance meeting is warned or at any time and place to which the hearing may from time to time be adjourned, the ordinance shall be introduced and thereafter, all persons who are interested will be given an opportunity to be heard. So the open meeting law will apply to these, this ordinance meeting at least one. After the hearing, the council may finally pass the ordinance with or without amendment. Uh, and the city shall cause the ordinance to be published uh, with a notice of the time and place of the public hearing that must be held. 
um, that publication has to take place three days prior to the public hearing. The council may pass the amended ordinance or again amend it subject to the same procedures. Section 503, this is an exception to the uh, general law here. Every ordinance shall become effective upon passage unless otherwise specified. Uh, under the general law, there is a 60 day lag. So the day that an ordinance is adopted by a legislative body under the general law, uh, 60 days later is when that ordinance becomes effective. And in the interim, there is the opportunity for a petition for rescission or reconsideration by the voters that has to be filed within a 45 day window. That petition opportunity is still available under general law, but in the interim period, the ordinances of the city will be effective until such time as a vote for uh, rescission can be held. All right, section 504, we essentially just covered it. Uh, there's a slight tweak here with how this is written and how it harmonizes with general law. And that's the 44 day window for the filing of the petition. But otherwise, the city is going to operate um, the same as general law for the rescission of the ordinance. Do you know if the 44 days have any special significance? I do not. I do not. It didn't come up in prior testimony. There's an odd number of days. Hmm. It is weeks or months or. There were, the last time a special number like that came up in the context of a petition, if you recall, it was the city of Burlington charter. And the reason was that there is a shorter window when multiple items have to be put on the general election ballot. So the petition for an item has a slightly shorter window in order for them to prepare the ballots for the next general election. Well, we can. Yeah, Section 505 deals with the petition for enactment of an ordinance, and this is somewhat interesting. The voters of the city may at any time petition for the enactment of a proposed lawful ordinance by filing the petition and including the text of the ordinance with the city clerk. Um, the council is then required to call a special city meeting within 60 days after the date of the filing uh, so that the voters can vote on whether they're going to compel the adoption of an ordinance. Hmm. And this is interesting. The city uh, will effectively have a voter petition initiated way to exercise the authority of the legislative body to adopt a regulation. How many mm -hmm. voters need to sign it? Yeah, I was going to ask that. I don't see. Doesn't have a threshold. Two voters could. Let's make sure it's not up in subsection C. There is no threshold uh, percentage. <clears throat> Boy, it seems like the council will be pretty busy. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, I don't know why that. <clears throat> you might want to. Yeah. Uh, under subsection B, the ordinance is reviewed by the city attorney to make sure that there aren't any uh, technical or constitutional issues. And subsection C clarifies that uh, the provisions of this section around the petition for enactment of an ordinance doesn't relate to the appointments of officers or members of commissions or to the governing procedures of the council. I do. Um, would you like me to continue on? What is your, yeah. what time do you have to leave? Four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, you I'm can't leave. You have to <laughs> for a very important day. He's like, he's like, I'm <laughs> trying to say hello, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if you have to leave at four, that it makes sense for us to stop here. Yeah. <clears throat> And then we'll pick it up next time. Yeah. Next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes. So you have in front of you uh, H 491. We'll start on page 14 with subchapter 6 to pick up where we left off last time. And uh, as a brief reminder, based on Senator Clarkson's most recent comment, although this is a charter for a brand new city, 
the majority of the bill that you have in front of you is taken directly from the existing village of Essex Junction Charter. Oh, okay, great. There's quite a bit in here that uh, is currently codified Title 24 app for the village. Subchapter 6 broadly deals with the city manager. Section 601 states that the city council shall appoint the city manager. Section 602 starts to deal with the powers and duties of the manager. Uh, it states generally that the manager will be the chief administrative officer of the city and be responsible to the council for the administration of the city's affairs. Uh, subsection B deals with some of the specific powers of the manager. The manager has the power to appoint and when it is deemed necessary, suspend or remove all city employees, including the treasurer and other employees that are provided by uh, this charter. Uh, those are four cause removals under these terms. Additionally, uh, well, unless a CBA applies to that specific officer or employee collective bargaining agreement, that's an important caveat that they right here. The uh, manager is given authority to authorize any employee underneath the manager's direction and supervision to exercise the same powers with respect to subordinate employees within the particular uh, office within the city. The appointments, layoffs, suspensions, promotions, or removals uh, it needs to be made primarily on the basis of training, experience, fitness, and performance of duties. So essentially a catch-all clause saying these need to comply with employment laws generally. Uh, the manager under subsection C uh, shall direct and supervise the administration of all departments, offices, and agencies of the city unless there's a more specific provision within the charter. The manager uh, recommends the hiring of the city attorney with the council's approval. The member or a staff member designated by the manager shall attend all council meetings and shall have the right to take part in discussion and recommendations, but does not have uh, voting rights. Uh, so an ex officio member of sorts. The council in subsection E is given authority to meet in executive session without the manager for discussion of the manager's performance, or if the manager is subject to uh, the investigation powers that the council is reserved under the terms of the charter. The manager is tasked with seeing that uh, all laws subject to enforcement by the manager or his office um, are faithfully executed and is required to prepare and submit the annual budget and capital program to the city council. The manager is also required to submit to the council a complete report on the finances and administrative activities of the city as of the end of, the end of each fiscal year. The manager has other reporting duties and uh, shall make other reports as the council directs and requires. Manager is tasked under subsection J with keeping the council fully advised on the financial condition and needs of the city and to make recommendations to the council concerning the affairs of the city as the manager deems desirable. The manager is tasked with uh, being responsible for all of the city's ordinances and laws. So this is the chief enforcement officer as well as the chief administrative officer. The manager uh, may, discretionary authority, delegate to subordinate officers and employees any duties that are conferred upon the manager by the charter or by general law. The manager is tasked with performing other duties specified in the charter or as required by the council. In general, as we're moving through all of these, the manager has duties to oversee the operation of city government day-to-day -day operation. The manager fixes the compensation of city employees, recommends uh, the appointment of the city clerk with uh, the council's approval. City council has the authority under section 603 of the charter from page 17 now. Um, the council can remove the manager from office for cause. 
the council is required to adopt by an affirmative majority vote a preliminary resolution that states the reasons for the removal and may suspend the manager from duty for a period up to 45 days. Within three days after the vote, a copy of the resolution is provided to the manager. There should be a folder there. Oh, okay. Okay. We're like too organized. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dale. Yeah. And we're on page seven. Okay. Thank you. So uh, within three days after the vote to remove or suspend, the resolution has to be delivered to the manager. And then within five days after receipt of the resolution, the manager can file with the council a written request for a hearing, which uh, shall be in a public or executive session by choice of the manager. The hearings are held uh, at a special council meeting um, within 15 to 30 days of the manager's request for the hearing. And the manager has authority here to file a written reply to the uh, removal or suspension. Council has authority in subdivision three to adopt a final resolution of removal, which can be made immediately effective uh, by majority vote. All right. Section 604, we're on page 18 now, at least in my unofficial and White House version. Uh, deals with vacancies in the office of the city manager. Uh, the manager has authority under the section to appoint a staff member to perform the manager's duties in the event of absence due to disability, incapacitation, or vacation, unless the manager has previously appointed a staff member as assistant manager or deputy manager. If the manager has failed to make any of those designations, the council can, by resolution, appoint a, uh, an interim manager. We're now on subchapter seven, dealing with boards and commissions. Still well, on page eight. Yes, frequent topic for this committee. These are boards and commissions of the city of Essex Junction. Uh, seven. Section 701 establishes the Board of Civil Authority and ties it to general law. Section 702 establishes the Board of Payment of Taxes. Again, uh, echoes general law. Section 703 establishes the Planning Commission, uh, the powers, duties, and obligations of which are in accordance with general law. So you just potentially uh, approved an amendment that would impact this. Um, members of the Planning Commission are not permitted to hold any other city office, an important component of Section 703. And the City Council is given authority in the Charter to set the terms of the Planning Commission members. Um, an important note, because we just went over it, is that uh, if the City has elected Planning Commissions, that this would override the general law statutory authority for the voters to vote on and set the terms of elected commission members. All right. Is it common? To. Is it common to say hold no other office? Like they can't be a justice of the peace. They can't they, they can't do anything else. It depends on uh, the particular municipality that we're working with, but I would say that Many municipal charters do have their own conflict of interest policies that prohibit um, officers from holding more than one office. Uh, this charter, we went over one of them, uh, does have other prohibitions, conflict of interest policies, specific to uh, city council members that we already went over. So there's a few different prohibitions built into the city's charter. Section 704 deals with the DRB, the Development Review Board. It establishes the DRB and ties it to the general law. Uh, members of the DRB will be appointed by the council for three year terms. Section 705 deals with the Brownell Library Trustees. Um, the Brownell Library Board of Trustees that hold office at the time this charter is enacted shall serve until their terms are completed. So this is being codified, but that's almost like a transitional provision there. 
any existing policies that are in place uh, for the trustees will continue after the effective date of the charter. The five permanent self-perpetuating trustees shall function in accordance with the terms of the trust agreement dated May 25th, 1925. Uh, the trustee shall have the authority to establish new policies for the operation of the library or replace any existing policy um, in place. The library, notwithstanding any of the foregoing, is required to follow financial and personnel policies that are established by the city council. So chapter eight, the administrative departments of the city. Section 801 deals with personnel administration and benefits. Uh, the manager or an appointee acts as the personnel director. It's on page 20, by the way. <coughs> the manager uh, maintains personnel rules and regulations. Those rules and regulations must be approved by the council and shall include the procedure for amending those rules and regulations. Each employee uh, is required to receive a copy of the rules and regulations upon hire. The rules and regulations uh, may deal with the following subjects related to personnel administration, job classification, jobs to be filled, tenure, retirement, pensions, leave of absence, vacations, holidays, group insurance, salary plans, um, your general enumerated and exhaustive list of employment related and HR related uh, provisions. Subsection C, no person in the service of the city shall either directly or indirectly uh, give, render, pay, or receive any service or other valuable thing on account of or in connection with any appointment, proposed appointment, promotion, or proposed promotion. That's our whole conflict of interest section. I'm going to summarize that. Most of it, but we'll briefly do that. Section 802, the real state assessor, very similar to the assessor statutes. There shall be either a real estate assessor who is a certified real estate appraiser or an independent appraisal firm headed by a certified real estate appraiser, appointed by the manager that shall carry out the duties of the assessor and function in the same way uh, as assessors under general law. Uh, the real estate assessor is uh, tasked with establishing the grand list of the city and following the general law that applies there too. Under Section 803, appraisals uh, shall be reviewed periodically and kept up to date. Um, this provision would be overlapped and overlaid by the Title 32 provisions that, when triggered, would require reappraisal. Appraisal of business property for tax purposes, the appraisal of business personal property shall be in accordance with general law provided that all business personal property acquired by a taxpayer after September 30th, 1995 shall be exempt from tax. Um, most of these business personal property taxes that are in charters have been slowly repealed over the last five to 10 years, um, including the Springfield Charter that was on the Senate floor today. They have repealed their personal tax, which is personal property tax, which expired in 2001. Section 805, um, explain some of the purpose of appointing that real estate assessor. The purpose of appointing an assessor is in lieu of the election of listers. So what this section is setting up is that Wait, if any general law were to apply to require the election of listers, that the city is instead going to have this um, city assessor in lieu of the listers. I'm sorry, could you business property, for, you know, appraisal business property, is that what you used to call the inventory tax? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I don't understand why it says that it shall be dealt with by these provisions, but um, 
Oh, so anything that was there before 1995 does have a prop, uh, tax on it. Yes, or could have the tax applied to it. Oh, okay. I don't know from uh, previous discussions of city operations or current village operations if there is any inventory tax being applied. Okay. But under this legal mechanism, anything acquired before that date in 1995 would be subject to the tax, and the procedures would be those that are in general law. We did away with ours because we were told that on March 31st, this go farmer had all his cows over here in a different town because it was right on the border. And then on April 1st, he moved them back to Putney mm -hmm. because on because he would have been taxed on because he would have been taxed on them. Right. They were so. I mean, that was one of the reasons, but we just we did away with it. All right. September 9 deals with the city's budget process. Section 901 states that the fiscal year starts and ends on the first day of July. That's similar to most other municipalities in the state, with very few exceptions. Section 902, the annual municipal budget. Uh, the manager submits to the council a budget for review before the annual city meeting. And that budget contains an estimate of the financial condition of the city, an itemized statement of appropriations recommended for current expenses and capital improvements during the next fiscal year, an itemized statement of estimated revenues from all sources other than taxation for the next fiscal year, and comparative figures of tax and other sources of revenue for the current and immediately preceding uh, tax years. A capital budget for not fewer than the next five fiscal years showing anticipated expenditures and any other information that the council requires as a component of that budget report. The city council then reviews and approves the recommended budget under section 903. Uh, they can make changes. The budget is published not later than two weeks after its preliminary adoption by the council and then the council shall fix the time and place for a public hearing on the budget, and they'll give notice of that hearing, which moves immediately into section 904, dealing with the warning for the budget meeting. The council holds at least one public hearing at least 30 days prior to the annual meeting to present and explain the proposed budget. The manager, not less than 30 days prior to the annual meeting, uh, makes available the city council's recommended budget and the final warning of the pending annual meeting. The annual city report shall be made available to the legal voters of the city not later than 10 days prior to the annual meeting. Section 905, appropriations and transfers. Uh, an annual budget shall be adopted by the city, by the city at the city meeting by the vote of the uh, majority of eligible voters. They vote by Australian ballot in accordance with section 401. If after the total budget has been appropriated, the city council finds additional appropriations are necessary, the appropriations shall be made and reported at the next city meeting as a specific item. The appropriations shall only be made in special circumstances or situations of an emergency nature. However, no specific explanation needs to be given for any normal annual operating expense in any office um, or agency that may be increased over the budget by an amount not more than 10% of the office's or agency's budget. From the effective due of the budget, as approved by voters, the amounts that are stated therein become appropriated to the various agencies of city government. The manager may at any time transfer unencumbered appropriation balances or portions thereof between general classifications of expenditures. At the request of the manager, the council may, by resolution, transfer uh, any of those unencumbered appropriation balances within the council budget from one department, office, or agency into another. And again, to bring this all together, uh, charters are harmonized with general law. So for example, the 
repeal, the recent repeal that uh, you included in S-181 of the prohibition on the commingling of town highway right. funds would come right. into play here. So within the city, the city manager would be able to commingle. Co yeah. All right. Not Tom, Tom, I'm going to ask you to wait. We're, our maximum here is eight. Oh, I do apologize. I'll uh, pop back in again. That's okay. Minutes, so sorry. I know. I, I didn't <laughs> count the amount of people in here. <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't. Um, I should put the site on the outside of this. I can do that. Uh, notwithstanding what we just walked through with the ability to move on the covered balances around, no unexpended balance in any appropriation that is not included in the council budget shall be transferred or used for any other purpose. All right. Section 906 states that uh, upon the passage of the budget, the amounts that are stated therein uh, shall be raised by taxes uh, in the city in the corresponding tax year, and that those taxes will be levied on the grant list. So same as operation under general law. Subchapter 10 deals with taxation. Section 1001, taxes on real property shall be paid in equal installments on March 15th and September 15th. Uh, notice is required to be sent to the taxpayers not less than 30 days prior to when the taxes are due. Section 1002, city uh, is going to add an additional charge of 8% to any tax not paid on or before the date specified in the preceding section. Um, as you may recall from some of the work during COVID uh, in some of the emergency powers, uh, the interest that is applied to unpaid taxes is not automatic and it's usually uh, based on a municipal vote to apply a certain percentage, 8% is the maximum amount that is applied under the general. Yes. It doesn't say who will uh, be responsible for collecting that. They're not, is there a tax collector here somewhere? Uh, there is nothing specific within the charter, so that would fall to either the collector of delinquent taxes or the treasurer, depending on the system that the current village and future city has in place. It is likely a collector of delinquent taxes unless that office has been eliminated. Yeah. The treasurer tends to these days do all that. Uh, we'll also, there is, there are some temporary provisions that will be in place for the city that we'll get to at the end of the bill about the collection of taxes mm -hmm. and how that's gonna carry out in the near future um, as the town and city separate. Section 1003. This section uh, was amended by the House Ways and Means Commitment to add a clause. Sorry, may I just, while we're on section uh, 1002 on the penalty, does this not give the manager or the select board any opportunity uh, to negotiate? 8% because it says shall. Yeah. 8%, that's what they wanted. Okay. And so I- No interest in allowing any- Okay. I, I can put together a summary because what this is doing is saying specifically for the city that the 8% interest rate is in place. Yes. The general law fills in all the gaps around, for example, how an abatement might play out okay. for an individual right. taxpayer. And I can send you a summary of how that works. Okay, uh, as long as there's some provision for that, that's great. Well, there would be for an abatement, but not for reducing the 8%. That's right. just different. Yeah, the rate it, is equally applied. Right, it's it's pretty tough and there are extenuating. Well, I yeah. I, I don't think we, yeah, that's, that's fine, they can deal with it. We've had that fight in here for the 20 years I've been here. <laughs> um, so section 1003 authorizes the city council uh, to negotiate and execute assessment and taxation agreements between the city and the taxpayer or a group of taxpayers. These are the tax stabilization agreements that are uh, generally authorized under uh, general law. 
Uh, there are specific types of properties that are subject to uh, these agreements under general law. Here, the city has authority to uh, negotiate and execute these assessment and taxation agreements with any taxpayer in the city. Um, this next component was added by House Ways and Means. It says that this section shall not be construed to supersede any provision of state law related to the education property tax. Subchapter 11, Capital Improvements, Section 1101 deals with the capital programs in the city. The manager is tasked with preparing the capital program at least three days before the final submission of the budget. The capital program has to include a clear general summary of the program's contents, a list of all capital improvements that are proposed to be undertaken for the next five fiscal years, cost estimates, methods of financing, and recommended time schedules for each improvement, the estimated annual cost of operating and maintaining the facilities that will be constructed or acquired. Uh, and finally, under subsection C, the information that's required by the section can be revised and extended each year with regard to the capital improvements that are still pending. Subchapter 12, uh, amendment of the charter and initiatives. The char this charter may be amended in accordance with general law. That's all in subchapter 12. Subchapter 13, <laughs> general provisions. Uh, I'm quickly moving through the first two, savings clause and separability. These are boilerplate provisions that we see in a lot of charters, uh, essentially saying that if one section of the charter is found to be invalid, it doesn't invalidate uh, the remaining sections. Section 1,303. This has superseding language. Uh, it states that the city shall be form, formed notwithstanding language that is contained in the town of Essex charter. So the following language specifically, that notwithstanding the provisions of any other municipal charters, territory within the corporate limits of the town shall not be annexed to or become a part of any other municipal corporation, except by the annexation procedures as set forth and the statutes of the state of Vermont. This refers to the annexation procedures for incorporated villages. So essentially what the town of Essex Charter says is that no incorporated villages can extend their boundaries or take new territory unless they follow the general law procedures for annexing territory. And here the city is including this in the charter to ensure that the General Assembly is saying that that town charter provision is not going to be construed to prohibit the formation of the city. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. We get into next uh, the transitional provisions that will govern the uh, the period immediately following the formation of the city in July and the formal separation of the two municipalities. Section three governs the assignment uh, and assumption of village assets and liabilities. It states that all assets and obligation that formerly belonged to the village will pass to the city. And that includes all interests. So all real property easements, rights, rights and interests in land, vehicles, equipment, other personal property, cash, insurance policies, documents and records, debts, claims, bonded indebtedness. Um, all contracts, agreements, trusts, and other binding written documents obligating the village shall remain in effect. And what's happening here is this section is setting out that all of the legal duties and responsibilities that the village had with their financial or other relationships will pass to this new corporate entity that's being formed. And these are included within these sort of handshakes when you have a corporation becoming something new to make sure that creditors don't lose out because they can no longer hold the extinguished corporation uh, liable to death. Section four uh, sets out the transition period. It establishes a transition pe period that will begin on July 1st, 2022 and it will end on July 1st, 2023. During that transition period, 
the city shall continue to receive and pay for consolidated services with the town for assessing the clerk treasurer position, IT, police, public works, and stormwater. So those are the enumerated services that will continue to be shared and paid for. The city council shall set a tax rate and collect taxes to meet the obligations for the city's share of the town municipal operations and all of the city municipal operations throughout the transition period uh, according to the budgets that are approved by the voters of the town and the village the previous March and April. The taxes that are collected by the city for the town shall be paid to the town in equal installments on October 15th and April 15th. And then this states that at the end of the transition period, the city shall be fully organized. I don't know if that's aspirational or not. <laughs> I think it's probably very manageable given one is morphing into the other. What were the dates of the, the new? Payments about oh, March and September. Okay. All right. A month ahead of these two days. Mm -hmm. Section five contains a transitional provision for the organizational meeting of the city. The first annual city meeting shall occur on the date set by the voters of the most recent village annual meeting. Uh, following approval of the charter. This will be a meeting of the city of Essex Junction and will be noticed and warned to all residents of the city. And it will be for the purposes of presenting and discussing the budget only. Other city business may also be presented and discussed, but not voted on at that initial meeting. After presentation and discussion of the budget and any other business, the meeting will adjourn. Um, voting on the budget and the election of counselors will be by Australian ballot. Section six, transitional provision related to the village center and neighborhood development area designations. So those village center district and neighborhood development area designations as contained within the current Essex Junction Land Development Code shall continue uh, in the new city for the purposes of continuing downtown revitalization efforts. Uh, and the City shall retain any and all state designations for purposes of redevelopment in force at the time of adoption. So this is the handshake for these designation areas between the village and the city. Section seven deals with the transitional provision for the governing body of this corporate entity. When the charter becomes effective and the city is established, uh, following approval by the legislature, the members of the village board of trustees will become the members of the city council and continue to serve uh, out their elected terms. The president, vice president, and clerk of the council will continue to serve in those capacities until the board reorganizes, uh, as we covered earlier in the bill, where they'll elect their own president. Um, the councilors shall warn and hold meetings as appropriate. And shall address all details and issues related to the transition from the village to the city. City Council shall review, consider, and adopt all regulations, ordinances, and plans for the former village as its own. So that's the regulatory handshake. The City Council, with the assistance of the manager, shall propose and warn the first annual budget of the new city for consideration by the voters at its first annual meeting. Section eight contains the transitional provision for budget administration. City manager uh, is tasked with proposing the budget for the new city for the next fiscal year that addresses proper service levels, contractual obligations, capital projects, debt, and that reflects any changes related to the corporation of the city. Section nine, separation of the city and town departments. No more co-mingling of city and town departments. The city council is going to employ a city manager, and the manager shall plan and hire for the separation of all consolidated departments within the town by the end of the transition period. Unless contracts are signed, stating otherwise. And 
I think there may be some factual information to give to you all about those contracts that are going to stay in place. Section 10 deals with planning and development. So when the charter becomes effective, the former village plan, bylaws and land development code and any ordinances that are related to planning and development will related, remain in effect until amended or revised by the new city council. Um, the village planning commission and village zoning board of adjustment will become the planning commission and development review board of the city. All current trustee appointed uh, commission and committee members shall serve out the remainder of their terms through this transition. Section 12, the unification and adoption of ordinances, bylaws, and rules. All ordinances and bylaws of the village shall become ordinances and bylaws of the city. The city is fully authorized to amend or repeal any ordinance according to the provisions of subject or five of the charter dealing with uh, ordinances. Whenever power is granted by any ordinance or bylaw to an officer or officers of the village, it will carry over to those same uh, officer or officers in the city. Section 13, personnel. All employees of the village shall become employees of the city, and any and all contracts of the village will be assumed by the city unless otherwise terminated, re-executed, or renegotiated. Uh, personnel policies will carry from the village to the city as well. The dates of hire uh, with the village will be used as the dates of hire for purposes of benefits and benefit calculations for the city. Section 14 deals with the transition of finances. The city shall adopt any and all portions of the town of Essex grant list for properties located within the borders of the city. Any and all property tax payments due and delinquencies incurred for the village prior to the effective date of the charter shall be paid to the town. Upon the effective date of the charter, any city taxes due and delinquencies incurred shall be payable to the city. So that July 1st, 2022 effective date is the delineation between taxes that will be due to the town, that will be collected and remitted to the town, and then taxes that will be collected and remitted to the city. All existing contractual agreements, including those tax stabilization agreements uh, that we covered 10 minutes or so ago, um, within the village shall hereby be assigned to the city. Section 15, the Future Governance Commission. Within three years after the effective date of the charter, the council is going to appoint a special commission to study governance considerations including the form of government, the election of officials at large, or through wards, governing body composition, terms of office, term limits, and counselor compensation. Section 16. Uh, this is a component that was added in the House to deal with the very particular position of justices of the peace. We have the governor appointing them? That is how it operates under general law. You're kidding. No. I thought they were elected. Well, they are elected by the municipality that they serve, and that's a component of the Vermont Constitution. And whenever there's an absence under general law, and it's cited there, 17 BSA 2623, the governor appoints the replacement, and the parties at the local level uh, make recommendations for who the governor should appoint to that open JP position. So here, it states expressly that the governor may appoint up to 15 justices of the peace to serve in the city. Because, of course, this city is a new municipal corporation, will not have had a general election to elect a justice of the peace, or justices of the peace, excuse me. So uh, the governor will appoint up to 15 pursuant to the procedures established in Title 17. The committees for the political parties of the JPs in the town 
may submit recommendations for qualified justices of the peace to the governor for consideration. So that's a component of the general law. And because the city does not have any currently elected JPs for that municipal corporation, uh, this is going to override that general law procedure and say, well, the committees for the JPs in the town will be the ones that will make the recommendation because all of those justices of the peace in the town formerly served for the village as well. The appointed justices of the peace shall serve until successors may be elected at the 2022 general election. And that is a four month term potentially if the governor acts very quickly on the effective date of this charter. Section 17 repeals the village charter. Section 18 sets the effective date of this act as July 1st, 2022. Very exciting. Two. Right? Karen, um, if I can share one update that has come up. I appreciate the timing that you've had of this meeting because as was heard, there's the transition plans for a lot of the different things between the um, village in the town and they just had a meeting last night for both municipalities the boards met and both unanimously passed um the agreements of how those things are going to transition pending attorney review so oh, good. that that is positive as well great yeah. good good any questions or concerns i have a thought i mean it's a question i guess it seems like the transitional things I mean, I understand why they're in there, but the charter is going to go on forever, and these transitional things are still going to be in there. It just seems like they take up space. The transitional provisions are not codified. Okay. They are section they're law that are dealing with the transitional period for the next year. So they'll disappear? Well, they won't not disappear. Either. They'll be kept in the 2022 Acts and Resolves, which uh, are kept in each attorney's office and the Office of Legislative Council. So or published by the Secretary of State and are likely mostly used by Michael Chernick in historical research. <laughs> so I will say that we've had a couple um, emails or I have from a couple people who live in the town and are very upset that this is happening and that they didn't have the ability to weigh, to vote on this. but. This isn't a town issue. This is the village seceding from right. the from the town. And uh, if Vermont decided to secede from the union, I think that we would vote on it. But we would let Massachusetts and Connecticut vote on that mm. for us. So I think that's the that's a good comparison. It is a good analogy. I didn't thought of that. This issue uh, did come up in the house. And I did a great deal of historical research around what has happened when other new municipalities have formed from a separation between municipal governments. And the way that this has shaken out is that when the new municipality does not contain any real property from the surrounding municipality, then there's no vote in the surrounding municipality. And the most recent example is the city of Winooski. The village of Winooski voted to separate and the town of Colchester was not given a, the opportunity to vote on the separation. It was just the village itself. Uh, there is a similar situation for the formation of the city of Burlington because uh, the town of Burlington at the time as it was constituted and there was a very small piece that ended up becoming South Burlington, uh, voted in its entirety without taking up any of those outside pieces to become the city. In other instances, and these are all recent proposals that failed, uh, the town of St. Johnsbury was allowed to vote on the formation of the city of St. Johnsbury because it included the village, but also two incorporated school districts that were within the town. Um, that is not the case here. 
where the village within its current corporate boundaries voted to become a city without taking or incorporating anything outside of the village boundaries. And again, the consideration is, were the voters of that municipal entity given an opportunity to vote on becoming this new corporate entity? And in the case of Winooski and this present case, the answer would be yes, because the bounds are all within the village. Well, that answers that. So um, does anybody have any questions or concerns or are we ready to? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We mentioned departments that would be still shared, if that's the right verb. Can I just get a sense of what those might be? Hi, okay. Yes, but you may want to hear from the representatives from Essex because I believe they have the most recent updated list. And again, those will be subject to an agreement executed between the two municipalities, which I believe is what Representative Dolan just Thank brought you. up. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Dolan, next exception. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the piece that I was um sharing before that there's an mou that is being worked on between the village and the town and that's what was passed unanimously by both municipalities last mm -hmm. night pending you know attorney review just checking that all the i's and t's are crossed um, and some of the services that are in that are there's a delinquent tax um, agreement there's the um, information technology agreement police services assessor services stormwater clerk so they have it all set out of how in each of those areas is it going to move from you know we're working together to separating or how are we going to work together during this transition period do you know if the fire and ems are already separated yes fire is okay i'm just trying to think other departments that would be shared highway. now that might not be highway but may I, may, I, inter may yeah. I interject? I'm sorry, this is Representative Houghton. Um, so just a couple quick, and I, I just noticed because I was a trustee. So fire has always been separate. Village has their own, the town has their own. EMS is a third party. Um, police has been shared since 1980, and there is an agreement um, going forward for another 10 years of sharing. Highway has always been separated. We tried to do, or we did do a consolidation, um, but we will be separating those back out and they will remain separate. The departments have always, although they've worked together, they've always been separate departments. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Any more questions or concerns? I'm ready to vote. Oh, all right. I'm ready to vote. So this is just a, a visual question. Essex Junction, which is gonna become Essex City, is that sort of what I think it was the five corners area? Yeah. I just want to get a sense well, of what Yes, and about. there's more to it than five corners, <laughs> but yes, like that's what I know it is. Like it is a yes. And is that where um, local boundaries is? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's that area of it. It's more important is, right. is it where the train station is because it's because of the train, it's called the junction. Exactly. Yes, all of those things are true. And <laughs> the train station is right there too? Yeah. So, and, and remind us the population of the city. Uh, I'm gonna have to ask um, my, my senior rep, I wanna say it's 11,000 something. Yeah, it's about 11,000. It is pretty even between the town and the village. They both have close to 11,000. It'll become one of, the, it's one of the biggest cities in the state. Yeah, yeah. next to Burlington, aren't you number two? I believe so. Yeah, I think so. South Burlington. Like With this divide, South Burlington. Yeah. Well, this divides Essex. Yeah, and this doesn't. No, I mean this town becomes Essex City, the city of Essex, and the town of Essex. Yeah. Okay, I will move that we vote out H four ninety one with no amendments favorably. I just want to celebrate all the hard work. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, community. Yeah. Uh, no, I have, oh, sorry, I missed some of this, but it's been a long time coming, and. We're happy to be another milestone on this journey to getting this through the legislature. You're here. Exciting. So, oh, okay, should I do for all you who want to send in their Yeah, what are we going to do to celebrate? Maybe I need some champagne first. No, I think, uh, yes. I think we need to just the answer is yes. so we can get on to our next <laughs> issue because we're already 10 minutes late. Okay, was that a yes? 
Yeah, That's I right. said okay. the case. Colin Mark. Yes. Senator Polina. Yes. Myself, Senator Ron still. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Five zero zero. Thank you all so much. We'll invite you to the celebration. We'll have a celebration. <laughs> We're, ready. We're ready. We have the, the forks and the plates. Okay. Thank you. Very, appreciate it very much. Well, thank you. Thank you guys. Lots of hard work and too many votes. <laughs> yeah. We now have for action. H491, an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. It was reported favorably by the Committee on Government Operations. Uh, please listen to the second reading of the bill. H491, an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. For the Committee on Government Operations, the Senator from Chittenden is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, it is not every day that we vote to create a new city in the Senate. Um, and it is a, a historic vote in a 110 year journey for the relationship between Essex Junction and Essex Town. And we do have uh, members of both uh, the municipal government of the community, as well as members from uh, the other chamber from the house here to witness. And I want to recognize that. And I also uh, wanna note that I will borrow heavily from their perspective and their words. Uh, we gave this due consideration in your Senate Government Operations Committee, but also relied deeply on the expertise and longer testimony uh, in the House and the bill before you was not amended by your Committee on Government Operations. H-491 is a charter change to establish the city of Essex Junction. It is important for us to review how we've come to this place and why 88% of those who voted want an independent community. Since 1892, the village of Essex Junction has operated as a municipal unit of government within the town of Essex, both chartered municipalities. The communities have been voting on some form of merger or separation since 1958. There are some key details in the last 20 years that are worth discussing as to how we are now at this point in the year 2022. In 2000, a five month long government operations mandated mediation process ended with no agreed upon resolution. In 2006, a year long community led task force created a charter for a new merged municipality. It passed narrowly with town, uh, with town, the town outside the village voting no and the village voting yes. A revote overturned the results. Over the next 10 years, the boards worked collaboratively to find shared services. In 2018, they created a subcommittee to again craft a plan for the future of the two communities. This plan of merger vote, uh, which we can discuss in more detail, uh, then failed. And th that leads us to where we are today with a charter change request that creates a path forward for two separate communities while fully recognizing the past history of these efforts. Last year, the town of Essex was before your government operations committee with a charter change to establish a three plus three governance model. At the time, the decision was made to hold further discussions until the community held the merger vote that had long been planned. The merger plan uh, voted on in 2021 included the three plus three governance model and a 12 year financial phase in to limit the immediate financial impact to the town outside of the village residents. Close to 50% of registered voters participated in the plan of merger held in March of 2021. The plan of merger failed in the town outside of the village by 72% and passed in the village by 81%. Overall, the vote failed by 19 votes. With swift action by residents throughout the communities, a revote was held on April 13th. Over 50% of registered voters participated in the election. Again, the plan of merger failed with similar percentages within each community as the original vote. The town outside of the village voted no, the village voted yes. With broad community outreach, three plus three governance and a 12 year financial phase in, 
uh, the town of Essex and uh, the town of Essex overwhelmingly rejected the plan of merger twice. As part of the revote, village residences, residents also voted on a non-binding resolution to have the village trustees draft a charter to establish the city of Essex Junction should the plan of merger fail a second time. That non-binding vote passed overwhelmingly. The city of Essex Junction charter vote was held by a spe special village meeting in November of 2021. Again, close to 50% of registered voters participated. The charter passed with 88% of the vote. 3,070 yes votes to 411 no votes. In May of 2021, the two municipal boards entered into a joint resolution to investigate an amicable separation. As written in the resolution, it was titled, members of the select board and trustees agree to negotiate in good faith throughout the amicable separation process. In the spirit of inclusion, all voices will be respectfully heard and considered. And that now brings us to a section by section, and I'm going to call it a chapter by chapter outline uh, of the of H491. Um, and what should be noted as to why I hope we can do a broad brushstroke of a chapter by chapter rather than section by section is that this is largely existing language for the village of Essex Junction and existing charter language that will now fall under the charter for the city of Essex Junction. Subchapter one creates the city and expresses the city's general corporate powers. The city will use the council manager form of government. Subchapter two sets out the governance structure of the city. The legislative body of the city shall be the city council, which will be comprised of the current village trustees until the expiration of their term. The subchapter also sets the procedures for filling a vacancy in the council in the event of death, absence, or resignation. Compensation of the city council shall be $1,500 per year. Councilors are not permitted to hold any other elected or appointed office. Subchapter three provides for the other elected offices of the city, including the library trustees and moderator. Subchapter four sets out the procedures for city meetings and elections. The sections in this subchapter rely on general law. Subchapter five sets out the city's procedures and powers concerning ordinances. These provisions rely on general law with the exception that the city uses a 44 day timeline for petitions to rescind an ordinance. Subchapter six governs the duties and powers of the city manager. The manager shall oversee all administration of city government and all subordinate city officers. The manager is responsible for preparing financial reports, the city budget proposal and the city capital expenditure plan. The manager may be removed by the select board and has a right to a hearing. Subchapter seven establishes the following boards and commissions, the board of civil authority, the board of abatement of taxes, the planning commission, the development review board and the Brownell library trustees. Subchapters nine and 10 set out the budget and taxation process with a fiscal year that starts and ends on July 1st. The annual municipal budget proposal is submitted by the city manager with approval of the council. The city has authority to authorize tax stabilization agreements with any taxpayer in the city does not affect the education property tax list. Subchapter 11 sets out the capital program procedures for the city, which rely on general law. Subchapters 12 and 13 contain, contain general language providing for the severability and separability of charter provisions. The sections that follow contain transitional provisions for the separation of the city from the town. And I will review some of those after finishing the uh, section by section of the bill. Section 16 it relates to justices of the peace that shall be appointed by the governor uh, pursuant to Title 17. Section 17 repeals the village charter. And section 18 is the effective date of July 1st, 2022. I again want to borrow uh, from the good work of the members from Essex in the house uh, who have shared a summary of the agreements for the transition. The memorandum of understanding allows for a negotiation of these tentative agreements and to execute these agreements upon passage of separation. Uh, the town regarding delinquent taxes, the town can continue to collect taxes owed to them when the properties were part of the village. Regarding information technology, they, the town and city will work collaboratively to transfer village data from town systems. 
regarding police services, the city will continue to receive police dispatch and community justice services from the Essex Police Department for 10 years and renew for an, and renewals will be for an additional five years. Regarding reappraisal and assessor services, the town and city are to share in reappraisal and assessing services through the upcoming reappraisal process. Regarding right of first refusal, the city has a right of first refusal should the town want to sell 81 Main Street. Don't ask me exactly what's going on there, but we can find out on a recess if anybody wants to know. Regarding stormwater, the town and city will work collaboratively on stormwater when and if it makes sense, uh, otherwise they are separate. Regarding the clerk treasurer's office, the town and city will share the village and city clerk uh, until July 1st of 2023, at which time they will separate. Regarding shared financial services, the town and city will have their own finance director and staff to support separating finances until June 30th of 2025 or sooner if agreed upon. Regarding amenities like recreation of uh, Indian Brooks, the senior center and uh, the senior bus, the city will have access to town recreation and Indian Brook in the same manner it currently does until December 31st of 2023. And the town will have access to the senior center and recreation programs, uh, accepting pool, the pool and licensed childcare until December 31st of 2023. Uh, there is an amended MOU upcoming that uh, removed shared boards and commissions as these will not be shared beyond July 1st, 2023 and uh, removes the clerk treasurer as this is not dependent upon separation passing as it reflects the change in shared management. Madam President, uh, your committee on government operations voted 500 to pass this uh, major charter change, the creation of the new city of Essex Junction. Um, we heard from uh, the delegation from Essex, Essex uh, town government officials, Essex uh, junction government officials, and um, we had uh, materials that were emailed to us from the public at large who wished to weigh in. Um, I would just like to end again uh, with the words of our colleagues in the house who have lived this for probably many decades. It is time for our two communities who have tried almost every conceivable relationship to have the opportunity to thrive as two separate entities for the betterment of all residents. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill a third time? The Senator from Franklin is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. May I interrogate the reporter bill? Senator from Chittenden is. Uh, the reporter mentioned that there was a, a group formed between the consisting of members of the town and members of the village of Essex Junction to try to come up with an agreement in which uh, both parties agreed as to the structure of a separation. Is that uh, the, what created this particular format, or did they, in fact, come to any agreement? Uh, Madam President, to the best of my knowledge, what I outlined toward the end in the memorandum of understanding about all of the various uh, municipal services was the outcome of that amicable discussion on separation. I see nodding heads behind you. And um, to my knowledge, that is what created a, a phased plan that has components that are one year long to a decade long. Um, so that, that is what was discussed in May of 2021 between the two municipal boards after the vote was taken for the separation. Are there any, what are the, the financial implications for the taxpayers of each municipality? Um, there are financial implications and um, equity and taxation has been a major discussion of all of the um, proposed separation or merger agreements both. Um, it has been part of the decades long community discussion and um, all, all of these major votes. Um, as I will borrow again from the, um, the process that was outlined by uh, the members from Essex in the House, um, it has been clearly stated throughout public outreach that should the merger not pass, separation would mean an increase in municipal taxes to residents in the town outside of the village. 
Uh, in fact, at a joint municipal meeting on September 28th of 2020, the town finance director at the time said, there are inequities in the way government is funded in our current situation. Village taxpayers are paying for services they are not eligible to receive and are paying more for services that they and the town outside of the village taxpayers have equal access to. This means that town taxpayers are paying less than the true cost for some services. That is a quote from the town finance director in 2020. And then lastly, based upon what the reporter knows or based on testimony received uh, as the bill was being discussed, are there any, is there any likelihood of litigation that may result from this? And if so, uh, what type of litigation might that be? Madam President, um, this has been a long, decades plus long process. And um, I do not believe that we heard about any specific litigation that would be raised. Um, I can get a better answer before third reading on that question, um, if the member would like, or we could take a brief recess if that's important before third, second reading. So before third reading is fine. That's my question. Thank you. The question is, scale the bill, be read a third time. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. The ayes have it and you have ordered third reading of H-491. We now have for action H-491, an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. Are there any amendments to be offered before <coughs> third reading? Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H-491, an act relating to the creation of the city of Essex Junction and the adoption of the city charter. You have heard the third reading of the bill. The question is, shall the bill pass in concurrence? The Senator from Chittenden is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam President. On second reading, the Senator from Franklin asked if there was any pending litigation or concern about litigation for this particular charter change. Uh, having talked to officials in Essex Junction, there is no pending litigation that anyone is aware of. Of course, we live in a litigious society and there could always be litigation, um, but you know, it is the prerogative of a municipality to make a decision such as this and to bring it to the legislature. And given that there was an amicable uh, MOU related to separation, I, I'm no lawyer, but um, it, it does not seem like there would be favorable litigation around a amicable separation agreement that's already been established that we are now voting on and sending to the governor. So the question is, shall the bill pass in concurrence? Are you ready for the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying no. The ayes have it and you have passed H491 in concurrence.